Candace Hayes, we have thy confession. A witch as brazen as you shall be burned at the stake. The crowd gathered in the small room bursts into a cheer as the judge hands down the sentence. The accused woman doesn't react, though. She looks neither scared nor afraid, but simply resigned to her fate. No time is to be wasted in carrying out the punishment that the judge has decreed. A pair of constables grab the woman by the arms and take her away. A mob follows along as the woman is led through the town, taunting and jeering, calling her a witch, a wife of Satan, and worse names. She doesn't seem affected by them, though. In fact, she looks as if she can't even see them. Her attention is focused solely on one mysterious woman who walks along with the crowd, and yet somehow seems disconnected, as if she isn't truly there either. The two women maintain eye contact as the constables keep pushing the condemned woman along. They lead the woman outside of town to a tall hill. The ropes binding the woman's hands are cut, and she has just a moment to rub her sore wrists before she is forced to the ground and lashed to a piece of wood as another group tosses the last logs onto a nearby pile. Once she is securely tied down, the constables step away, but then another man wearing a hood approaches. He carries a large club and without hesitation begins beating her legs. The woman's composure finally breaks and she cries in pain from the cracking of her bones. The crowd only cheers louder at the screams from the witch. The beating has left the woman's legs mangled, but this is far from over. The woman, still strapped to the wood, is placed on the pyre, where she hangs like a scarecrow above the combustible material. The judge steps forward out of the screaming mob, carrying a torch. He loudly exclaims that for her crimes, she will be burned until dead. But the judge doesn't step forward. He instead announces that another will have the honor of lighting the flame. Another man steps out of the crowd and takes the torch from the judge. He walks towards the pyre and looks up at the woman. She is exhausted from the beating, but she lifts her head. She doesn't look at the man with the torch, though. She's looking past him, locking eyes with the mysterious woman who walked along with the crowd. The man looks angry, slighted that she won't even meet his eyes in this final moment, and without another moment's hesitation, he tosses the torch onto the pyre. The wood lights instantly, the tinder combusting and turning into a huge roaring fire. The crowd also erupts into even louder cries of celebration as the woman screams from inside the blaze. The man watches as the woman is lost behind the fire and the smoke, and eventually her cries too are hidden behind the crackles and pops of the flames. He doesn't move until the fire has nearly burned itself out. Most of the crowd has left at this point, having gone back to their homes content with the role they played in doing the Lord's work. As the constables pull a charred torso down from the wood and unceremoniously toss it over a steep side of the hill, the man finally turns and starts to walk away, a tear rolling down his cheek. The judge approaches and places a hand on the man's shoulder. There, there, the judge says, attempting to comfort the man. You'll find a new wife soon enough. Hundreds of people were accused of witchcraft in colonial America, and while it is likely that many were falsely accused, there is reason to believe that some were under the influence of, or were themselves, what we now describe as anomalies. And SCP-3998 is just such an example, better known as The Wicker Witch Lives. SCP-3998 is a human cadaver which dates from the late 17th century that is covered in fourth-degree burns and is missing its legs. There is also evidence of extensive blunt force trauma, but it is not known if the beating or the burning was the ultimate cause of death. At some point, the remains were collected and fastened into a scarecrow that is held together with wicker, nails, and wire. While a scarecrow fashioned from a cadaver is rather unconventional, what brought SCP-3998 to the SCP Foundation's attention were its other anomalous attributes. It constantly secretes a flammable liquid from its bones that primarily consists of ethanol and human fat, and every night between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., the corpse ignites. This fire doesn't cause any damage to the corpse, though, and it is unknown how it produces the flammable liquid or ignites. 3998 does not keep its flames to itself, though. It appears that the SCP targets those who have either killed or physically abused a romantic partner, causing them to catch fire as large quantities of boiling ethanol appear in their stomach. Their midsection will eventually melt and then explode, 
leading to amputation of the lower half of their body. The fire burns both incredibly hot and unnaturally fast, and is unable to be put out until SCP-3998 is extinguished. A number of historical documents related to the case have been discovered and made available to Foundation researchers that shed light on SCP-3998, including excerpts from a 17th century diary belonging to a woman who lived near where the cadaver was discovered. In the entries, the woman describes attending the wedding of her neighbors, Aidan and Candace Hayes, though Candace did not seem especially happy with the arrangement. Candace is characterized as someone who likes to keep to herself and who does not conform to the era's idea of a good wife. As a result, it appears that she became the victim of abuse at the hand of her husband. The diarist hypothesizes that Candace has brought this fate upon herself due to her behavior, which may stem from her being under the hold of the devil. In other words, the neighbor believes that Candace is a witch. Others must have had the same suspicion, because we also have records of Candace's interview with a Judge William Stoughton, who questioned her about the accusations of consorting with evil spirits. Candace readily admitted to this, though she disagreed that it was in any way evil. She told the judge that the rituals and magics she practiced were not inherently good or bad, and that anyone was capable of using the same tools. She went on to explain that she hated her husband, that she had been forced to marry him, and that he had been nothing but cruel and violent towards her. Candace also mentioned a name, Clovis, that the judge assumed to be the demon that she had made her cursed pact with. Candace appeared to offer no defense or excuses for her actions, and the judge sentenced her to die by burning at the stake, with her husband, Aiden, being the one to light the fire. The story of this witch trial was typical of the time, and that likely would have been the end of what we know about SCP-3998. But another historical document was located that has truly given a new perspective to this anomaly. A sealed letter found in the cellar of a home that is addressed to Candace, though it appears to have been written after her death. The letter is from her secret lover, and describes how they collected Candace's burnt bones from the bottom of the hill before binding them together with wicker and wire. The letter then describes how Candace's husband has recently restocked his own home with gin, which is well known to be extremely flammable. The letter ends with an affirmation of the writer's eternal love for Candace and is signed, Clovis. But perhaps the best information we have about the origin of SCP-3998 comes from an obscure local tale that was passed down orally for years and eventually documented on an urban legend website. The legend tells of a woman who promised her soul to a she-devil who taught her magic but also offered companionship. When her husband found out, he contacted the local authorities and had the woman arrested. She was tried, her legs were broken, and she was hung up like a scarecrow before being burned alive. Her body was dumped off the side of a mountain, but the she-devil collected her bones and gave her life again. The need for revenge burned in the woman's heart, so in the middle of the night, she doused herself in her husband's gin, set herself on fire once more, and fell upon him as he slept, burning him alive so he could suffer the way that she did. SCP-3998 is currently held in a secure holding locker in Site-34 that is fireproofed and vacuum sealed to prevent it from igniting. Every morning at 9 a.m., 3998 and its locker are cleaned to remove the secretions of flammable liquid. D-Class personnel who have been convicted of domestic abuse crimes are to always be kept at the site to ensure that they are the targets of SCP-3998, which when it's not allowed to ignite, will result in them only feeling mild discomfort in their head and chest rather than spontaneous combustion. Due to its relatively easy method of containment, SCP-3998 has been classified as safe. However, recent developments have caused the Foundation to rethink this classification. Despite 3998 being securely contained, the number of arson-related homicides in the state of Massachusetts have actually increased following containment with many showing the same damage to their body as would be expected in a victim of SCP-3998. And while it may be that these are the result of a yet uncaught serial killer who simply happens to employ similar methods of killing their victims, a recent re-examination of the SCP-3998 corpse has revealed more troubling details. The body of SCP-3998 does not belong to Candace Hayes, and in fact appears to be a male who was in his 30s at the time of his death. Following these new revelations, reclassification of SCP-3998 to Euclid is pending. Whether SCP-3998 is the body of Candace's husband Aiden, forced to endure an eternal punishment of burning again each and every night, or if it's some other unfortunate victim of a violent and painful death, 
is unknown, as is the ultimate fate of Candace and Clovis. But with the deaths that would appear to be attributable to SCP-3998 showing no signs of stopping despite containment, it can only be assumed that the Wicker Witch lives. It's one o'clock in the morning on a work night, and the last of the bar hoppers and club goers have long since turned in. At the end of the street, the last bar is finally closing down for the night. Or it would, except that the bartender is having trouble getting rid of a customer. Sitting at the bar, an old derelict is demanding yet another drink. The bartender grumbles in annoyance. This derelict is sloppy drunk, and the bartender just wants to go home. Closing time, growls the bartender. Just one more, protests the derelict, shaking his empty glass for emphasis. I've got money. He laughs at his own words, his giggles ending with a loud belch that blows a cloud of aromatic vapor into the bartender's face. That's it. This derelict has been hanging out at this bar causing trouble all night, and the bartender has had enough. Get out of here, says the bartender as he hustles the wobbling derelict out the door. You're done. The derelict creaks and totters as he stumbles out into the street. The night's festivities are really hitting him. It isn't so often that he's got the money to burn, but when he does, he likes to spend it here. The prices are right, and the conversation is minimal, which is just the way that he likes it. The derelict turns around, fire in his eyes. He's raring to fight, and he doesn't care that the bartender is quite a bit larger than he is. Right now, all he can see is red. Don't tell me why I've had enough, he slurs, raising his fists as he prepares to lash out. But the bartender has already slammed the door in his face. Defeated, the derelict turns his back on the closed bar and starts a slow stumble down the street. Stupid bartender, mutters the derelict, turning up his collar against the cold bite of the night air. He wishes that he just had one more drink to warm his stomach against the chill. He's so out of it that he doesn't stop to think that the bartender did him a favor by refusing to fight. There is no way that the derelict would have won that battle. Even if he was in his physical prime, even if the bartender wasn't twice his size, the derelict is in no shape to fight. His vision is blurry and his head is swimming. In fact, he can barely remain upright. If he had any sense, he would probably stumble home and sleep this off. But the night is young and he's not ready to give up yet. He walks down the street, eyeing every storefront in hopes of finding another bar. Unfortunately, every window has a closed sign in it. He swears under his breath. What a run of bad luck. What's a guy supposed to do in this town, he wonders. Just when he's about to give up hope, he spies something glinting in the reflective halo of a street lamp. He stumbles closer to get a better look, and he can hardly believe his eyes. Finally, his luck is changing. Someone has abandoned a half-empty bottle. Well, hello there, little friend, says the derelict. He struggles to focus, but the world is spinning. In his confusion, he could swear he's seeing things. But no, he can feel the heft of the glass bottle in his hand, and he knows that it is as real as he is. Who left you behind? Who would leave a perfectly good bottle just sitting out here? He recognizes this brand. There's only about three fingers of liquid left, but that's better than nothing. Some people might balk at drinking out of a random bottle that you found on the street, but the derelict doesn't give it a second thought. He tips the bottle back and slurps it all down. It burns going down, just as it should, he thinks. He sighs in contentment as he feels the harsh liquid warm his stomach. Perfect. That really hit the spot. But what happens next surprises him so much that he can't believe his eyes. There's still liquid in the bottle. He blinks, wondering if maybe his adult brain is playing tricks on him. But he shakes the bottle cautiously and is rewarded with a telltale swish of liquid. That's no illusion. He takes another swig, guzzling it down. Normally, he'd drop the bottle to the ground and stumble on, but something makes him pause. He maintains his grip on the bottleneck and raises it again to take another look. And sure enough, there's still more left in the bottle. The derelict cannot believe his luck. He feels like he must have won the lottery. He's found a never-ending bottle. Already his mind is reeling with possibilities. That bartender really thinks he's so smart, he mutters to himself as he weaves unsteadily. But I don't need him anymore. See if I ever go to this stupid bar again. He just lost his best customer. Now that I have you, little bottle, I don't ever need to pay for drinks ever again. It's the best day of my life, crows the derelict, raising his arms in triumph. He's barely able to stagger back to his home, a seedy apartment on the bad side of town, before he passes out on the floor. The morning sun rouses the slumbering derelict, and he rises with a groan. His whole body aches, and his mouth feels dry and parched. That's par for the course after a night of drinking, but somehow this hangover feels different. 
He puts that thought out of his mind as his mind returns to the strange, never-empty bottle that he discovered the night before. It's lying on its side on the floor next to him. He reaches for the mysterious bottle, only to find that, in fact, the previous night was not a dream. The bottle still contains just as much as it did the night before. He can't explain it, but the derelict isn't about to question his good fortune. He lifts himself to his feet and walks slowly into the bathroom. He's feeling a hangover like he's never felt before. His head is pounding and his throat is dry. His tongue feels swollen and sluggish inside his mouth, but he knows how to handle it. A little hair of the dog is all you need to help with the hangover. He takes another gulp from his bottle, but this time it brings little relief. And he notices something else strange too. It's his scalp. The skin on his head has started to itch and he can't stop scratching. He feels like he's got the world's worst dandruff problem. He should probably take a shower, he thinks. He strips down and steps into the tub, turning the hot water on full blast and letting it wash over him. The shower only brings him temporary relief. Afterward, as he dries himself off, the towels feel rough and abrasive against his skin. His skin comes off in big flaky patches and his nails leave red trails in their wake. What's that? Is that blood? He examines his fingers to see that his nails have grown into ragged claw-like talons. With a frightened yelp, he bites them off. It's easy to do. Although they look formidable, his fingernails are weak and brittle, almost as if he's dealing with a sudden calcium deficiency. What could be wrong with him? He remembers all the warnings he heard back in school when they used to march everyone into assembly to listen to lectures from the local police. At the time, he scoffed at the long lists of scary-sounding consequences of a lifetime of drinking, but now he's not so sure. It's probably nothing, he says as he examines himself in the bathroom mirror. His skin looks blotchy and infected. It doesn't take long before his hair and nails are out of control. His hair grows down to his shoulders, but comes out in big ragged clumps if he runs his fingers through it. His claw-like fingernails are constantly breaking and cracking until his fingertips are bloody and his quick is itchy and infected. If his habits had left him looking worse for wear before, he really looks awful now. For the next week, he barely leaves the apartment. He pulls the curtains and keeps the lights off, afraid that someone might see him. When the landlord bangs on the door, shouting that rent is late and demanding that the derelict hand over the money, he doesn't answer. He waits. The landlord gives up for now. That's good, thinks the derelict. It will give him time to think, time to figure out what to do about his disease. He knows that something is not right. Many of the local bartenders are, by now, probably wondering where he's gone. It's not like the derelict to stay away. He's practically kept the bar industry in this town afloat all by himself. It must be something major indeed to keep him away from his favorite poison. Luckily, he still has the bottomless bottle to comfort him during this trying time. The derelict is certain that he's caught some bad bug, but he thinks that he can wait it out. All he needs to do is make it through the next week and everything will be fine. Sipping free drinks helps him to pass the time in a pleasant stupor as he waits for his health to return. Unfortunately, things are only going to get worse for him. His hair and fingernails keep growing, to the point that he has trouble lifting the bottle without his twisted nails getting in the way. His dry, flaky skin is changing as well, becoming thick and leathery and hanging off him in great folds like the hide of an elephant or a rhinoceros. His skin continues to grow, until the folds flop over his knees and gradually hang lower and lower until they touch the ground. Moving is harder now that he's carrying so much extra weight. He thought at first he just had a nasty bug, but he's clearly picked up some weird skin condition, and even this derelict, sodded as he might be, suspects exactly where he got it. It's got to be that crazy bottomless bottle. He can't think of another reason. Even so, he can't bring himself to part with this little gift from heaven. Even in his darkest hour, a few sips of liquid courage always helps to calm his nerves. He considers lumbering down to the free clinic in hopes that they might be able to cure him or at least tell him what's wrong with his skin but he thinks better of this option. What if he's got some weird alien parasite that no one has ever seen before? It might lock him away in some government lab or something. No, he reasons, it's better to wait it out. He'll sleep it off, swear off the sauce for a little while, and maybe it'll pass. In desperation, the derelict drags himself across the floor, hoping to at least find some solace away from human contact. He locks himself into his bedroom while he's still able to manipulate the lock on his door. The extra folds of skin are hanging off of his hands and arms, making it hard to do anything. The extra skin is so heavy that he can't walk much carrying all that extra weight. He lies on the floor of his bedroom, away from everything, and hopes that tomorrow, when he wakes up, this will just be a fading dream. The only thing that brings him solace is the never-ending bottle, which even now in his advanced state of decay, he keeps close by him. After all, he reasons, the damage is already done. 
What could possibly be the harm in enjoying a nice drink? A week later, his condition has not passed. The landlord is back, and this time he's not taking no for an answer. The landlord isn't supposed to enter his tenant's apartment without permission, but he doesn't care. He uses his own key to unlock the door and go inside. The condition of the apartment is appalling. The furniture is broken, the floor is covered with unidentifiable filth, and there's a rotten stench in the air. The landlord wants to throw up as the full weight of the musty smell hits him in the face. It's as if someone has been living in here without any ventilation, with all the windows firmly closed and sealed. A sudden noise from the bathroom draws his attention. Of course, thinks the landlord, that old bum is hiding in there. He thinks I won't find him. The landlord steals his resolve and heads towards the bathroom, determined to get the money that he feels is owed to him. But what greets him when he steps through the door isn't the derelict anymore. It isn't even human. The creature in the bathroom is a massive pile of ambulatory skin folds. The skin flaps have grown so large and cumbersome that the derelict within can barely move. They sprout all over his body, covering him so that he looks more like some kind of alien sea cucumber now than any human. The landlord stumbles backwards, screaming in terror at the sight, unable to comprehend what he's looking at. Improbably, the creature reacts to the noise, and a ripple of movement spreads across its surface. It starts to move, despite not having any legs. The landlord is so terrified that he doesn't notice the glass bottle that suddenly drops from between the creature's skin folds as it starts to move toward him. The same bottle, still with three fingers of liquid inside. How could something like this happen? What parasite or disease did the derelict contract from the miracle bottle he found? Sadly, this never-ending bottle isn't a boon, but a curse, and the man who found it that night became just another victim of what the SCP Foundation has classified as SCP-420. SCP-420 looks like a perfectly ordinary bottle of a certain popular libation, even to the point that it bears the label of a common brand. The bottle always contains a small amount of a mysterious liquid known as SCP-420-1. If this liquid is poured out, SCP-420 will always replenish itself. When SCP-420-1 is potent, it is physically, chemically, and molecularly indistinguishable from ordinary whiskey, although drinking will have an effect far greater than even the strongest liquor. When SCP-420-1 is poured out of SCP-420, though, it undergoes a strange transformation, eventually losing its potency and changing until it is indistinguishable physically, chemically, or molecularly from urine. Consuming potent SCP-420-1 instigates a bizarre physical transformation called SCP-420-2 in six stages. In stage one, beginning 12 hours after consumption, the subject will start to have difficulty speaking, resulting in slurred speech that is not consistent with normal alcohol inebriation. Their fingernails, toenails, and hair will start to grow at an accelerated rate, but also become brittle and prone to breakage. Nail breakage to the quick often leads to bleeding and infection. The Foundation has had some success in curing SCP-420-2 if it is caught when still in stage 1, treating it as if it is an aggressive form of cancer with radiation and chemotherapy, as well as a constant intravenous supply of Formula 420A09T-T174B. Victims thus treated have a 73% recovery rate but a 21% fatality rate. From Phase 2 onward, this protocol can slow the spread of SCP-420-2, but will not stop it entirely. In Stage 2, beginning 1-2 to two weeks after Stage 1, the subject's skin begins to show similar properties to those exhibited by hair and fingernails in Stage 1, becoming dry, brittle, and prone to cracking. As old skin flakes off, the subject's new skin begins to grow at an accelerated rate, eventually forming thick leathery folds all over the subject's body. Skin flaps growing inside the mouth interfere with speech and eventually render subjects mute, but do not appear to impede breathing or eating. Indeed, subjects in Stage 2 exhibit a renewed interest in eating, possibly because the subject's body requires additional nutrients and calories to build the increasingly heavy armor of thickened, calloused skin. Stage 2 subjects will eat anything that they can get their hands on, and many die after attempting to eat poisonous or inedible objects. In Stage 3, beginning 3 to 6 weeks after Stage 2, nerves in the skin layer grow uncontrollably, but no longer connect to the victim's central nervous system. Genetic testing of the skin in this stage reveals that its DNA has become so mutated that it can no longer be classified as human. It is, in fact, a separate and very inhuman organism that almost acts as a parasite growing from the human host. The skin may develop tumor-like growths, which appear to be analogous to human muscle and secretory cells. 
hair and fingernails sprout randomly from the mass of skin. By stage 4, beginning 3 to 7 days after stage 3, the skin has become a mass of thick, leathery folds, completely covering the human host to the point that they disappear completely. The skin begins to exhibit random twitching movements, as though it is indeed a living organism finally coming into its own as a life form and testing out its new body. The human subject within the skin continues to eat, although brain scans reveal that they are no longer in control of their mouth. Instead, the skin entity forces the mouth to move by moving the attached skin. Small holes begin to form in the skin, eventually growing into narrow tunnels or throats that lead back to the now trapped body of the helpless subject. The subject is still consumed with a ravenous hunger and will eat anything that they can get in their mouth. In stage 5, beginning 1 to 2 days after stage 4, the skin begins to move in patterns indicating rudimentary intelligence. The skin, although still attached to the original subject, is now completely and distinctly non-human. It is its own organism. It can move of its own accord, dragging the trapped host along for the ride, and it moves and feeds much in the manner of an extremely large amoeba. It feeds by excreting a digestive enzyme onto foodstuffs and then enveloping the nutrients with its skin folds, again like an amoeba surrounding its food. The food is taken into the throats. These tunnels connecting the outside of the skin to the now completely subsumed host are now directly connected to the host's circulatory system and function as additional mouths. They can consume nutrients which are moved down their length by bristly hairs and further broken down by grinding keratinous plates before being taken into the host's body. Most hosts will remain in stage 5 indefinitely, although there still remains a much more dangerous stage 6 yet to come. At this time, it's unknown what factor triggers SCP-420-2 to develop into stage 6. Little information about stage 6 is available at this time, although it is known that it involves even more accelerated skin and keratin growth, resulting in a sudden increase in size and mass. Perhaps the most terrifying part of the entire transformation is that the host remains alive for the duration of the process, and sometimes even after SCP-420-2 has settled comfortably into its new life at stage 5. Mercifully, most hosts will have completely succumbed to insanity by this point, although some are shown by brain scans to still be self-aware and quite calm, perhaps fading into a zen-like state as they accept the inevitability of their fate. SCP-420 is contained in a storage locker at an undisclosed site maintained by the Foundation, and it is only to be removed from this locker by SCP staff with level 3 clearance or higher. It has been given the safe class because, despite the horrifying nature of its effects, at least it doesn't move anywhere. Samples of SCP-420-1 not in use by testing should be stored in the container marked SCP-420-1 Decon in Locker 1014-420 until they lose potency, at which time they can be disposed of as biohazardous liquid waste. Victims infected with SCP-420-2 are not contagious and should be contained in standard solitary D-Class secure confinement. On reaching Phase 3, subjects should receive double rations. Due to the extreme danger of Phase 6, any subjects who reach Phase 4 should be closely monitored for signs that the condition may be advancing further, in which case they are to be immediately destroyed by incineration. Knowing the fate that befalls victims of SCP-420 should make anyone think twice about drinking out of a random bottle that you just found in the street, though personally, I think that's just common sense. I hope you enjoyed this anomaly, which was recommended by Dr. Bob Squad researcher Lawman23. If you want to assist in recommending and choosing future anomalies to be analyzed, you too can join the Dr. Bob Squad by going to patreon.com slash drbob. The group of children on their bikes stare intently at the large, abandoned house. Rumors have been circulating all school year about a monster that lives inside. One child tells the others about the kid from a couple towns over who went inside and never came back out, and it's easy to believe that something evil could be lurking inside the rundown home with its peeling paint and many broken windows. The children begin teasing each other, daring one another to go in and see the monster for themselves. No one seems especially eager to volunteer though, as they all egg each other on. As the group of children joke about who should be forced to go inside, another comes riding up behind them, struggling to catch his breath. You left me behind again! he complains. Clearly, this is not the first time that this smallest child of the group has been made to try and keep up with his bigger and faster friends. The bigger kids all turn to look at him. They don't need to discuss it any further. The answer to who must go inside has already been decided. The smaller child tries to protest, but ultimately, what decision does he have but to go inside? He can't let everyone else think that he's a chicken. He's got to prove once and for all that he's just as tough as any of them. 
Without another word, he lets his bike fall into the dirt and makes his way towards the big, creepy house. The door pushes open without any resistance, and the boy looks into the dark house. The boy steps inside, and the floorboards creak loudly under his feet. The inside looks much like the outside, old, worn, and abandoned. But then, he hears something, a scratching noise coming from above him. He turns to leave, but he can see all of his friends through the doorway, and they motion for him to keep going. The boy steals his nerves and turns back. He's going to show them just how brave he is. The boy starts up the stairs, each one groaning as he steps onto it. He reaches the top of the stairs to find a landing with more rooms, each full of dirt and debris. There's spray paint on many of the walls and lots of trash. It looks like teens may use this as a place to hang out. But there at the other side of the landing is one more room, and the door is shut. From outside, the group of children can see through the upper windows as the boy makes his way through the house. They're not laughing and teasing any longer. In fact, they're impressed by how bravely he is exploring the old home. Though none of them would admit it out loud, he's earning their respect. The boy reaches the shut door at the end of the hall and presses his ear to it, but he doesn't hear anything inside. He places his hand on the doorknob and slowly opens it. The boy screams and falls backwards as the cat that was hiding inside panics and jumps through one of the open windows. The boy can't help but laugh. <laughs> of course it was just a… The boy screams again as the floor gives way beneath him and crashes down onto the first floor in a pile of debris. He's stunned by the fall before starting to scream again as that floor gives way too. His yelling is silenced by the air being knocked out of him as he hits the basement floor. He's covered in dust and pieces of two floors he fell through. He feels bruised and sore, but he can wiggle his fingers and toes. He's not paralyzed, and it doesn't even feel like he's broken a bone. Maybe he's okay. But no, he's definitely not okay. Because suddenly, there's something picking him up off the floor. As his eyes adjust to the dark basement, he sees what it is that's holding him. It's half man, half machine, a huge disgusting mix of metal and flesh. The boy is too scared to scream anymore as the creature's unmoving, dead-looking eyes stare straight into his. Its face looks as though the skin has been stretched across a human metallic skull. The boy can only watch as the monster raises its sharp metallic fingers and brushes the dirt out of the boy's hair. The boy starts to whimper, but whatever this thing is, it doesn't seem to want to hurt him. A tinny, robotic voice coming from a small device on the creature's face suddenly breaks the silence. Al anta ala mayuram. The boy doesn't understand, but the robotic man tilts his horrific head to the side and repeats the same thing. The boy is still confused, but he feels like the robot is trying to tell him something. He somehow gets the sense that it's not going to hurt him. Is this the monster that everyone has been afraid of? A misunderstood machine man living down here in the basement? The robot flinches as something is smashed on the back of his head. He tosses the boy to the side and turns to see the boy's friends, each of them armed with pieces of wood and other scraps as weapons. They've come here to save their friend from the monster that they dared him to find. Another runs up to strike the robot, but before he can reach him, he falls to his knees in pain, as do the rest of the children. The creature has begun emitting a high-frequency noise, and the children try to cover their ears. They all feel a searing pain that makes it feel as though their heads will explode. The piercing noise continues to ring out, but the monster looks like it has entered some kind of dormant state and is no longer moving. The small boy is able to slowly get back to his knees, hands still clasped to the side of his head, and stand up. He runs past the monster and his friends who are writhing on the floor in pain, up the stairs and out of the old house. A woman stands at a kitchen counter, chopping vegetables for their dinner that evening, and talking to her oldest daughter about her plans for that weekend, when the back door suddenly bursts open. Standing there is her son, the small boy. He's barely able to whisper the words, Monster! There's a monster in the basement! Before he collapses, blood pouring from his ears and nose, before he begins convulsing on the floor. At the local police station, an officer is speaking on the phone. I see. Yes, that is quite strange. A metal man? You don't say. I'll send someone out there right away. Don't go anywhere. The police officer hangs up the phone and looks around, making sure no one is nearby or listening to him, and then takes out a cell phone. He dials a number from memory, and someone answers on the other end almost immediately. Yes, this is Field Agent Patch, the police officer says. You need to get a containment team out here right away, and a good one too. I don't know what it is, but it's dangerous. An SCP Foundation mobile task force that specializes in containing dangerous humanoid threats soon arrived at the house and took the anomaly into captivity. 
Misinformation teams concocted a cover story about a gas leak leading to the unfortunate deaths of several of the town's children and administering amnestics to any potential witnesses. Once the messy business of containment was over, though, it was time to figure out just what this strange creature was. SCP-203 appears to have at one time been a Caucasian human male, though its appearance now is far different than it once was. This bipedal humanoid creature stands 2.5 meters tall and weighs roughly 200 kilograms. Both its incredible height and weight are due to the fact that the man's original skeleton has been entirely removed and replaced with a mechanical framework made of cast iron. The metal skeleton is much larger than the original bones, and in many places SCP-203's skin has split from being stretched over it, revealing the mechanical structure underneath. Other parts of the framework appear to have been intentionally made to protrude through the skin, though it is unclear for what purpose. In addition to this larger-than-normal mechanical skeleton, a number of other augmentations are present on SCP-203. Its fingers have been extended into sharpened, hook-like barbs that are approximately one meter long. Its lips have been removed entirely, making it clear that there is no movable jawbone and that the skull is likely one large hollow piece of metal and there are several more hook-like protrusions jutting out around the mouth area, smaller but similar in appearance to the fingers. SCP-203's legs have been modified as well, with two added joints that give them an appearance more akin to a dog's and its toes have been removed and replaced with a solid piece of metal similar to those found in steel-toed boots. Its chest has no sternum or breastplate, which causes the skin stretched across to pull inward as its diaphragm contracts. Its ears have also been removed, though it still seems to possess hearing that is far beyond that of an average human. And while its eyes still remain, they are held in a permanently forward-facing position by several needles that emerge from the eye sockets. The irises also appear permanently dilated and do not react to light. In place of a mouth is a small speaker covered by a metal grate that is capable of producing basic vocalizations, though with a distinctly robotic sound to them. Tests have shown that SCP-203 has a basic understanding of English, but its own primary language seems to be a type of Arabic, though there are no records of the exact dialect. SCP-203 does not need to eat or drink, and without any visible mouth, it is likely incapable of either. Instead, it runs off of a power cell located within its body that will provide energy for up to 72 hours. After those three days, SCP-203 will shut down and enter a hibernation state for three to four hours, during which its power source will recharge, providing it with another 72 hours of energy. All attempts to examine SCP-203 by either X-ray, CT, ultrasound, and other forms of diagnostic imagery have failed, and attempts at exploratory surgery have triggered its defense mechanisms which are both painful and deadly. When it perceives that it is being threatened in some way, SCP-203 is capable of emitting a high-frequency droning sound that has a profoundly damaging effect on the human nervous system. The effects of this defense mechanism were able to be observed directly when a D-Class personnel accidentally struck SCP-203 and its droning sound was activated. Immediately after being exposed to the sound, D-104 experienced a severe headache. After 15 minutes, the headache grew worse and D-104 began to bleed from the ears. After a half hour, the D-Class who had now gone to the infirmary began to experience seizures and was bleeding from all of his orifices. Ten minutes later, the D-Class was dead. Another test was performed, and the results were nearly identical, with symptoms progressing at roughly the same rate. However, this time, rather than move the D-Class to the infirmary, it was kept in the cell with SCP-203. After 40 minutes, the D-Class was dead, and a few minutes later, 203 finally ceased its droning sound. SCP-203 then approached the body of the deceased D-Class and began to use its own augmentations to start removing the skeleton of the D-Class. While SCP-203 was stopped before it could complete its task, it now appears that the droning sound it produces is a defense mechanism but may also be a part of the process by which it creates new instances of SCP-203. In interviews with SCP-203, it claims to have no memories of its life prior to its augmentation. It says that it now exists in a near constant state of pain and confusion, and that the times when its battery is expended and it enters a rest state are its only escape from the pain of its existence. It also claims that it has no memory of what happens once its defense mechanism is activated, nor does it remember what it did to the body of the D-Class that was left in its cell. However, it is unknown just how truthful SCP-203 is being. There has been no way to verify anything that SCP-203 tells researchers, and for the time being, its statements are to be regarded by Foundation staff as an attempt to elicit sympathy or otherwise manipulate them emotionally. 
It's made several requests for pain-killing medication and anesthetics, but so far, all of these requests have been denied. SCP-203 has been classified as Euclid, and it is kept in a specialized storage bunker at a research site. Two D-Class personnel equipped with sound filtering equipment guard it at all times, and it is accompanied by an armed escort to any testing or research sessions. Is SCP-203 the ultimate victim? A normal human that was transformed against his will into a crude amalgamation of man and machine? Maybe there is something more to SCP-203, or rather, less. Is SCP-203 fooling all of us? Is this tortured iron soul nothing more than a metallic monster disguising itself with the skin of its last victim? Perhaps with more research, we will one day know the answer. It's 1916, right in the middle of World War I, and a British soldier is huddled in a trench, occasionally peeking over the top. He's supposed to be on watch, but there's little to see in the darkness that hangs over no man's land. But then, he spots something. Something big. It's a shadowy figure, only about 20 feet away, and it looks like it's digging in the mud. It's too dark to make out what he's looking at, so the soldier shoots a flare into the sky, lighting up the battlefield with a dull red light. Now he can see it clearly, and it's like nothing he's ever seen before. A huge, terrifying monster, picking up bodies out of the mud. The soldier can only stare, petrified by what he's seeing in front of him, when the creature suddenly turns to stare back at him and smiles. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-3456, also known as the Orcadian Horseman. SCP-3456 is the designation given to a group of quadrupeds, of which the exact number that exists is unknown. These entities resemble horses, though with some marked differences. SCP-3456s lack any hair, and their thick skin is translucent, revealing the fat and muscle underneath. They have three-toed hooves, and strangest of all, they have one or more human-shaped torsos fused to their backs. Each torso has a pair of arms and a head, but no legs, the torso seeming to meld directly into the back of the creature's horse-like body. The arms are much longer than those of a human, with a total wingspan that is double the anomaly's height. The arms are so long, they typically drag along the ground when the creature moves. At the end of each arm are five sharpened bones that protrude from where fingers would normally be. Instead of a nose, most instances of SCP-3456 have a hole in the middle of the face, which is capable of producing a high-pitched scream that is as loud as a jet engine. SCP-3456 instances vary in size, with the largest recorded manifestation standing 30 meters tall and 15 meters long. Their bodies have also shown to be quite resilient and are completely impervious to conventional weaponry. The anomalous creatures have displayed a high level of adaptive intelligence, using complex tactics like setting up ambushes through the use of property destruction and psychological manipulation to lure targets into traps. This high level of intelligence has led many at the Foundation to believe that SCP-3456 is sapient. Any direct observation of an SCP-3456 instance will cause the entity to become aware of its observer, at which point it will display this awareness by turning in the exact direction of the observer. Once an instance of SCP-3456 has spotted its observer, it will engage in predatory behavior, stalking its witness and pursuing them far beyond the initial site of manifestation, all the while concealing itself and using camouflage as it chases them. SCP-3456 will repeat this behavior over and over, intentionally letting itself be seen by observers over and over as it hunts down and takes each one, until it has captured a large number of individuals and suddenly dematerializes. It's currently unknown where SCP-3456 takes its victims, or what happens to them once it dematerializes, nor is it known how many victims 3456 needs to capture before it is satisfied and dematerializes for good, as the number taken has varied between instances. It's not currently understood why, but SCP-3456 is either unwilling or unable to cross bodies of fresh water and making it to the other side of a freshwater source like a river, lake, or even a stream 
is the only currently known way to escape the anomaly once it begins its pursuit. Instances of SCP-3456 typically appear near sites of mass human suffering, such as battlefields and natural or man-made disasters, and there have been numerous reports and sightings of 3456s at historical events throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries, with multiple manifestations often appearing at the same event. One Foundation report contains an account of an SCP-3456 instance appearing during the First World War at the Battle of the Somme. Rumors spread through the British troops in their trenches of the appearance of a mythical creature many believed to be the Nukalavi, a horse-like demon with origins in Orcadian mythology. Like many SCPs, this ancient folktale turned out to have very real origins. British infantryman Dave Harkin kept a journal which described giant hoof prints appearing in the battlefield mud, and soldiers disappearing under mysterious circumstances appearing to be killed by forces even more terrifying than what the war could produce. Harkin describes one soldier who was firing on advancing Germans when the mud beneath his feet started boiling. Before anyone could react, mud went flying everywhere, and everyone was knocked off their feet. The soldier was gone, not even a body part remained, and Harkin was sure he saw bony protrusions reaching up out of the mud underneath the soldier just before he disappeared. Not long after, Harkin spotted the Orcadian horsemen on the battlefield, and the horsemen spotted Harkin. He watched as the instance of SCP-3456 picked bodies out of the mud and carried them off into the darkness. He took several shots at the entity with his rifle, but the bullets had no effect. As days passed, the half-man, half-horse continued to appear night after night, always doing the same thing picking up injured soldiers off the battlefield and taking them into the darkness. It would always look back at Harkand, seemingly taunting him or inviting him to try following it. Soon more instances of SCP-3456 appeared, many with more than one torso on their back. And then they began laying traps, burying themselves in the mud and waiting for the soldiers to rush over them. Dave Harkand was declared missing in action at the Battle of the Somme, and it's presumed he was taken by the same instance of SCP-3456 that he first observed. Another first-hand account of an encounter with SCP-3456 occurred following the 2011 earthquake and subsequent nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan. With over 2,500 missing persons, several manifestations of SCP-3456 were reported in the areas affected by the quake and SCP Foundation reconnaissance teams were sent to investigate, two of which were quickly wiped out during the encounters with 3456s. One squad, after exploring the evacuated city and not finding anything, spotted an instance of SCP-3456 standing motionless in the middle of an intersection. As they laid eyes on the Orcadian horseman, the human torso that was hanging limp off the motionless horse's body stood upright and began swinging its arms damaging and destroying the buildings and structures around it. It then turned towards the team and emitted an ear-shatteringly loud shriek from the hole where its nose should be before beginning its pursuit. The team immediately began evacuation procedures, even ordering a drone strike in an attempt to slow down the chasing anomaly. The team took shelter in an abandoned high-rise building, but knew their only chance of escape was if they could make it over the nearest body of fresh water which would mean crossing a bridge over the Arakawa River, which was a kilometer away. The team was 50 yards away from the bridge with no further signs of SCP-3456, when one emerged from a side street right next to them. Small arms fire was used against the creature, and two rocket-propelled grenades were fired at it, but all had no effect. A flashbang detonated in the anomaly's face bought enough time for some of the squad to make it across the bridge and escape. But two members of the team were carried away by SCP-3456, with the last image captured by one of the squad's helmet-mounted cams being a shot of the Orcadian horseman smiling just before it demanifested. SCP-3456 is currently uncontained, and due to its extremely dangerous nature and the lack of any containment procedures, it has been designated Keter class. Any personnel who observe the entity are to be treated with Class G amnestics, and their assigned treatment facility must be located within one kilometer of a body of fresh water. 
The Foundation has an ongoing project to attribute any historical references to SCP-3456 to myth, shell shock, hysteria, or PTSD, and any reports of loss of life or property damage involving the anomaly are to be replaced with explanations that attribute the cause to other natural or man-made events. Regions where SCP-3456 is more likely to appear are to be closely monitored with personnel ready to assist in evacuation efforts. But above all else, direct observation of SCP-3456 must be avoided, since once that has happened, there is very little even the SCP Foundation can do to protect you. A young man is in the middle of one of his regular night jogs through the park. He loves running through this park at night. It's dark, the air is cool, and the sounds of the city that surround the park disappear, offering peace, quiet, and a small reprieve from the busy world. He jogs along a path that winds through the park and starts upon a section that is surrounded on both sides by tall trees. He follows the path around a sharp bend and is stopped in his tracks. Standing there, in the middle of the track, is a figure. It has its back to him and isn't moving. He's tall and so uniformly black that he almost disappears into the night. Whoever or whatever this is, He's scared of it. But the creature doesn't move, and neither does he. He's frozen, unsure of what to do, when the creature suddenly turns his head towards him, revealing a pair of bright, glowing eyes. The runner is so terrified he can't even scream. He falls and crawls backwards in the dirt, trying to get away from the creature. The creature turns its body towards him and begins stepping forward. The runner scrambles to his feet and runs. He's sprinting as hard and as fast as he can, adrenaline pumping, heart pounding, trying to put as much distance as he can between himself and that… that thing. His muscles burn, his lungs ache, but he can't stop. Finally, he's back at his house. He bursts through the door, locking and bolting it behind him. His girlfriend is reading on the couch and doesn't understand what's going on. After struggling to catch his breath, he tries to explain what he saw on the path, but his girlfriend just laughs. A giant man with glowing eyes? He was just seeing things in the dark. It was probably a dog, nothing that would justify the panic he was now in. The next day, he's left wondering if he really was mistaken. Those piercing, glowing eyes are burned into his mind, though. Maybe his girlfriend was right, and it really was just a dog. Yes, that must be it. His mind was just playing tricks on him in the dark. Even so, he's going to stick to running inside, at least for a little while. But he soon finds that he's having a hard time. He notices that he's running out of breath much quicker than normal. Is he coming down with something? He doesn't feel sick. But then why is he suddenly so weak? Two weeks have passed since he saw something in the park. No one he brought it up to, not his friends, not his co-workers, have ever heard of such a thing. And no one seemed like they believed him either. At this point, he is feeling sure that he really did imagine it. But he can't get that image of whatever it was out of his head. He can't keep running on a treadmill forever, though. He misses his night runs. It's time to get over his fear. He's running through the park again, enjoying the silence and the light breeze on his skin. He continues down the path, acutely aware that he's getting closer and closer to the spot where he saw that thing before. He can't stop, though. He has to prove to everyone that he's not afraid. He has to prove it to himself. He reaches the part of the path that runs through the tall trees, just like before. The sounds of the city melt away, the only sound coming from his steady, heavy breathing. He follows the winding path and feels his heart starting to race, but he has to keep going. He rounds the same corner and… nothing is there. He slows to a stop. Of course nothing is here. Nothing ever was. He really did imagine it. Or did he? Buongiorno. Today's file comes from the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation, SCP-015-IT, also known as the Boogeyman. SCP-015-IT is a humanoid entity that stands just under two meters tall. Its body is devoid of any hair, and its dark, black skin absorbs 98% of all light, making it virtually invisible in low light. Its head lacks a nose or ears, but these missing features are hardly noticed. Because if you see 015-IT, its eyes are what demand all of your attention. While the boogeyman's skin is completely black, its eyes contain light-producing organs on the irises, causing them to glow in the dark, like a deep-sea predator. 
Its mouth contains eight pointed teeth on both the upper and lower jaws, and a long 28-centimeter forked tongue. The two tips of its tongue each have a hollow needle-like organ that leads straight into its esophagus. More on what it does with that specialized biological feature soon. Physically, SCP-015-IT is rather slight, but it is surprisingly strong and easily able to overpower an adult human. Its skinny arms are much longer than an average human's, and each of its four fingers ends in a razor-sharp claw. It has also been shown to be quite resistant to physical injuries and possesses the ability to heal wounds and damage to internal organs at a hyper-accelerated rate. SCP-015-IT is primarily active at night, which is unsurprising given its skin's natural camouflage in the dark. The boogeyman hunts mammals, with humans being its preferred prey. But it does not feed on flesh. Instead, SCP-015-IT draws its sustenance from the adrenaline and noradrenaline produced by its quarry. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are chemicals the body produces to increase heart rate, blood flow, and provide more energy to the muscles in moments of stress, or in the case of SCP-015-IT, extreme fear. And it has developed a hunting method to cause this exact reaction in humans. 015-IT will usually hide in dark spots, trying to keep out of sight as much as possible as it stalks its next victim. If it has been able to remain unseen, it will wait for a moment when its prey has become distracted so it can silently approach them. Once close enough, it will leap towards its unaware victim, grab them, and quickly bite them on the side of the torso, near where the adrenal gland is located. It uses its large teeth to anchor its mouth in place as it uses the needles on its forked tongue to probe into their body. With one needle, it pierces directly into the adrenal gland and begins draining the blood that is now rich with fear-induced adrenaline. At the exact same time, the other needle releases a mild sedative, allowing 015-IT to feed and then depart without risk as the victim remains immobile. Another anomalous effect occurs when someone is unlucky enough to actually see the boogeyman. Roughly two weeks after observing the creature, the person who saw it will begin experiencing various detrimental mental effects, including hallucinations and panic attacks. Some will also begin to experience physical issues, most often damage to the cardiovascular system. It is unknown why exactly these mental and physical effects occur, but it is theorized that SCP-015-IT may use it as a way to weaken certain prey that it considers too strong or potentially dangerous. In 2011, the Boogeyman was actually contained, but not by the SCP Foundation. The Brotherhood of St. George's Knights is a secret order in the Catholic Church that was created by the Pope in the year 453 to either contain or eliminate all anomalies, and it was this group that first captured SCP-015-IT, which they designated as DIA-212 in line with their own classification system. While it was in their containment, they made a number of discoveries about the creature that they labeled as a shadow demon. First, they found that while it feeds on the fear of its victims by ingesting their blood, it doesn't actually require this to survive. DIA-212, as they call it, is an unstable entity, and feeding allows it to maintain its physical shape in our reality. In addition to its impressive physical strength, the boogeyman is also quite intelligent as seen by its ability to successfully hunt, attack, and escape from humans. Strangely, it also appears to be resistant to weapons which have been blessed, causing only a fraction of the physical damage that they should when compared to a similar, non-holy version. During the course of research into the creature, Father Ilardi, a member of the Brotherhood of St. George's Knights, wrote that despite the creature being repugnant beyond every limit, he believed that it had a gentle soul and that its screams are similar to a pained cry. He postulated that SCP-015-IT may have even once been a human before some dark force transformed it into the monster that it had become. He decided that it was his mission to find a way to communicate with the creature, and one day bring it back into the light and love of his god. Father Ilardi was making good progress with the creature, and it seemed like it was even growing fond of him and his disciples. But his advances were halted when they were attacked by a group of soldiers from the Fascist Council of the Occult, a terrorist group that seeks to use anomalies as weapons in their quest to disrupt the social order. In the attack, several of the Brotherhood were killed, and in the commotion, SCP-015-IT escaped. Following this, reports soon began to come from the province of Caserta that described what sounded like vampire attacks. 
A mobile task force was sent to the area, and while 015IT was initially able to make use of its various physical abilities to evade and escape capture, it was eventually shot with a transmitter that allowed it to be tracked. The Italian mobile task force was able to surround the creature, but fearing being contained again, it responded with a level of violence that it had not been thought capable of. Several members of the task force were killed in the line of duty before the boogeyman could finally be subdued. Today, SCP-015-IT is contained at Site Vittoria in the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy. Since this anomaly is both sentient and highly unpredictable in its behavior, it has been classified as Euclid. It is kept in a standard humanoid entity containment cell and is monitored by video cameras and infrared sensors at all times. Due to the light-absorbing properties of its skin, its cell and the adjacent corridors are painted white and are to be kept well lit at all times. Twice a day, SCP-015-IT is given a normal, domestic pig that it is allowed to feed on. Any personnel assigned to 015-IT duty must undergo a psychological assessment on a weekly basis and, regardless of the results, must be cycled out after three months of exposure to the boogeyman. A teenaged boy and girl are sitting on surfboards, gently bobbing up and down in the calm ocean water. This surfing trip didn't turn out nearly as exciting as they had hoped it would. So with no waves in sight and the pair growing bored, they decide to head back to shore. Just as they're about to start paddling back, though, the girl gives one last look and spots the water swelling in the distance. She calls out for her friend to stop. It's just what they've been waiting for. Waves are coming in, and big ones, too. They can see that they're going to break at the perfect time. Maybe this trip will turn out to be a good one after all. The boy tells the girl that she can have the first one, and she starts paddling to catch it. She pops up on her board just as the wave breaks, riding it expertly towards the shore, as the boy does the same on his own behind her. They have a great time, riding wave after wave, each one coming in bigger and stronger than the last. The girl starts to worry, though, that they might be getting too big and fast. As the girl finishes surfing another perfect wave, she looks back at the boy just in time to see him wipe out on an especially tall one. He and his board are pulled beneath the water and both disappear under the breaking wave. She hops off her own board and stands in the waist-deep water, watching for her friend to emerge. But he doesn't. She scans the horizon and calls out for him, but there's no sign of her friend. She's getting worried. He should have surfaced by now. She doesn't see any sign of him or his board. What's going on? Boo! The girl jumps with fright and turns around. The boy is standing behind her. But how did he get there? He tells her that the last wave was a crazy one that must have pulled him and his board under the water towards her. He's never experienced anything quite like it, but he's fine now. There's nothing to worry about. The girl, still trying to catch her breath from the fright, gives him a playful punch on the arm and recommends that they call it a day. The waves are getting stronger, and if he was pulled under once, then who knows what would happen if one of them wiped out on an even bigger one. Besides, the boy looks like he might have hurt himself, and the girl points at a small cut on his arm that's starting to bleed. The boy tells her that it's only a scratch, and insists on catching one more wave before they head home. He doesn't want to miss this opportunity to ride these great waves when they have the whole ocean to themselves. He tells her that she can head back if she wants, but he's going out one more time. The boy starts to paddle back out, and the girl reluctantly follows him. As they wait to catch a wave, she tells him that this time he can go first. She's not going to let him scare her again. The boy promises no more surprises and goes to catch another wave. The waves are coming faster now, and she's able to get on one right behind him. As she surfs towards the shore, she keeps one eye on the boy. These waves are tough, and she needs to focus, but her attention is drawn towards her friend. She sees something forming on his wave. It looks like the water itself is growing out of the crest of the wave and reaching towards the boy. It looks like the jaws of a shark. The girl screams, and the boy looks back, straight into the gnashing teeth of the shark reaching out of the waves. The boy yells in fear and falls, tumbling into the water just underneath the mouth as its jaws snap shut on his board right where he was standing, splintering it into pieces. The girl can't believe what she's seeing and stumbles on her board. She catches herself but looks behind her just in time to see the same jaws coming out of the wave towards her. The boy emerges out of the water carrying his friend onto the nearly empty beach. He lays her down in the sand, screaming for help as a few beachgoers start running towards them. No one has any idea what they could possibly do to assist, though. Both of the girl's legs have been bitten off at the thigh, and it's clear she was dead long before he carried her onto the beach. 
Bonjour. Today's file comes from our friends at the French branch of the SCP Foundation, a frightening and dangerous aquatic anomaly that has been designated SCP-054-FR, but is appropriately also known as Blue Fear. SCP-054-FR is an oceanic phenomenon that has been observed occurring in several different regions spread across the world. In these areas, of which at least five have been identified, certain waves will display extremely dangerous anomalous activity. The waves themselves will seem to physically transform, taking on a shape that resembles the mouth and jaws of a Carcharidon carcarius, a species of shark better known to most as the Great White. The giant shark mouth, which is full of row upon row of razor-sharp teeth, will often go unnoticed until it is too late for the unfortunate victim, with the roar of the powerful wave itself covering up much of the sound of the gnashing jaws as it attempts to bite the targeted individual. The SCP-054-FR phenomenon will only appear on waves in these areas that are at least 4 meters in height, but a maximum height on which the jaws will manifest has yet to be identified. Waves carrying the anomalous effect are changed in other ways, too. Not only does a terrifying set of carnivorous jaws appear out of the water, but the wave will move faster as well. With SCP-054-FR waves having been measured at rolling three times the speed of normal, non-affected waves. The frequency of just how often SCP-054-FR will affect waves is not well understood, but what is known is that waves will speed up when a human or non-aquatic animal is in the water between a wave instance and the coast. The frequency of 054-FR waves will increase dramatically as well when individuals in the area are at least 250 meters from the coast, and SCP-054-FR does not care which aquatic activities you're engaging in when it spots you that far from shore. There have been documented cases involving casual swimmers, snorkelers, and divers, but surfers are, for some unknown reason, far and away the most likely victims. Observations have shown that non-aquatic animals are also at risk of triggering the effect, such as in the case of several seabirds that were seen floating on the water just before an SCP-054-FR wave crashed down on them and the birds vanished, leaving only blood and feathers floating on the surface where they once were. Even some aquatic vehicles like jet skis and small boats have been observed being attacked by the anomalous shark jaws, though it seems to avoid going after larger vessels. If more than one person is present in the area that SCP-054-FR is manifesting, though, then additional instances of the jaws are able to form, either on the same wave or on multiple different ones in the area. The injuries caused by SCP-054-FR are very similar to those of a normal, non-anomalous great white shark, and the force of the jaws appears to be proportional to the size of the wave itself, with larger waves being more powerful than smaller ones. Victims of 054-FR attacks have had entire limbs ripped off, others were torn completely in half, while some simply disappeared beneath the wave as it crashed down on top of them and the jaws snapped shut. The only way to avoid being bitten or swallowed whole is to dive down under the wave before it impacts, but the opportunity to do so is quite rare given the wave's ability to sneak up on its victims, and the injuries that are nearly always sustained from an appearance of SCP-054-FR are fatal in 68% of recorded cases. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-054-FR following multiple reports of shark attacks caused by great whites emerging out of the waves to attack humans before vanishing back into the water, and the Foundation soon began a series of experiments to try and better understand the anomaly. The first test performed by Foundation researchers was quite straightforward and involved dumping large quantities of animal blood into the water in an area where SCP-054-FR was reported to have been attacking people. Just like with a normal shark, the blood seemed to act as a trigger for the anomaly, causing it to manifest in less than two minutes, and the researchers watched as the shark jaws tried to bite at the blood as the wave rolled over it. The test was repeated, but this time human blood was used instead. This also caused instances of SCP-054-FR to appear on the waves, though now they manifested much faster, often showing up less than one minute after the blood was dumped into the water. It seems that SCP-054-FR has a strong preference for humans, or at least their blood, and only a small amount is all that is needed to cause the shark jaws to quickly appear. Tests involving D-Class personnel have shown that wounded individuals are four times as likely to trigger a manifestation as an uninjured individual, but that there are also ways to limit how often the carnivorous waves will appear. 
It seems that lying motionless on the water will significantly reduce how often SCP-054-FR will spawn, and slow body movements will decrease the likelihood of an appearance as well. Strangely, while blood will make the jaws manifest quickly, it is unlikely that it is because SCP-054-FR can smell it, since tests that have tried to disguise the smell of both the blood and the human test subjects have all met with failure. So far, all attempts at damaging the anomaly have also been unsuccessful. Bullets fired at the shark jaws pass harmlessly through it, disappearing into the wave as if they were shooting at perfectly normal water. Given its nature, it seems unlikely that the Foundation will find a way to capture and contain SCP-054-FR, so for the time being, all containment efforts have been directed towards keeping humans away from it. A one-kilometer exclusion zone has been established around the five geographic areas where manifestations have been reported, and civilians are completely forbidden to access the areas under the guise of there being ongoing research into marine mammal life that would be disrupted by the presence of any humans. Secrecy is of the utmost importance when it comes to SCP-054-FR in order to keep the curious away for their own safety, so any photographic evidence of the anomaly is confiscated and destroyed, and witnesses of an SCP-054-FR attack are given amnestics in order to remove the memory of any anomalous shark attacks from their minds. The Foundation also engages in an extensive misinformation campaign to debunk any evidence of the anomaly spreading the idea that any reports of a shark mouth forming on waves are simply hoaxes or misunderstanding of wave dynamics, while attacks are blamed on normal, non-anomalous great white sharks. It is unknown if the five areas the Foundation has contained make up the entirety of the locations where SCP-054-FR can manifest, but Foundation agents continue to monitor reports of shark attacks around the world, and hopefully, they will find that they were the result of the regular oceanic super predator, and not the kind that can manifest behind you when you least expect it. A doctor frantically writes in his journal, It's almost impossible to believe everything that's transpired has taken place in such a short amount of time. It all began three days ago. It was just another day down in the mines. A worker was drilling into a seam of coal when suddenly there was an issue with the rig. From what I've gathered, Sounds like the drill bit exploded due to some kind of mechanical defect, sending shards of metal flying throughout the tunnel. The worker was lucky that none of the large pieces struck him, as they surely would have been fatal. He had, though, still been grazed by a piece of shrapnel from the ruined drill bit, and it had left a deep cut across his upper arm. Other miners who were working nearby heard the commotion and quickly came to his aid. They applied a tourniquet to stem the flow of blood and helped him to the mineshaft elevator for the long ride to the surface. Once they reached the safety of daylight, they brought the injured man to the on-site medical clinic where I was on duty at the time. I cleaned the wound since there was a substantial amount of coal dust that had gotten inside before suturing and bandaging it. The miner was sent to his bunkhouse to recover, and I thought that would be the end of it. Of course, it was only the beginning. Roughly 24 hours later, the same miner presented himself to me once again. I asked about his injury, and he explained that while his arm was fine, he now felt like he might be coming down with an illness. His symptoms included a runny nose, a cough, and body aches, so my assumption was that he'd simply had some bad luck and caught a cold that just so happened to coincide with being injured on the job. I sent him to his bunk once again, telling him that he wouldn't be able to work and should instead use the day to rest and recover. The next day, I was once again in the clinic when my phone rang. It wasn't the sick miner, but instead his supervisor. The miner hadn't shown up for his shift that morning, and he asked for me to go check on him since he knew he hadn't been feeling well. I agreed that it was strange that neither of us had heard anything else from the miner and went to see him straight away. I entered the bunkhouse where many of the workers stay while on site at this remote mine. It was empty, except for the injured miner who was still in his bed. As I approached, I could immediately tell something was very wrong. The man was curled up in the fetal position, and was sweating profusely while also shivering. A quick touch of his forehead revealed that the man had a high fever, too. He was practically incoherent, seemingly delirious from his high temperature. The miner was moved to the empty bed inside the clinic so I could better observe and tend to him, but very carefully since I assumed now that he was actually suffering from influenza and didn't want to risk an outbreak at the mine. I was getting ready to administer fluids to the miner, who was still mumbling incomprehensibly, when I noticed something on his face. It appeared that he was crying, but the tears that ran down his cheeks weren't made of water. 
or blood. I hadn't seen anything like it before. There was no reason why influenza should be causing this man to cry tears of blood. I could see the veins in his forehead starting to pulse, as if his blood pressure had suddenly skyrocketed. And just as I was leaning in to get a closer look, something horrible happened. The miner suddenly opened his mouth and expelled an enormous stream of blood. The blast of blood struck me in the face and knocked me backwards in fright as the man continued expelling more and more blood from his mouth, which soon covered the walls of the clinic. With seemingly all the blood having been discharged from his body, the man then went limp. I attempted to resuscitate him, but strangely, there was no need. The man was comatose, but he was alive. There I was, standing in the middle of the clinic over the man, both he, myself, as well as the room completely covered in blood. It was one of the worst things I had ever experienced as a doctor, and yet, somehow, it was about to get even worse. I was still in shock from what had just happened when I heard the door to the clinic open behind me. I turned around to see a group of half a dozen more miners from the site, each one coughing, sweating, and shivering. One held a cloth to his ear that was stained red, while another attempted to stop his nose from bleeding. Whatever had infected the first patient wasn't a one-off medical event. This had the makings of an epidemic. I knew that I was in way over my head. I was just a general practitioner, not an infectious disease specialist, and I called the Center for Disease Control to get their guidance. I was told to quarantine the sick man as best I could, and that a rapid response team would be sent who were better equipped to deal with potential outbreaks. While I waited for the CDC to arrive, I began moving the afflicted men to a bunkhouse that had been designated for quarantining. Several more also began expelling huge amounts of blood, though unlike the first patient, none of the others survived the traumatic event. As I was putting the final infected man into a bed, I noticed something, though. There was a huge amount of heat radiating off of his lower body, and when I pulled down the blankets, I discovered something that even with all of the strange happenings, I still couldn't believe. There were huge lumps growing on his legs, each of which looked to be filled with some kind of fluid or gas, and they were extremely hot to the touch, as if the chemicals inside the lumps were creating a source of heat. As I was investigating the bizarre growths, I suddenly looked up to see that the man was no longer in a state of delirium. Instead, a crazed look had come over his eyes, and he suddenly leapt out of bed, flailing and clawing at me as if he wanted to kill me. I don't know how, but... I was able to fight off the man and run out of the bunkhouse. He gave chase, though, and with no other option, I ran into a nearby storage shed. The man was beating and scratching at the door, but I was able to barricade it by dragging a heavy shelf in front of it. After several minutes of trying to break inside, he finally gave up and left. And here I remain. I'm too afraid to go back out. It seems that if the disease won't kill me, then whatever it is turning people into will. All I can do is wait for the CDC team to get here and hopefully know how to deal with whatever the situation has become. The doctor closes his small notebook and notices a drop of something fall onto the cover. He reaches up and wipes his hand across his mouth. It comes back, covered in blood. The doctor didn't know what the disease was that had so rapidly spread through the workers at the mine, nor did the CDC response team when they arrived. No, it wasn't until the SCP Foundation caught word of the mysterious outbreak that someone would finally determine what was happening with what would soon be called SCP-016, which is also known as the Sentient Microorganism. SCP-016 is a blood-borne pathogen that was first discovered after a worker at a remote mine was injured while drilling into a coal seam deep beneath the earth. It is theorized that coal dust entered the wound, dust which perhaps carried dormant spores of what would become SCP-016. Over the next several days, all of the remaining employees at the mine were infected, as was the CDC crisis team that was sent to the mine to investigate the outbreak of what was potentially an undiscovered pathogen. Following the CDC's inability to deal with the disease, the SCP Foundation took over the site and quickly terminated all affected personnel in order to prevent further spread. The first infected person, Patient Zero, was taken into Foundation custody for further investigation, and the mine shaft itself was collapsed by an explosive device in order to seal it off. After studying Patient Zero, the Foundation learned a great deal about just what they were dealing with. What they found was that SCP-016 has an incubation period that can vary wildly from just 24 hours to as long as two years, with the length appearing to be dependent on the number of other potential human hosts in the immediate area. 
Once symptoms begin to present in an individual, they will at first look to be quite similar to the common cold. They can include coughing, a runny nose, itchy eyes, and body aches. Roughly 48 hours after the first symptoms, the infected person will experience a form of hemorrhagic fever, similar to the Ebola virus, which causes a small amount of bleeding in the lungs. This leads to the infected blood becoming aspirated, most likely in order to better spread through the air. The third stage of the disease leads to the host crashing and bleeding out as they start to bleed profusely from multiple body orifices, including the nose, tear ducts, mouth, and even through the pores of their skin. Their blood pressure will also skyrocket during this final stage, and in some cases, have vomited blood as far as five meters. Oddly enough, although most die from the traumatic event, this almost complete exsanguination will not always result in death. Sometimes, following the removal of almost all blood from the body, the patient will somehow survive, and the pathogen inside their body will return to its dormant phase once again, before eventually repeating the process. But SCP-016 is more than just a rapid and often deadly bloodborne disease, as you will soon see. As SCP researchers studied the disease, what they discovered was that it had a very strange property that sets it apart from other hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola and the Marburg virus. What they found was that when someone infected with SCP-016 is placed into a high-stress situation, such as one where their life is being threatened, SCP-016 will transition from rapidly reproducing inside of its host's body to instead begin rewriting their host's actual DNA. This genetic manipulation, combined with the stimulation of rapid cell division, leads to the host undergoing major physiological changes and in extremely small amounts of time. In just 24 hours, the host can begin showing physical changes to their body, and a complete bodily reconstruction can occur in less than two weeks. Most of the hosts who begin to undergo physical changes will not survive the process, due to how heavily the transformation stresses the body, but those that do will be changed in more than just physical ways. They'll exhibit hyper-aggressive behaviors not dissimilar to those infected by rabies. And it's theorized that the pathogen may cause this behavior in order to better spread the virus. When the Foundation realized that SCP-016 was capable of these transformative effects, they immediately undertook a number of experiments on D-Class personnel in order to better understand their full extent. In the first test, a D-Class was infected with SCP-016, and as soon as they began showing symptoms, their cell was slowly flooded with water in order to stimulate the life-threatening situation needed to trigger the transformation process. Over the next 24 hours, researchers watched as the subject appeared to develop gills which would allow it to survive in the now water-filled cell. The transformations didn't stop there, though, and over the next two weeks, the subject also had their limbs change into fins, their eyesight deteriorated, and their sense of hearing increased as they developed an echolocation ability very similar to the one employed by whales and dolphins. The experiment was concluded by removing all of the water from the cell leading to the death of the subject from asphyxiation as they could no longer breathe in the open air. A similar experiment was performed on another D-Class, but this time, instead of taking on aquatic animal properties, the D-Class experienced rapid muscle growth and their knuckles grew bone-like protrusions. It attempted to use both of these to break through the door of their flooding cell, but they were unable to breach the reinforced steel and soon died from drowning. The Foundation now knew that the virus could react in different ways to the same situation. The same experiment was run a third time, but in this instance, the infected D-Class exhibited an entirely different means of trying to escape. The subject had a massive growth appear on its chest, which seemed to be fed from two different tubes of flesh, also emanating from the subject's body. Fearing what it planned to do, the Foundation ended the experiment early and terminated the subject. An autopsy revealed that the growth was actually a hollow chamber that was being fed by the tubes with oxygen and acetylene gas, which when combined in sufficient amounts would cause a massive combustion event. In other words, SCP-016 was turning the subject into a living bomb. Moving on from flooded cell tests, the researchers next left the D-Class inside of a room with no stressing elements and instead told them to focus on growing a pair of wings. Without any reason to begin the transformation process, SCP-016 went through its normal stages, and the subject died from blood loss without any other changes occurring. In the final test, a D-Class was placed inside of an acrylic box that was suspended over a mine shaft, with a timer attached indicating the time when the bottom of the box would open and drop the D-Class into the thousand-foot deep shaft. 
This D-class was also told to focus on growing wings that would allow them to survive the plunge. The subject began to transform over the next 24 hours, but rather than grow wings, they instead developed a tentacle-like appendage on their arm that was capable of producing silk similar to a spider's spinneret. They used the silk-producing organ to secure themselves to the box, showing that subjects did not appear to be able to control the way in which SCP-016 would alter their bodies. This experiment concluded when the timer reached zero and the bomb attached to it detonated, as had been the plan all along. Following this last test, SCP-016 samples were placed into containment, and access to the sample for experimental purposes is only allowed with prior authorization from Level 4 or O5 personnel, with full documentation of the proposed experiment required beforehand. Failure to follow any of these procedures will lead to the offending personnel being reassigned to D-Class duty or terminated. SCP-016 has been classified as Keter, and the only existing sample is kept in a petri dish which is under extreme lockdown inside of a 5 by 5 by 5 meter room, where the temperature is kept below 0 degrees Celsius at all times. Should an outbreak of SCP-016 occur, all infected personnel are to be immediately terminated on site, and if the infection cannot be contained within 48 hours, then the on-site nuclear device is to be detonated prior to any additional personnel being evacuated. While the containment procedures may sound callous, unfortunately when it comes to anomalous pathogens as dangerous as SCP-016, no chances can be taken. A man is lying in a hospital bed, and it is clear that he is not doing well. A group of doctors buzz around him performing various tests, checking his vital signs again and again. The man feels weak and a little disoriented, and the looks on the various doctors' faces tells him all he needs to know. Something is very wrong with him. Finally, there is a break in the commotion, and the doctors stop prodding at him and peering into his eyes with a bright, blinding light. All of the doctors and nurses leave the room except for one. The doctor steps towards the man and tells him that he has some bad news. You see, before the doctor can finish, someone else emerges from the shadows in the corner of the room and taps him on the shoulder. I'll handle this. The man hadn't noticed this person, but he can see now that he's dressed in a suit and, unlike the doctors, he doesn't have any identifying items like a name tag or badge. Maybe he's some kind of professor, or a renowned surgeon who is going to tell him how they will make him better. The doctor steps back from the bed, but the man in the suit tells the doctor that it would be best if he and the patient could be left alone. Just for a moment, of course. The doctor nods in agreement and leaves the room. The man in the suit waits until the door is closed behind him to continue. He tells the sick man that he has a rare condition, quite rare. So rare, in fact, that you're the only person to ever have it, the only recorded case in history. The man in the suit sits down on the bed next to the man and takes his hand, lifting it up, examining it. The man's hand is an odd color. It has a slight green tint to it, and the skin itself appears to be taking on a fibrous quality. The sick man feels very tired, but he manages to whisper, Are you a doctor? Are you going to help me? The man in the suit responds, Yes, I'm a doctor. Of sorts. A doctor and a researcher. I work for a very important organization, and I specialize in cases just like yours. Well, not exactly like yours. You're unique. Quite special, in fact. The sick man <laughs> offers a weak smile. I'm very lucky. Oh yes, very lucky indeed. Well, not because of your condition, of course, but because I am here. You see, if it's all right with you, We'd like for you to come with us, to come stay at one of our facilities for a while. We can't promise that we'll be able to figure out exactly what's happening or why. But if we can, we have a much better chance of figuring out how to cure it. To cure you, so you can go back to a normal life. Do I have much of a choice? The sick man asks. Of course you do. It's completely up to you. I think this would be your best course of action, your best by far in fact. But we can't force you to do anything you don't want to do. The sick man looks down at his greenish hand again, turning it over in front of his face, examining the small growths that seem to be sprouting from his skin. When do we leave? Right now, the man in the suit tells him. The nurses will come get you ready, and then we'll be on our way. The man in the suit leaves the room and closes the door behind him. Standing next to the door in the hallway are a pair of men wearing tactical uniforms like a SWAT team. The man in the suit tells them that luckily they won't be needed today. This one is coming easy. The sick man lies on a bed, but now he is in a new room. This one is even more sterile than the hospital, with cold concrete walls and harsh fluorescent lights. 
Just like in the hospital, he's surrounded by a seemingly never-ending cast of doctors, nurses, and researchers. They too poke and prod at him, take samples, and administer all kinds of tests. As time goes on, the man's condition only grows worse. It seems there's nothing that they can do to stop his condition from advancing. The green color spreads across his body and his skin soon becomes woody and stiff. If he sits in one place for too long without moving, tiny fibers emerge from his skin like probing roots looking for soil. All the while, the man grows weaker and more fragile. Even the slightest movement seems to cause him great pain. The doctor who originally brought the man to the facility gathers with a small group in the observation room next to the man's containment cell. They discuss the results of a recent test, which showed that much of the melanin in his skin has somehow been replaced with chlorophyll, and that the fibrous quality of his skin is being caused by the appearance of cellulose around his cells. In other words, he isn't just starting to look like a plant, he's truly becoming a plant, and there doesn't seem to be anything they can do to stop it. Try as they might, they haven't found a single clue as to what is causing the man's condition, or how to treat it. The man, though, seems strangely at peace with his fate. He's told that they're going to allow him to live, whether that be as a man or as a plant in containment, for as long as he can stay alive, and that he will be well taken care of to make the whole process as comfortable for him as possible. Even though they failed to find a cure for his anomalous disease, they will do everything in their power to make sure he doesn't suffer. A tragic yet familiar tale for the SCP Foundation, a normal person is subjected to an abnormal situation that completely changes their life, and not for the better. At least in this situation, the Foundation appears to have shown a rare glimpse of their own humanity, opting to make this safe class anomaly's existence as painless as possible rather than force it to endure a lifetime of painful tests and studies. Or at least that's what you've been led to believe. Unfortunately, everything you've just seen about SCP-1500 is a lie. Those with level 3 clearance, though, can learn the truth, which is that SCP-1500 is actually an extremely dangerous anomaly, whose true identity must be hidden from even the majority of the Foundation, for reasons you'll soon learn. SCP-1500 is not a man suffering from a condition that causes him to slowly transform into a plant-like being, but is actually a greenish-gray, smooth-skinned humanoid with no facial features at all. Its limbs are long and multi-jointed, and its abdomen is highly distended. The skin is exceptionally durable and tough, and though SCP-1500 has no visible sense organs like ears or a nose, it still appears to possess senses that are roughly equivalent to an average human's. The entity is incapable of speech, owing to its lack of a mouth, and it has not shown a need to eat, breathe, or sleep at all. In addition to the strange appearance of SCP-1500, its primary anomalous effect is the impact it has on any human that comes within its line of sight, or rather what would be its line of sight if it had any eyes. Those that do find that they will soon begin experiencing headaches, nausea, and an overwhelming sense of dread. These symptoms will increase over the next several minutes, with the headaches becoming more and more debilitating, and the feelings of nausea and fear growing until eventually the subject passes out. They will remain unconscious for roughly 15 seconds, after which they will awaken and claim to have no memory of ever being exposed to SCP-1500. But something else strange also happens to the subject after waking. When asked to describe the creature known as SCP-1500, they will no longer remark on its faceless head or long twisted limbs. Instead, they will describe the creature as being an average looking Caucasian male. Even stranger is that to them, it now has a name, Zachary Callahan. In further interviews with subjects exposed to SCP-1500, it became clear that many of their memories had been reshaped to now include the entity in its human-looking Zachary Callahan form. They would often describe him as a close friend from childhood or early adulthood, and one that played a significant role in their lives. They also claimed that they are perfectly capable of communicating with Zachary Callahan, able to carry on conversations with him, while all the observing researchers will see is an apparently one-sided conversation between the subject and the featureless gray-skinned creature. While Foundation personnel have found that they are able to remove the false memories from the subject's minds through the use of amnestics, they have yet to be able to reverse the effect that causes the subject to see SCP-1500 as a human being, and everyone who has been exposed continues to see the entity as Zachary Callahan forevermore. It is still unknown what kind of long-term effects this exposure may have or how dangerous to their mental or physical health it will turn out to be. Even more concerning is that evidence has emerged that SCP-1500 may be able to affect more than just those in its immediate presence. Recently, a United States Senator was giving a televised speech on a rather uninteresting topic. 
The speech started out normal enough, but then the senator began to relay an anecdote about a childhood fishing trip he had taken with a friend. You won't be surprised to learn that according to the senator, the friend's name was none other than Zachary Callahan. Investigations into the senator's background concluded that there was no person by that name of the appropriate age in the area where he grew up. It was also discovered the senator had suffered an especially bad migraine at a dinner party the week before the speech. Further research into SCP-1500's memory-altering effects have also revealed that they might just be more intrusive than first believed. Rather than simply appearing as an old friend, subjects exposed to 1500 have begun to report that Zachary Callahan actually played a much more prominent role in their lives, either as a close relative, a parental figure, or even a former lover. In each of these cases, the subjects described their feelings for Zachary Callahan as ones of adoration, and that he made them feel protected and loved. Most troubling of all is a recent addendum to the SCP-1500 file, which describes the very latest research on the anomaly and its effects. It is now estimated that as many as 23,000 people all across the world have been affected by the creature, with the idea of Zachary Callahan implanted into their memories. It is unknown why it is trying to spread its influence so far and wide, but one clue that may point to a nefarious purpose is that it seems to be disproportionately targeting political and military figures, as well as SCP Foundation personnel. Following these new developments, classification of SCP-1500 to Keter was requested and granted. Due to the risk that SCP-1500 poses through its anomalous effects, and its powerful ability to influence those in positions of great power, it is permanently kept in a modified humanoid containment cell at Site-17. No personnel are allowed to enter into its containment chamber under any circumstances, nor are there security cameras in its cell. A false containment document describing a human male with an anomalous plant-like effect was placed in the database in order to deter further investigation into the real SCP-1500. And any personnel who experience painful, persistent headaches are immediately transferred away from Site-17, while any who attempt to breach containment are immediately terminated. Is SCP-1500 planting the seeds for something big by infiltrating the minds of some of the most influential people on Earth? Or is it merely looking for a connection, as it takes on a form that it wishes it could have in the only way it can, inside an imagination? Perhaps one day, we will know the answer. A young woman is spending the morning in town, completing a few errands she's been meaning to get to for a while. She picks up a few items from the supermarket, gets the cracked screen on her smartphone repaired, and decides to treat herself to a Danish from a local bakery. It's a relatively idyllic Tuesday, until she turns the corner into a narrow side street and sees them. It can often be a little disconcerting to suddenly find yourself staring at a crowd that is gathered for seemingly no reason, but something about this one makes her particularly nervous, and she quickly realizes why. Each person in the tightly packed together group is grinning, as if they are all in on a particularly cruel joke about her. At face value, they all seem to be very different people, a collage of ages, races, genders, in different clothes with different styles, and yet they're all walking with perfect synchronicity, one perfectly timed footfall at a time. This is enough to seriously creep her out. Whatever this strange group of people is doing, she wants no part of it. Instead, she turns and heads in the opposite direction, fast walking and stealing discreet but frequent glances over her shoulder. She can't help but notice, even when the crowd exits the small side street, that they remain huddled together, like security guards packed tight around some invisible VIP. And even worse, they seem to be following her trajectory, getting faster, getting closer, still perfectly in sync with one another. How are all these people gaining so fast, she thinks to herself. When she's around a corner and out of sight, she does the sensible thing and breaks into a sprint, eager to put some distance between herself and them. Even though they haven't shown any signs of overt aggression, she can tell on some visceral level that they mean her great harm. She knows if ever they get close enough, within grasping distance, something terrible will happen. She's soon back at her home and locks herself in, bolting the door behind her. She breathes a sigh, but she's not relieved, not really. Maybe she's paranoid, but she feels like she isn't out of the woods just yet. Those eerie smiles, those perfect footsteps, she can't get them out of her mind. She slips into her kitchen and slides a knife out of the block. She tells herself that doing this is a little crazy, but having some kind of weapon in hand makes her feel at least a little bit safer. But whatever the feelings of comfort the knife gives her are shattered when she hears the doorbell ring. She hadn't ordered anything, she wasn't expecting anyone. Who could that be? 
she hides the knife behind her back and makes her way towards the door. Ding dong, it rings again. Whoever is on the other side is getting impatient. She opens the door slightly, but leaves the chain in place. There's a smiling man in a business suit on the other side. She's racking her brain, trying to remember. Is he one of the people from the crowd? Or is she just imagining things because she's freaked out? She can't tell anymore. She can feel her palm getting sweaty around the knife's handle. The man at the door clears his throat and says, Excuse me, ma'am, I won't take up too much of your time, but I wanted to ask, have you heard the good word? She shakes her head and tells the stranger that she isn't interested in hearing his pitch, but he just keeps smiling and presses on. Do you ever feel lonely, dissatisfied, unfulfilled? Don't you ever wish that you could become a part of something bigger than yourself? It'd be a real weight off your shoulders. She's starting to run out of polite ways to deny him when she hears a faint tapping against the nearby glass. The young woman turns her head and looks into her living room. There's a smiling woman standing at the window, rapping on the glass with her knuckles, grinning. The chill sets in immediately. She recognizes that face with absolute certainty. It's one of the people from the crowd, and now she knows for sure that the man at the door is too. But when she turns back to him, all she sees is his hand reaching through the gap in the door for her. She screams and backs away, instinctively slashing the knife at him. Two fingers fall to the floor, but there's no blood, just thick, flesh-colored pus dripping from the two stumps. The hand doesn't even flinch. It keeps reaching, and soon, the gap in the door is crowded with the faces of even more grinning human figures. She turns and runs as the sheer collected momentum of the crowd forces open the door. They spill into the hallway, tumbling over each other, but still smiling. She notices something trailing out of their clothes, long, sinewy ropes that look like they're made of living flesh, wriggling and pumping with each passing second. This whole situation seems to just be getting worse and worse. Thinking quickly, she decides to flee up the stairs. If she gets to her bedroom fast enough, she can lock her door from the inside, open the window, and climb down the trellis into the yard before they can break in. In that moment, it seems like the best course of action, but only because she has no idea just how quickly the crowd can close the distance. In an instant, the crowd is up onto the stairs and following her, extending their grasping hands in unison. Who are these people? Why are they doing this? The questions that flood her mind are soon forced out by the shock of the grinning stranger in the business suit, pulling her into a powerful bear hug. He squeezes hard, and she can feel it in her muscles and bones. She wriggles for her life, but she can't resist his strength. The rest of the crowd reaches for her. She spots those awful fleshy cords again, emerging from the backs of all these terrifying strangers. And now she sees what they're all leading back to, a giant, formless blob of flesh, like some corrupted, unknown organ, a huge, monstrous tumor. It pulses and throbs. Just looking at it makes her want to be sick, and she can feel the most horrible energy coming off of it. Whatever this thing is, it wants her. It's reaching for her. Fight or flight kicks in, and this time flight isn't an option. The stranger in the suit has a good grip on her, in spite of his missing fingers, but she's still got the knife. She can see the cord trailing from his back into the giant flesh blob, and with one decisive strike, she severs it with the kitchen knife. Immediately, the man in the suit lets go of her. Both ends of the cord flop down, spraying more of the flesh-colored pus, but the effect on the man himself is even more drastic. He flails around, making the most horrible, guttural gurgling noises she's ever heard. He heaves and vomits out gallons of the pus. It sprays from his eyes and nose like a fire hose. It oozes down and out of his pant legs. His body deflates like a punctured balloon as the awful substance cascades out of him, until all that's left is a wet, vacant sack of skin and clothes, quivering on the floor. But she doesn't have time to dwell on the horrors she's just witnessed. She needs to get out of here, now. She turns and continues running up the stairs as the crowd regroups and begins chasing her. She can hear their perfectly synchronized footsteps sloshing through the liquids of their fallen member. They have barely even slowed down. She keeps running. She just needs to keep running. A number of hands close around her body. Several of them clamp around her wrist, squeezing tight until the knife falls from her hand and clatters to the ground. They've learned already. The crowd rises up and closes around her. No matter how hard she struggles, they won't budge. They just keep huddling in. She can hear the giant, pulsing mass of flesh closing in behind her. She feels one of those long, fleshy cords slithering up her back, its fibrous strands easing their way into her flesh until the connection is made. Her eyes roll up into her head as it pumps the fluid into her body, melting away everything inside and congealing it into the same nightmarish slop that she'd just seen splattering out of the man in the business suit moments ago. Little by little, everything that was once her is hollowed out, filled in, 
and paint it over. Once the transformation is complete, she smiles, just like all the others. But she's not she anymore. She's just another part of it, its newest addition, a replacement for the man in the suit. The crowd leaves shortly after, keeping perfect step, looking for some new friends. At some point, everyone has felt the desire to fit in, but one anomaly takes the desire to join the throng to its ultimate extreme. This is SCP-428, also known as the crowd. In its purest state, SCP-428 is an amorphous mass of flesh connected to a number of human hosts with organic tendrils, similar to umbilical cords. The central mass is obscured by its multiple human hosts, numbering 14 at the present moment, and it is an extremely dangerous entity. Once an individual is assimilated into its mass, they are to be considered lost. Upon assimilation, all of the victim's complex internal structures – bones, musculature, organs, nervous system – are instead replaced by material similar in composition to the amorphous mass that controls them. All that remains is their skin and vague shape, being piloted by the SCP-428 hub. When not actively seeking new victims to assimilate, SCP-428 enters a dormant state, its assimilated victims standing in a circle around the hub, audibly mumbling to one another and swaying gently. SCP-428 and its crowd will enter a hostile state if anyone travels within two meters of it. With surprising speed and ferocity, members of the crowd will try to mob the unfortunate victim in a sudden ambush, bringing them into the proximity of the hub. If they remain in this state for over 10 seconds, a cord will attach to their body and their vital systems will be replaced, and they will be assimilated into the crowd, just like the other victims of SCP-428 were before them. If, however, the victim somehow manages to escape before the process is complete, this will not be the end of their ordeal. Should someone evade its attention, SCP-428 and the crowd will enter a period of active hunting behavior to seek out the escaping victim. Failing that, they will try to assimilate any human wandering into their vicinity. There is no safe way to approach SCP-428 or any of its members under any circumstances. To do so is to court a fate worse than death. When a victim is assimilated, SCP-428 and the crowd will return to a dormant state until another victim presents itself. Foundation studies have determined that SCP-428 seeks to add at least one person to its crowd every month, and if a person is not provided, then it will engage in hunting behavior, putting everyone in the area in grave danger. SCP-428 isn't controlling a gaggle of mindless zombies, though. It is an extremely intelligent hive mind made all the more frightening by the fact that it absorbs the knowledge, memories, and skills of each of its victims, and can reapply them through any of the others. Because of this, it appears to have incredibly adept knowledge of the human mind, and will happily resort to using tactics of psychological manipulation to gain an advantage. Despite being a large crowd, tests have shown that SCP-428 and its assimilated victims can move terrifyingly fast. This is because, due to the very nature of the perfectly attuned hive mind, they can walk or run in perfect synchronicity. To best understand this, picture a centipede skittering at great speed across a wall. So many legs, but all sharing a perfectly coordinated nervous system, working together to move the creature with military precision. Even individually, each member of the crowd is a formidable foe. Once they become part of SCP-428, they exhibit greatly increased strength, they show no signs of feeling pain, and also have the ability to quickly heal any injuries. Wounds also do not seem to impede function whatsoever. A member of the crowd getting shot in the leg won't slow it down in the slightest. However, while this creature is incredibly intelligent and dangerous, the same can be said for the SCP Foundation, and in the time since they discovered it, they have ascertained a few weaknesses, even though some of this knowledge came at a heavy cost. Though members of the crowd appear significantly resistant to damage, the SCP-428 hub itself appears to be vulnerable to attack and more than capable of feeling pain. If the hub is damaged in a manner that would cause pain, every member of the crowd is able to feel it, often collapsing and writhing around in agony. When the creature collects itself, it will retreat, guarded by its human shields. The Foundation has used this method to corral the creature back into containment during breaches, with the controlled applications of fire or electricity being favorite methods of Foundation security forces. Severing the connection between a member of the crowd and the central hub is also a surefire way to weaken the overall ability of SCP-428. A severed crowd member will immediately collapse, the SCP-428 material inside it liquefying and excreting from every orifice. 
This may intensify SCP-428's drive to discover a new victim, but it can also be used as a method of population control for the crowd itself. There has been one major incident concerning SCP-428 since its containment at the SCP Foundation, and it acted as a painful reminder to all staff that one should never underestimate the abilities of the anomalies they contain. Evidently, one of the people assimilated by SCP-428 in the past was skilled in the art of lockpicking, as SCP-428 had absorbed this skill. It took apart one of its members' belts and used the pieces to pick the lock of its containment chamber from the inside. It then positioned one of its female victims crouching just outside the door, the cord slithering through the crack in the door behind her. She fell to her knees and began to weep loudly, attracting the attention of a nearby researcher. Naturally, when you hear a distressed person crying, it's human instinct to go investigate and help, and this particular researcher hadn't been briefed on the nature and abilities of SCP-428, which left him completely unprepared for the horrifying fate that awaited him. As he leaned in to comfort the crying woman, the rest of the crowd immediately emerged from the containment chamber's door, mobbing him. One forced its hand over his mouth, stifling his frightened scream as he was pulled in and quickly assimilated. While SCP-428 could pick locks, absorbing a member of SCP Foundation staff, both giving it access to the Foundation site layouts and inner workings as well as a presentable frontman to assuage suspicion, was like getting its fleshy tendrils on a kind of master key. SCP-428 and its crowd, with the assimilated researcher at the head, progressed through the building, avoiding key security checkpoints and absorbing several other researchers and guards along the way. This was a particularly frightening development, as it allowed SCP-428 to further expand both its knowledge of the SCP Foundation and its skills in everything from science to armed and hand-to-hand -hand combat. With every new person it took in, it grew significantly stronger and more dangerous to Foundation personnel. Thankfully, it drew the right kind of attention before it had a chance to escape the containment site proper. A mobile task force was dispatched to contain SCP-428 and the crowd and force it back into its containment chamber. However, being an extremely persistent creature, this minor setback didn't do anything to quell its desire to escape. Given that several members of its crowd were now ex-Foundation staff members, it tried to leverage this in order to manipulate the people guarding its chamber. This became such a problem that a researcher appended a note to its file, reading, People, these casualties are gone. They are SCP-428 now. No matter what it might say or do, they are not your work colleagues nor your friends anymore. Remember this, it may save your life. SCP-428 and its crowd is currently contained in a 5 meter by 5 meter by 5 meter cell, with walls electrified to 30,000 volts to discourage attempts by members of the crowd to break or climb them. The cell is accessed via an airlock, and entry is restricted to level 3 researchers and below, while escorted by two armed guards in order to eliminate the risk of SCP-428 absorbing a valuable asset to the SCP Foundation and coming into possession of truly catastrophic knowledge and skills as a result. Just imagine the disastrous results if, say, a member of the O5 Council were suddenly a part of SCP-428. Researchers are to remain a minimum of two meters away at all times, and it is mandatory for at least two armed guards to stay posted at the chamber's entrance at all times. SCP-428 is to be given one member of D-Class personnel to assimilate every single month in order to prevent it from engaging in hunting behavior. Due to SCP-428's frightening ability to absorb memories, skills, and intelligence, all D-Classes given to 428 are screened for low intelligence and a lack of valuable skills to ensure that the anomaly isn't being given any new aces up its sleeves. However, continually giving SCP-428 new victims is going to increase its overall size and thus necessitate gradual containment upgrades. The possibility of permanently neutralizing SCP-428 is being explored, but in the meantime, it has been given the Euclid Object class, because of its intelligence, skills, and unpredictability. While the SCP Foundation is all about sacrificing the individual for the greater good, this is one frightening collective that they couldn't endorse becoming a part of. A gigantic monster stomps across the land, with nothing able to stop its rampage except for… Come and eat! cries out a voice, and the monster suddenly stops and falls to the side. The child picks up his toy and runs back to where his mother and father have spread out a picnic lunch. As they eat, the boy asks his father about the nearby buildings, a series of six identical structures, each of which is a small rectangular building with a satellite dish on top of it. The weathered buildings look like they have been out here for some time, and the father tells the boy that he isn't sure exactly what they are or what their purpose is, but that they were probably built during the war. What war? the young boy asks. The Pacific War, his father answers. What was that? 
It was a war fought by many countries of the world. Why did they fight? The boy asks. Well, there were a lot of reasons. What were some of the reasons? The father has played this game many times before, and he knows if he doesn't end this line of questioning now, that he'll never be able to eat his lunch. The mother, sensing the same, tells the boy that if he wants to, he can go and play with his toy some more. The boy doesn't need to be given the option again. He quickly gets up and grabs his toy monster before running off to play. Don't go too far, his mother calls out as she watches her son head in the direction of one of the buildings. The boy stops in the shadow of one of the large satellite dishes and sits down in the grass to resume his monster's path of destruction across the countryside. As the monster moves through the tall grass, though, the shadow he is sitting in suddenly starts to shift. The boy looks up to see that the satellite dish on top of the building is moving. With a groan, it begins to turn and change its angle. And it isn't just the one on the building closest to him that's moving. He can see that each of the six satellite dishes are doing the same thing. They're all turning to point towards the same spot on the horizon. The boy squints in the sunlight and sees what they're all now directed towards. Off, far in the distance, is a real monster. It's a massive looking creature, a huge half fish, half lizard, covered in scales and spiky fins. It must be at least 50 meters tall or more, and it's coming straight towards him. The boy can already hear the sounds of its giant webbed feet stomping and shaking the ground. And as it gets closer, its high-pitched shrieks and cries become audible too. Adding to the cacophony, an air raid siren begins to wail, followed by the sounds of gunfire, the marching of hundreds of boots, and the roar of engines. The boy looks around, but he doesn't see any of it. It's just him, the buildings, and the monster. The boy can't run, though. He's frozen in fear. All he can do is watch as it swipes at trees and power lines, knocking them down with ease, all while getting closer and closer. The satellite dishes finally finish their slow alignment, and there's a loud humming noise, followed by a loud cracking sound, as each one emits a bright beam of electricity at the monster. The creature stops its assault and howls in pain as the six satellites focus their beams on it. The beams disappear, and the monster appears stunned, but then it looks up and continues to come forward, this time even faster than before. The monster is only hundreds of feet away now, and the boy doesn't know what to do. He's too scared to even scream for help closes his eyes and starts to cry when he's abruptly lifted into the air. The boy opens his eyes to see that it's his father. He picks up the boy and starts to run as fast as he can. The boy can see over his father's shoulder that the monster has not changed its course to follow them. It seems to still be focused on the building he was playing next to. The monster finally reaches the building and begins swiping at it, tearing it apart as the other satellites slowly realign, all pointing at the creature once again. The sound of the invisible army increases and the monster reels as if it is struck by unseen weapons. It suddenly rears back in pain as an artillery shell appears just feet away from it before exploding in the creature's face. But nothing seems able to deter it, and it keeps clawing at the building with the satellite dish. The father finally reaches the mother, who grabs the boy and embraces him tightly. There is a loud noise, and the family turns to watch as the monster finishes destroying the building and turns its attention to one of the others. But then the dishes unleash another blast of electricity at it with a thunderous crack. The creature howls in pain as it stumbles and falls to its knees. It is struggling to get back up when yet another blast hits it and it falls to the ground. It breathes a couple of final, labored breaths before it closes its eyes, its enormous tongue lolling out of its mouth. The creature is finally dead. A loud celebratory cheer goes up in the empty field from what sounds like hundreds of people as the creature begins to slowly fade from view before eventually disappearing completely. Meanwhile, all the family can do is stare in amazement at the bizarre scene they have just witnessed. The extremely strange events that just befell this average family may sound like the plot of a movie, and in some ways, it was, because this is SCP-2954, also known as Looping Kaiju Killing. SCP-2954 is an anomaly that consists of several distinct components. The first, SCP-2954-1A are the six large structures that resemble buildings with satellite dishes, which are located near a now deserted rural town in Japan. The word resemble is very important, because these are not actual satellite dishes, but instead appear to be nothing more than facsimiles of real ones. The interior of the SCP-2954-1A buildings lack all of the mechanical components one would expect to find inside, and instead contain only a crude rope and pulley system, which control the satellite dishes on the building's roof. Despite their lack of internal machinery, the satellite dishes are nonetheless somehow capable of discharging powerful electric arcs of energy, which they only do when confronted by an SCP-2954-2 instance. 
SCP-2954-2 refers to creatures which have a mix of reptilian, amphibious, and fish-like traits. They are always 50 to 60 meters in height, and most of their body is smooth and blue-gray in color, except for their scaled underbellies, which are red. Both their back and forearms have large spiny fins, and SCP-2954-2 instances walk upright on two legs, though they are always hunchbacked. Their mouths are also always agape and are capable of spitting a highly corrosive acid. These creatures appear during a period of time that have been designated as Subaraya events. These events, which start every seven days, consist of a single instance of SCP-2954-2 manifesting near the SCP-2954-1A buildings before it begins destroying its surroundings. The buildings will then activate, turning their attention on the creature and firing their electric arcs at it in an attempt to stop its rampage. This will cause SCP-2954-2 to focus its attention on one of the buildings, which it will then try to destroy. As it does so, the sounds of weapons being fired, vehicles moving, and orders being shouted in Japanese can be heard. This phantom army, which has been designated as SCP-2954-1B, is only heard, not seen, and there are never any physical signs of their fight, save for the creature's own reactions to the weapons and the occasional artillery shell that will materialize in mid-air before striking it. During these Tsuburaya events, the SCP-2954-2 instance will always destroy at least one of the satellite dish buildings, and various other explosions roughly equivalent to what would be expected from small vehicles being destroyed will also be seen as it fights back against the 2954-1B army. Eventually, the combined assault of the 1A and 1B forces will be enough to overwhelm the creature, and it will collapse, grow transparent, and eventually disappear completely. A disembodied cheer will be heard, presumably from the 1B army, and any damage to the environment, including the 1A buildings, will be reversed. But what is the cause of this endless cycle of destruction and restoration? Where do the creatures come from, and what do they want? And who is the invisible army that always stands ready to fight back against the rampaging monsters? The answers to those questions may have been discovered while exploring the area where the Tsuburaya events take place. There, in another small abandoned building, SCP Foundation agents discovered a trove of objects that may shed some light on just what these creatures are. The objects located included various movie posters, film reels, and documents that appear to be related to the production and distribution of motion pictures. The posters seem to depict creatures quite similar to the SCP-2954-2 instances, and the title of the poster when translated from Japanese reads, Fukairu's Assault. When agents viewed the footage on the film reels, they found that it depicted a scenario quite similar to the Tsuburaya events. Also of interest are a series of notes found within a filing cabinet inside of the building, with several being of particular note. The first, when translated from Japanese, reads, Our sponsor gave 20 monsters to shoot. We'll pick the best footage. The second, which is dated to 1974, says, Filming completed. Don't forget, call our sponsor to say further shipments are unneeded. The third and fourth are both addressed to what may be the film's producers, and they read, Do you need more Fukairu? We can resupply until you're satisfied. And, You have not replied for a while. Regardless, we will send another shipment. Happy filming. But perhaps strangest of all is that there are multiple similar versions of the last note, and while the oldest is dated to 1972, additional instances continue to appear to this day, with new letters sporadically manifesting inside of the filing cabinet. The obvious danger that is caused by a rampaging 50-meter-tall monster is clear, and this anomaly has been classified Euclid as a result. Though since the creature is inevitably always killed by the SCP-2954-1 forces, containment is instead focused on keeping the public away from the area. Guards have been stationed around the area to prevent civilians from entering during Tsuburaya events, and any members of the public who do manage to witness an event are to be administered Class A amnestics. What is the origin of these looping kaiju? Did someone attempt to harness an anomalous source in order to produce special effects for their film? If so, were they killed by their own creation before being able to turn it off, leading to a never-ending cycle of attacks? While we may never know the answer for sure, at least the result is entertaining. Provided you keep your distance, that is. The car screeches to a halt, the door swings open, and the doctor tumbles out. He lands on his hands and knees in the dirt and throws up the few remaining drops of stomach acid left in his system. He's put his hand in something sticky. He can feel an insect wriggling under his palm. Behind him, the door slams, and a pair of boots walk around to his side of the car. The translator accompanying him does not offer a hand to help him up. It had been a long car journey with many similar stops. Fortunately, this was the last. 
The doctor gingerly gets to his feet and takes in his surroundings. He finds himself in a small village hidden amongst thick trees. He's not sure what time it is anymore. The flights, time zones, and car journeys wrought havoc on his circadian rhythms. He knows he is in China, somewhere very remote and very rural. He'd tried to look it up with the maps on his phone during the journey, but he'd lost signal a long time ago. One thing is clear, however. It is the middle of the night. The car's headlights are the only light source in the village. No one comes out to greet them. The doctor brushes himself off and turns to his translator. The man nods towards a small hut near the back of the village, just beyond the headlight's reach. His translator is a man of few words, both ironic and deeply unhelpful. The doctor does not know a word of Mandarin himself. In silence, the two men approach the hut. The doctor reaches out to knock, but his translator has already pushed the door open. Inside, there is just the dim light of a lamp. Almost everything is covered in shadow. It is almost dark enough that they can't see the cobwebs. Almost. Silken strings drape themselves over every surface, wall, and item in the little hut. It's impossible in places to even see what item of furniture is hiding beneath all of the webs. The translator reaches out to touch one of the webs in fascination, but the doctor grabs his hand, shaking his head. He hands the translator a face mask and a pair of disposable gloves. Annoyed, the translator takes them, but does not put them straight on, choosing instead to walk deeper into the hut. After a second, the doctor follows, only he can't help the feeling that something's not right. Something's missing. Here, says the translator. It is the first word he's said in hours. He's standing behind a little curtain looking down at something, as the doctor joins him there and almost retches from the stench. Lying in the bed is an emaciated man. He looks like he hasn't eaten in days. His wrists and ankles are bound tightly to the bed, so tightly, in fact, that his circulation has been cut off. The doctor can see right away the telltale signs of gangrene spreading across his palms. But they're too late. The man isn't moving. His bony chest isn't rising or falling. Worst of all, he must have been dead for a while now. There are sheets of spiderwebs draped over his sallow skin, like some kind of deathly funeral shroud. The translator mutters something in Mandarin. It doesn't take a PhD to pick up on the evident frustration in his voice. A whole night of driving out to the middle of nowhere for nothing. The translator kicks over a wooden stool. The sound is muffled by the thick layer of cobwebs as he storms out of the hut. But something is wrong here. The doctor can't walk out just yet. Toxicology. That's his field. Poisons, toxins, infections, bites. But that's the thing. There are no bites anywhere on this man's body. Head to toe, under the layer of spider silk, there are no welts, bruises, or puncture marks. The only darkened veins standing out are on his fingertips as they rot away from stagnant blood. Nothing to do with poisons. But there's something else, too. A hut holding a dead body, full of spider's webs. But yet, no spiders. A scream fills the hut. The bed rocks violently. The doctor looks down in horror to see the dead man is not as dead as he'd appeared. He thrashes this way and that, straining against the ties on his limbs. The doctor calls out for the translator, who appears at his side almost immediately. The translator shouts something in Mandarin, trying to be heard over the dying man's screams, but it's no use. The man throws his head this way and that, trying to bash his chin into his own chest or hit the top of his skull against the nearest wall. It is no use. The man opens cloudy eyes that stare wildly around the room, searching for something, anything that could help him break free from his restraints. Without thinking, the doctor grabs the man's head and holds it steady. He peers into the man's weeping eyes. Bizarre. If he didn't know better, he'd say they almost looked as if they had spider's webs built up beneath the eyelids, clouding out the man's windows to see the world. Small, silvery balls of thick liquid gather in the corners of them, too dense, too murky to be tears. From somewhere beneath the haze, the man's pupils find the doctor's. In an instant, his body falls still. It is almost as if he relaxed completely. A guttural murmur comes from the man's throat. The doctor looks to the translator for help. Free me. The doctor looks down at his patient. This is the part of medicine he had always hated the most. At what point do you let someone go? At what point do you say it's too late? Is it even right for him to make that decision? Looking at the man lying in front of him, a wave of sadness washes over him. His initial assessment had been right. It is too late. Even if he could treat the gangrene in the man's limbs with amputation, there's still starvation and dehydration to deal with. And then, the apparent venom from the spiders. Except, there are no signs of venom. Perhaps it isn't too late after all. With the right treatment, there may be a chance to... 
The man's wrist snaps, becoming a loose glove of broken bone that's easily pulled from the restraint. A foul stench of exposed rotten flesh hits the doctor like a slap in the face. He reels back in horror as the man pulls his other decimated hand free too. Unbound by his bed, the man lets out an animalistic roar. Sitting up in the bed, he tips his head back and starts pounding at it with what is left of his hands. Jagged wrist bones, barely housed by paper-thin skin, slam repeatedly into his forehead, harder and harder with each hit. The doctor is frozen to the spot, staring as the man smashes his own head. Skin splits, revealing white bone. Bone cracks. Then, with one last effort that seems to take every remaining morsel of the man's energy, he turns and crunches his fractured skull against the wall, caving the front half of his head in like a deflated basketball. Silence, more terrifying than any sound, fills the hut. The doctor stares at the body. An almost comical image pops into his head. The head looks like just a red plastic bag that someone had left on the floor, full of shards of broken pottery. He almost smiles. But then, the spiders appear. Just one at first, then ten, then a stream, then an eruption, spewing out of the gaps in the man's head like water shooting out of a collapsing dam. The tiny pink spiders flood the room, shooting up the walls into every crack and crevice, writhing and rippling around their feet. That breaks the doctor's paralysis. He and the translator sprint for the door. They crash through it and cover the length of the village in seconds. Grabbing the door handles, they haul themselves up into the 4x4. The translator slams it into reverse and almost crashes into a tree as he turns them around and back onto the dirt trail. They drive all through the night, not talking. The doctor gets control of his breathing, but his heart does not stop hammering the whole time. He cannot shake the images that fill his head. Spiders. Tiny pink spiders. Everywhere. The sun is just rising when the driver suddenly pulls over sharply. His eyes are wide, his face deathly pale. He doesn't say a word as he sits forward, reaches down the back of his shirt, and pulls out one tiny pink spider. The doctor yells in shock and hurriedly grabs a sample pot for the man to throw the spider into. The two men sit there in the front of the car in the warm morning light, staring through the glass at the arachnid. It looks soft. That's the most bizarre thing about it. Rather than having a hard, dark exoskeleton like other spiders, this one looks fleshy. No, that's not quite right. It looks fatty. It looks squishy like parts of the body that get exposed in traumatic crashes. Wrinkles and folds of pink, mushy cells with fatty deposits. Except it cannot be made from those kinds of things. It's a spider. As they watch, the spider seems to recognize their attention. It stands up on its back four legs and raises the remaining ones in the air. It looks almost as if it is doing some kind of mating dance for them. It turns its back to them, revealing a pattern of brightly colored dots across its abdomen. The doctor drags his eyes away from the dance. The sun is gone. Night has fallen again. His stomach stabs at him in hunger. But that can't be right. It was sunrise only a few seconds ago. The headache had started as he sat down on his flight. Now, five hours in and somewhere over an ocean, he knows he is not going to sleep tonight. He can't get the image of all those spiders out of his mind. He needs to report this. And he will, definitely. But not yet. A spider crawls up the seat in front of him. His heart stops, and he sits back violently in his seat, eyes wide. On the floor of the plane, pink spiders everywhere. They're not real. They're not real, just his imagination. He needs some rest. That's what he needs. He'll fly home, wait for the headache to pass. Then he can call someone. But right now, he just feels too groggy to do any of that. The adrenaline of his hallucination passes as quickly as it had come. He can feel the glass pot in his pocket tapping occasionally, begging for his attention. His head aches. He runs a hand through his hair. That can't be. Is he really growing gray hairs already? In frustration, he reaches up and taps at his forehead. Much to his surprise, the headache disappears almost instantaneously. If anything, it feels... good? He sits there for several minutes, drumming a couple of fingers against his forehead, and before he knows it, he's fast asleep, all his fears and anxieties long behind him. Only they are not behind him. Once he touches down, he goes straight home to his apartment. No spiders to be seen. Why not? Shouldn't there be more spiders? He certainly wants more spiders. His headache comes back. He drinks water, takes some medicine, goes for a nap, and turns off all of the lights. But nothing seems to work. Even the tapping stops working more spiders. A call lights up his phone screen, an international number. He takes a long time to answer it. It's his translator. The man's voice is shrill, panicked, 
far beyond what the doctor had ever heard before, even when they'd been running from the spiders. The translator is not making much sense. His words are slurred, and his sentences stop and start seemingly at random. None of it makes sense. The doctor turns the volume on his phone down. It's too loud for his headache. Way too loud. Government knows. Should have worn gloves. Too late. The pain. The pleasure. Using a hammer. Huh? None of it makes any sense. The doctor looks down at his phone screen. The call is gone. His phone is dead. Hadn't it been on full a moment ago? What time is it? And where are the spiders? He punches himself in the head. A smile spreads across his face. He's in bed now. Something red around him. His pillow. It is soaked red. Could that be from his head? The sample pot sits on his bedside table. Only now, it's empty. How did that happen? Wasn't he standing in the kitchen a moment ago? He's losing time. He runs a hand through his hair. Webbing clings between his fingers. He sits under his desk with a hammer in his hand, euphoria washing over his body. Just once more. Eight more times. He hits the hammer against his forehead. Endorphins flood every cell of his body, so powerful he almost passes out as the pleasure chemicals crawl inside of him, oozing silk through the pores of his skin. Webs hang all over his apartment now. Just one more hit. Eight more hits. That feeling, it's just so... His wrists, his ankles. How many limbs? Four. Not enough. That light. Where is he? Figures crowd around him. It is hard to see them. Something's in his eye. Everything looks blurry and far away. The pain. The pain is back. His head. Someone, please. He screams and pulls against the bindings on his limbs. The pain. It's... It's impossible. He needs to make it stop. Just one hit. Just one more hit from the hammer. That'll be enough. Something is behind his eye. He can feel it. Something crawling on the back of his eyeball. But that doesn't matter. None of it matters, except getting his pain to stop. No more headaches. Just one more hit. That's all he needs. The hospital staff have never seen anything like this before. They're out of their depth here. In the dead of night, they arrange for the doctor to be transferred to a specialist facility in the back of an ambulance. It is a challenge to get him out of his bed, as the spider's web secreting from his skin have all but tied him to the linen. As fate would have it, a drunk driver gives the doctor his final wish. Not seeing a red light, the driver plows full speed into the side of the ambulance, sending it spinning off the road and down a hill, killing everyone inside, including the doctor. When police arrive at the scene in the early hours of the morning, they find the driver sitting on his own, staring at some small insect by the wreckage. The driver is unharmed by the incident. His only complaint as he spends the following night in police custody is that he feels a mild headache coming on. Anyone experiencing that headache is likely already too far gone from their exposure to SCP-632, an anomalous species of cognitohazardous arachnids nicknamed intrusive arachnid thoughts. Unconfirmed reports of mysterious spider colonies have been springing up across Asia, particularly in rural China, for several decades in connection with this anomaly. In 1972, the population of an unnamed town in the Anhui province were found to have been almost entirely wiped out. An entire town of corpses, each with their heads caved in, brain matter missing. With 106 dead, with 23 injured, this case is to this day the deadliest confirmed SCP-632 breach. Strange as it may be, physiologically speaking, SCP-632 could be considered cute. Their bodies are squishy in texture, bright pink, and are in fact made up of human tissue, brain tissue to be exact, coated in a layer of protective fat. As happened to our unfortunate doctor, SCP-632 reproduces parasitically within the human skull. The exact mechanics of this process remain unclear. It is believed that SCP-632 infects its human host through a selection of sensory triggers. Those infected have each testified to having been exposed to the following. Firstly, viewing the pattern on SCP-632's abdomen, exposed during the dance that the spiders often do under observation. Secondly, making physical contact with SCP-632. And lastly, through exposure to as yet unidentified chemical compounds secreted by the older SCP-632 instances. This is where luck was not on our doctor's side. He was smart enough to wear gloves during his encounter with SCP-632 in China, which may have been enough to protect him from being infected. However, upon his arrival as he fell out of the car, his hand landed directly in an SCP-632 web housing a solitary live spider. If he had remembered his car sickness tablets, this could have all been avoided. Within three hours of initial exposure to SCP-632, the subject will start to experience mild headaches, followed by an uncanny sensation that their skin is growing silk. 
During this period, MRI scans have found that small filament-like structures start to form within the host's brain tissue. As these filaments multiply and spread throughout the brain, the subjects report developing an obsession with spiders. The brain tissue steadily deteriorates, leading to changes in personality and mood, as well as irrational behavior. Over the coming days, the headaches grow more severe as the filament cells press against the blood vessels lining the inside of the skull. Subjects find that they can relieve this sensation by tapping or hitting their forehead, replacing it with a pleasurable feeling as the filaments release endorphins upon impact. This is part of the sinister final act of SCP-632's reproduction. After six to seven days, as the host's headaches worsen, they find they have to hit their skull harder and harder to alleviate the pain and get that chemical high. Eventually, driven mad by the pain inside their head, they crack through their own skull. At this point, all of the gestating spiders that have been forming within the filaments in their brain, estimated to number between 80 and 200, can escape through the opening. Because of its unique containment difficulties caused by its cognitohazardous properties, SCP-632 has been given the Euclid object class. There is currently one live colony of SCP-632 stored in the biological containment wing of Site-52. The colony is housed in a small enclosure measured 20 cm by 40 cm by 20 cm and sustained on a diet of insects and water supplied through a vacuum chute. All personnel that work in proximity to SCP-632 are regularly screened. Physical contact with any SCP-632 is strictly prohibited, and all personnel are required to wear protective equipment and respirators at all times while handling live or deceased specimens. They keep a close eye on anyone developing any symptoms, especially headaches, the feeling of silk on the skin, or intrusive arachnid thoughts. A woman wakes up on a bright sunny morning in Midland, Texas. It's her day off, and she decides she's going to use the time to take care of all the lingering errands she'd been putting off for far too long. She gets dressed, washes her hair, and prepares to pour herself a nice bowl of cereal. But when she opens the refrigerator, she finds… there's no milk. She'll need to see to that immediately. She steps out of her front door and notices a paper on her doormat. She bends down to pick up the pamphlet, which advertises a new supermarket opening in town. And what do you know, there's a coupon for milk attached. What a stroke of good luck! The woman makes her way into town, eager to check out the new grocery store. She parks her car and approaches the building, when suddenly, a stranger is standing right in front of her, carrying a plate of what appear to be free samples. He's dressed like a supermarket employee, but he's built like a soldier, complete with a military crew cut. He smiles and tells her that he actually works for a rival store, and points at a building across the street. He's positive that whatever she thinks she can get at this store, she can instead get at the one across the street for a lower cost and higher quality. She can't help but notice the almost unsettling desperation in the salesman's face. Something about his spiel makes her feel like she's in danger. She politely declines his offer, but he continues pitching deals and bargains at her as she makes her way into the safety of the new supermarket. The clean tiles below and the buzzing fluorescent lights above seem so familiar, yet also strangely alien to her. Something about this place is just… wrong. But she needs the milk, so she walks down the aisles, deeper into the store. She hears strange noises and looks over her shoulder. Was the bread aisle always behind her? She could have sworn she just came out of the meat and fish section. Where did they even keep the milk in this place? Every so often there's a strange noise somewhere in the store around her. It sounds almost like footsteps, but not quite. More like claws tapping on the tiles. Is she alone in here? Come to think of it, she can't quite remember seeing anyone else since she came in. There's something so profoundly off about this place but she just can't put her finger on what. She takes a step forward, and suddenly, the floor gives way beneath her. The tiles separate with the whir of mechanized gears as a trap door opens up. In an instant, she's tumbling down into darkness. As she falls, she can see the white light beaming in from above illuminate the edge of something metal and razor sharp. In the store above, the sound of a scream can be heard, and a soft squish of metal piercing flesh, followed by the gurgle of blood, and then the trap door closes. A tinny voice over the PA system comes on and says, Clean up on aisle 6? The woman is never seen again after that. What superficially appears to be an independent supermarket in Midland, Texas, actually contains a number of strange and often deadly paranormal secrets, and that doesn't even stop it from being a successful and popular supermarket. But the weirdest part of all? It's all perfectly legal, thank you very much. Welcome to Yeah, We're Totally Going to Sell You This, or as it's known to the SCP Foundation, SCP-4703. 
The primary anomalous effects surrounding SCP-4703 affect not its customers, but the very legality of its own existence and operations. The anomalies shift laws to make everything that goes on inside legal, no matter how unethical or dangerous. It also often reshapes laws to protect its own interests from outsiders, and anyone who breaks these laws may experience spontaneous attacks from violent animals, the most common of which are vicious lions. Here are a handful of the unethical and dangerous, yet perfectly legal, thank you very much, things that go on within the confines of SCP-4703. The stacks of shelves are mounted on powerful pneumatic actuators that seem to shift and spin of their own accord. While this has the intention of keeping the store varied and stopping customers from leaving, it more often causes serious injury with its sudden movements. Occasionally, these sets of shelves will collide, crushing whatever is stuck between them. If a child becomes lost or separated from their parents while they're inside the store, the child is forcibly detained and the parent or parents can only get their child back by either paying an upfront cost of $47.67 in cash or submitting to have their eyebrows permanently removed with laser follicle surgery. There are also several dozen hidden trap door mechanisms beneath the floor in various parts of the building, each one triggered by some strange and arbitrary condition, such as saying the word Wednesday or by not saying the word Wednesday. The triggers are updated each day and displayed on the store's website in several dead languages, including Latin, Koine Greek, Phoenician, and Punic. Each of these trap doors drops into deep shafts filled with some kind of hazard, such as spikes, glitter, or poisonous snakes. Yes, that's poisonous, not venomous. The snakes are only dangerous when eaten, but victims have reported that they seem incredibly appealing, which makes resisting them rather difficult. A section on the far side of the store is marked Starving for Savings and Discounts Ad Bestias, where all the products are fenced off and also marked down by 70% or more. However, the products are guarded by no less than 15 hungry lions. Store-branded fishing rods, telescopic grabbing mechanisms, and drones are available to rent for the explicit purpose of retrieving items remotely, although this will result in far higher costs, so you will have to brave the lions in order to attain those incredible deals. There's also a roughly 5% chance that, after checkout, your cashier will ask you to kiss them on the lips. If you refuse, they'll burn your purchases in front of you, and you won't receive a refund. If you do kiss them, there's a 1 in 3 chance that the cashier will have an anomalous toxin on their lips that will cause you to drop dead instantly. And every day, at an arbitrary time between the hours of 3 p.m. and closing time, the lions will be released from the discount section to roam the store, and only two checkout lines will remain open. All items will be free during this period, but they must be scanned one by one. The SCP Foundation is currently exploring links between SCP-4703 and two other anomalies like SCP-2030 and SCP-1459, the former being the cursed hidden camera show Laugh is Fun, and the latter being a nightmarish vending machine that murders puppies and dispenses a variety of cookies in exchange. So then, if it is so dangerous, why doesn't the SCP Foundation simply block access to yeah, we're totally going to sell you this? Unfortunately, thanks to the anomalous legal effect created by SCP-4703, the Foundation can't just storm in or physically contain the building. So instead, they attempt to divert as many customers away from 4703 as possible. To do this, the Foundation has started a rival supermarket across the street, named Super Competitive Prices LLC. Sheldon M. Katz Esquire is an SCP Foundation lawyer and bureaucromancer, a thaumatologist skilled in the art of interfacing with anomalously bureaucratic SCPs, and he is spearheading the Foundation legal team's efforts into combating SCP-4703. Untangling the complex web of legality around SCP-4703 is a full-time job, after all, and in the following memo, Mr. Katz did all he could to articulate the sheer enormity of the problem they're dealing with. He writes, Counteraction of SCP-4703's legal anomalies is a top-level priority for our department, and we are making every effort to resolve the matter in a way which minimizes loss of life and economic detriment. We have received a significant number of inquiries regarding the mechanism of SCP-4703's indisputable legality. Unfortunately, there are no easy answers. Law is a human concept. It exists on paper because we write it down. It exists in practice because we enforce it. Generally, we interpret and exercise the law through the scrutiny of semantics, intent, and precedent. Yet, bureaucratic hazards such as SCP-4703 are not necessarily predicated on such things. In fact, the law as most know it has very little to do with the matter. While it's not a perfect comparison, 
One could say that baseline law is to anomalous law as arithmetic is to algebra. Both are recognized as mathematics, but the latter is more abstract. Imagine that Timmy and Sally each have two apples. If Timmy gives Sally his apples, then Sally should end up with four. But she doesn't. Huh? She has ten. How can this be? Sally recounts the apples and reenacts the scenario over and over, but there is no mistake. Two and two make ten. It is an incontrovertible fact. You see, even if anomalies are irrational, they are factual, and it is essential that one accepts this if they wish to develop a countervailing methodology. Once Sally accepts that her four apples have become ten, she reevaluates her radix and decides to recount the apples in base four. Suddenly, the ten apples are one zero apples. One zero is four in base four, which is the appropriate number of apples. Eureka! Sally collects another four apples, bringing the total to twenty, which is two zero which is 8, which confirms that her new paradigm aligns with the abnormality. Form follows function according to the function of the form, and at last, everything makes sense. Except none of it does, really. A well-behaved reality oughtn't conflate the concrete with the abstract. If you initially perceived a countable sum of 10 apples in base 10, then the equivalent number of apples in base 4 should be 22, since it stands to reason that changing your subjective view of an outcome oughtn't alter the physical materials in the equation. However, we live in a very naughty reality which may, on a whim, allow a young girl to wield apples unbeholden to thermodynamics. This explanation is inadequate, of course, but hopefully it goes a small way toward helping you understand why the legal department is currently occupied with a comprehensive redrafting of Texas corporate law in a quaternary semiological system. This in itself would be an exceptional feat even for the most skilled of bureaucromancers, and it is further compounded by the necessary incorporation of contingency clauses against the self-aware fact patterns that keep legitimizing rabid lions into existence inside my goddamn bathroom. We are grateful to you, our valued colleagues, for your patience and cooperation as we work together toward a solution. The Foundation is currently conducting a three-pronged attack against the forces of SCP-4703, the first being the Super Competitive Prices LLC Competitive Store. The second is the tireless efforts of Mr. Katz and his team against the trifling legal issues of SCP-4703, and the third is outright infiltration and espionage. Of course, when you're going behind enemy lines, it's crucial that the proper operative is selected for the job. It can't just be anyone dropped into a high-pressure situation like this, especially considering the rapidly evolving nature of SCP-4703's conditions. The SCP Foundation was more than aware that they might only get one shot at getting one of their own in and out of the building. For this task, they selected Field Agent Felicity Blandina, codename Karen of Justice. Blandina was uniquely qualified for a job like this. In personality tests conducted on all Foundation agents to test loyalty, they consistently found Blandina to be one of the most obtuse and shameless agents on the Foundation payroll. During group lunches with other staff members, she has been reported numerous times sending meals back to the kitchen when she felt they were unsatisfactory. And Foundation cyber analysts have detected multiple posts on various social media networks made by her, directly tagging and criticizing brands that provided products or services she perceived as being subpar. While these qualities made her a terror to the customer service staff in her local area, they made her the ideal candidate for bypassing the bureaucratic stronghold of SCP-4703. If anyone could do it, it would be field agent Felicity Blandina. She was sent into the building with an expired coupon under the pretense of being an unhappy customer. She spoke to a sales assistant inside the store named Daniel Paulson, who explained to her that her coupon was denied because it was only applicable when the recipient submitted to ritual castration performed by the SCP-4703 staff. Seeing as Agent Blandina didn't have the necessary equipment to undergo such a procedure, Paulson generously offered to provide her with a free surgery to have the proper parts attached, though finding a suitable donor would likely take several months. Agent Blandina, following her well-trained Foundation directives, could not be assuaged by the bargain. Instead, she pressed on, first guilt-tripping him with sob stories about her children, then her lifelong struggles with astigmatism, and even threatening Paulson with physical violence. Eventually, she delivered the true coup de grace, demanding to speak to the manager. Showing clear reluctance, Paulson agreed and led Agent Blandina to a door near the front of the store. It opened up into an unlit staircase that descended into the darkness below. At the bottom, they found a break room that appeared similar to a bunkhouse in a prisoner of war camp, containing hammock after hammock filled with uncomfortable sleeping employees. Paulson informed Agent Blandina that some of the people who work at the store were once normal civilians who'd been exploited with a number of legal loopholes, and now lived inside the store full time. Some, for example, had stayed in past closing time, which had resulted in them becoming store property for a minimum of a year. 
Paulson himself had entered a raffle for an abs transplant, and instead won servitude at SCP-4703, which he couldn't legally turn down thanks to the powerful anomalous laws of the store. As Paulson and Agent Blandina ventured deeper into the bowels of the staff area, they passed eleven unmarked doors, before finally stopping in front of the twelfth and last one. She opened the door and discovered shelves and stacked boxes within. Agent Blandina expressed incredulity at the idea that the store's manager would be kept inside of a supply closet in the basement, but Paulson insisted that this was indeed the manager's office, and as he did, he pulled a string connected to the ceiling. This caused a wall of boxes to split down the middle like a secret doorway, revealing a large executive chair facing the wall on the other side of the room. Still maintaining the cover story that she just wanted a discount, Agent Blandina pressed on and approached the chair. She spun it around to get a better look at the manager and found herself standing in front of a desiccated corpse with no eyes and all of his teeth pulled out, his mouth wrenched open in a permanent, silent scream of terror. Paulson identified this man as Mr. Venatio Haruspice, the manager of SCP-4703. Paulson would have told Agent Blandina that his boss was a corpse earlier, but to do so was against the rules. Agent Blandina sighed and grumbled, I feel like I should have expected this. Paulson assured Agent Blandina that she could still make her complaint though, and the owner of the store would eventually hear it. As Paulson understood it, the body known as the manager acted almost like a kind of telephone, sending messages through to the owner. The owner would then reply through faxed messages hidden inside the cereal boxes that acted as the only food source of the staff trapped within. This Kafka-esque nightmare just kept getting worse and worse, but Agent Blandina refused to give up that easily. Agent Blandina asked him to explain the exact nature of the manager's condition to her. Paulson replied, I know that he's legally our manager, I know that he's, well, what he is. I know that one of us always has to kiss him goodnight at closing time. I know that if we tell him something, the owner knows, but the owner seems to know everything that happens here anyway, so I can't be certain that's related. What else? I know that he's empty, or hollow, actually hollow's probably a better word. Agent Blandina leaned in a little further to see what exactly Paulson meant by that, only to make a horrifying discovery. The manager wasn't a whole corpse, he was just desiccated skin, a husk somehow propped up into the shape of a corpse. When Agent Blandina asked why Paulson specified hollow and not empty, he told her that it was because a noise was sometimes heard emanating from within the skin husk. Agent Blandina wisely refused to put her ear anywhere near the manager's gaping, toothless mouth, and instead fed the hidden microphone she had been wearing down into the husk's throat. Before Paulson had time to remark on the strangeness of this, sirens and alarms began going off all around them. Paulson began to panic, yelling that the lions were incoming and the duo needed to move quickly to get out of harm's way. Luckily, Agent Blandina was able to escape with only minor injuries, but shortly after her escape, SCP-4703's legality was once again restructured to make it illegal for non-employees to enter the employee-only areas. The audio that Agent Blandina recorded inside the body of the manager was also analyzed by experts at the Foundation, and they discovered that, when sped up by 75%, the sound was indistinguishable from human laughter. Due to the highly strange nature of this anomaly and its containment procedures, even by SCP Foundation standards, the classes and designations applied to SCP-4703 are equally strange and complex. Knowledge of the file and the anomaly itself is relatively low tier, with restricted level 2 access permissions. Due to the immense difficulty in keeping SCP-4703 hidden or contained, thanks to its unique legal situation, it has been given the object class Keter. This, however, is where things get even stranger. The SCP-4703 store has a rare secondary object class, Truculent. This classification is likely to be unfamiliar to most, but it is used in the specific situation when an item is unpredictable and often transformative, and the containment measures around it must be consistently updated and evolved in order to meet its containment needs. It has the Level 3 or Kenic Disruption class, meaning that it has a roughly medium potential to cause disruption, though this disruption is likely to be confined to a relatively local area. And finally, it has the Risk class Warning, meaning that it presents a high risk to all who interact with it, complete with the possibility of causing severe harm, including death, though legally due to a missive sent from the law firm working in association with SCP-4703, I am obliged to tell you that it's mainly because the bargains at yeah we're totally going to sell you this are simply to die for, which is perfectly legal, thank you very much. A symphony of police sirens cut through the silence of the cold night, accompanied by the barking of canine units and bursts of gunfire. All this noise is for just one man, a man on the run. 
He runs through the trees, clutching a handgun with a sweaty, shaking hand, gritting his bloody teeth. He wheezes, exhausted from the chase. His hair is messy and matted with dirt and grease, his stolen clothes stained with mud. A rivulet of blood runs down his forehead from a deep gash just below his hairline, the place where his head collided with the steering wheel. He planned the breakout so well. How did it all fall apart? Someone must have ratted him out. That's the only thing that could have happened. No honor among thieves is more than just a phrase, it's a fact. Searchlights pierce the darkness. Shouts of, you went that way, and get him, abound, as do more barks of angry dogs. He grumbles under his breath and hides behind a tree, trying to collect his hurricane of thoughts. There's no doubt about it. The convict is a bad man. He's taken plenty of lives, and he doesn't regret any of them, not one bit. The only thing he regrets is that he was caught. Three hours ago, he was crawling out of a secret tunnel and escaping from Angola, a place known on paper as the Louisiana State Penitentiary, but better known as The Farm, the Angola Plantation, or most evocatively of all, as the Alcatraz of the South. A maximum security prison, complete with a death row and a reputation every bit as fearsome as its inmates. And the convict had certainly earned his place there. A long resume written in blood had gotten him locked up and sentenced to death after a speedy trial. Things had already gotten violent. During escapes like this, the first hours are the most crucial. A contact on the outside had left him a handgun, ready to be collected from a hidden spot inside of a tree near the roadside. That gun also functioned as his vehicle, or at least his ticket to getting one. He'd flagged down the first car naive enough to stop for him, and shoved the gun into the driver's face, and demanded he exit the vehicle and hand over both the car keys and his wallet. He'd driven for almost two hours when the heat finally started to rise. The convict had just passed through the borders of St. Landry Parish, Louisiana, when the classic rock station he was enjoying on his victim's radio was interrupted by a sudden report on his own escape. They knew he'd gotten out. They knew he was armed. They even knew the type of car he was driving. It wouldn't be long before the telltale blue and red flashing lights of a police cruiser would appear in his rearview mirror. One car chase and a spike strip later, and that same car is halfway through the wall of a gas station. The convict is scrambling out of the dented door, firing off a couple haphazard shots in the vague direction of his pursuers, and fleeing into the darkness of a nearby swamp. And that's where he is right now, feeling the noose tighten around his neck as he prepares for his final standoff. It's not like he has any choice in the matter. He'd rather go down in a hail of bullets in a swamp than go back inside. They're so close he can hear their heavy-booted footsteps now, and the ragged breaths of the dogs tugging at their leashes. His heart pounds in his chest. All he can do is go deeper, deeper, deeper. The convict flees into the dark of the swamp, reluctantly breathing in the fetid stink of the old mud and rotten vegetation. The dark swamp is his friend, though, since the glow of police flashlights behind him means almost certain death. He struggles through undergrowth, clambering over roots and fallen trees, feeling the squelch of his stolen shoes sinking into the thick, wet mud. The last thing he expects to hear in this godforsaken place is a whisper from the dark. And not just any whisper, it's the voice of a little girl. Just hearing it almost makes his heart stop. He freezes in place and turns to see her emerging from the dark. She can't be any older than 10 or 11, this little girl with a tangle of messy hair and these frantic, feral eyes. It's hard to tell what she really looks like because almost every inch of her is covered in a thick coating of mud, as though she's just sprung out of the earth. On any other occasion, his instinct might be to run, or even something more drastic, but instead, he doesn't move. He stands there as she speaks, listening, even as the police get closer. The little girl tells him that she knows the perfect place for him to hide, somewhere that the police won't catch him. They'll have no idea where to look. All he needs to do is trust her and follow her deeper into the swamp. If he does as she says, he can finally be free. He nods and follows her. What else can he do, really? The girl reaches out with a muddy hand, and the convict takes it as she leads him into the all-consuming dark of the swamp. The searching police officer suddenly hear a short but blood-curdling shriek come from the depths of the swamp. Forty men in multiple canine units scramble, trying to find the place where they heard the man cry out, but they can't find a single trace of him. They set up a perimeter around the swamp, trying to guard every possible exit, placing checkpoints on every road he might be traveling. And when daylight finally dawns, they search again and again and again, but they're unable to find him. 
for all intents and purposes, the man is a ghost now. At least, for a few months. The authorities don't give up, though. After all, a dangerous convict could still be out there somewhere, just waiting. He's armed, deadly, and clearly intelligent enough to avoid police capture. Chances are he's halfway across the state by now, if he's even still in Louisiana, or even the United States at all for that matter. So it comes as a surprise to everyone when he's finally found, sitting at a bus stop in a small city in Louisiana. The man isn't moving, he's just staring off vacantly into space, a translucent rope of drool hanging from his bottom lip. There's something very wrong with the convict, that much is clear even from a glance. His face seems a little longer, as though the shape of his skull has changed. He has heterochromia now, with his left eye changed to a completely different color from before. And when his shirt is finally removed, a crisscross of extensive surgical scarring is mapped out along his back. Far from the sharp, lethal criminal portrayed by the media in the aftermath of his escape, this man is borderline catatonic. He talks in short, simple sentences, like a very young child, and his attention seems to drift easily when being spoken to. This same man who had mounted such a daring escape from prison and then managed to evade all his pursuers does nothing to resist the men who come to arrest him at the bus stop. He's returned to the prison and held in the medical bay for evaluation. However, a mere 10 hours after first being admitted and after giving little to no useful information during questioning, his health begins to take a sharp decline. He complains about his insides burning and asks for something cold to drink. When he's given water, he spits it back out soon after and begins to sob. He says he wants his mother, though he can't recall her name. There's very little he can recall about anything. The next morning, he breaks into a series of severe seizures before passing away. His autopsy shows significant brain damage, as well as the failure of several of his major organs. The coroner, though, found it impossible to explain how any of this had occurred. A month later, a pair of hikers making their way across the same swampland where the police chase ended would call in to the local authorities, terrified, claiming they found a dead body near a sinkhole. When officers are dispatched to look into it, they can't believe their eyes. Despite being significantly damaged, the body is clearly recognizable. After all, his face had been on every newspaper and TV screen in Louisiana for quite some time now. It's the convict, wearing the same clothes he'd escaped in. The same clothes that had been taken off of him and burned when he'd been recaptured at the bus stop. None of this made any sense. The convict's body was exhumed from the prison cemetery and given a DNA test. They found, with some surprise, that the body did not genetically match the DNA they had on file for him. The DNA which had, incidentally, convicted him in the first place. When the body retrieved from the swampland had its DNA tested, they also found something strange. The DNA was so damaged that it was impossible to make any conclusive determinations as to whether it was a match. It was the strangest mystery anyone involved had ever seen, and sadly for them, they would never know the answer as to what happened to the convict in that swamp. The answer, of course, is SCP-1692. But before we go any further, I must first allow you to indulge me for just a moment, since I have a special announcement. As you know, I have been seeking assistance in order to bring you longer, more in-depth, and more frequent explorations of unknown anomalies, which is why I'm happy to announce that today's exploration has been sponsored by a kind benefactor, NordVPN. Try NordVPN right now by going to nordvpn.com slash drbob for a free month. When you're investigating anomalies and organizations as secretive as the SCP Foundation, it's important to ensure that your data is safe and secure. After all, you never know when a member of MTF Mu4 might be watching. That's why I trust my data protection to NordVPN. Their diskless servers store absolutely no data on site, which means no traces left behind for prying eyes to find. And their automatic kill switch technology acts like a mimetic kill agent for your device, blocking it from accessing the web if it detects that your virtual private network connection has dropped. And for users who truly value secrecy, like yours truly, they even have a double VPN. That's right, two truly is better than one, especially when it comes to VPNs. And that means I can route my traffic through two separate VPN servers, doubling the encryption. But all that protection doesn't mean your research will be slowed down, thanks to technology like Nordlinks, next-generation VPN tunneling solution based on the WireGuard protocol that provides an extremely fast VPN connection. So protect your data just like Dr. Bob for the same cost as a cup of coffee. Go to nordvpn.com slash drbob and sign up now to receive a free month. Thank you again to NordVPN for their support in shining a light on the most secretive anomalies like SCP-1692, 
which is an anomaly consisting of three parts that is confined to a few kilometers of swampland in St. Landry Parish, Louisiana. Something you learn after studying many of the anomalies in the files of the SCP Foundation is that the question, why, is often a dead end. The best you can expect is half an answer to how, with the only definitive answers available being something more in the neighborhood of how can we stop it. Is SCP-1692 just such a case? Let's start with SCP-1692-2, which is the heart of the anomaly. SCP-1692-2 is a sinkhole of unknown depth filled with mud and water. While you are right to assume that these are quite commonly found in Louisiana swamps, since 2014, this particular sinkhole is different in that it has played a host to at least 31 sets of human remains, as well as 24 different sets that turned out to have belonged to animals. Despite constant monitoring by the Foundation to ensure that nothing else has entered the pit since it was brought under containment, new bodies will still sporadically be discovered in the muck, with their exact origin remaining unknown. But the bodies themselves are often quite easily identified. In fact, 14 of the human remains recovered have been confirmed as belonging to people who were reported as having gone missing between the early 1900s and the mid to late 1950s. But before we get too much further into that, let's return to the how of this anomaly's operations. When a human being enters the area near the sinkhole, it becomes increasingly likely that an anomalous entity will manifest, which the Foundation has designated as SCP-1692-1. While SCP-1692-1 will most likely take the form of a young girl, appearing to be perhaps 12 or 13 years old, it has also been seen taking the form of different local mammals, or even the form of one of the people reported missing, whose last known location was known to be in the area near the sinkhole. Regardless of the form it takes though, once SCP-1692-1 appears, it will act as a kind of lure, beckoning the lost individual further and further into the anomalous zone. It is unknown how they are able to convince the victim to follow them deeper into the swamp, and it is suspected by Foundation researchers that there may be some mimetic influence at play. Though it is also just as probable that SCP-1692-1 is simply capable of utilizing strong non-anomalous psychological persuasion to entice them. Once the person being led into the swamp crosses beyond a certain point, they will completely disappear, leaving no trace whatsoever. Any clothing or other objects they dropped or left behind will dematerialize, and even their footprints will vanish. In the hours, days, or even sometimes weeks that follow, the third component of the anomaly finally activates. Known as SCP-1692-3, this new entity will manifest in the area and attempt to leave, if leaving is even possible based on their modified physiology. That's because while SCP-1692-3 is a copy of the latest individual to go missing, crucially, it is always an imperfect copy. It will appear altered, deformed, or mutilated in some fashion, and certain elements seem to be recurring. For example, SCP-1692-3 will often now be missing some or even all of their limbs or organs, but there will be no sign of an amputation having been performed. They will also often be observed to be suffering from hydrocephalus, the dangerous condition where fluid builds up in cavities within the brain. 84% of all recorded SCP-1692-3 instances have displayed other major physiological differences from their original counterparts, such as having different hair, skin, or eye colors or different blood types. And the changes present in these entities are not limited to just physical ones. Dissociative amnesia is always a foregone conclusion for SCP-1692-3 specimens, which means they have no knowledge of their recent history, and they will often also experience depersonalization, reporting the feeling of being in a dreamlike or unreal state of being. They will also possess knowledge that the original had no way of knowing, such as being able to speak in foreign languages the original had no previous fluency in, and there will often be improvements or impairments of the general mental faculties of the original. To put it in layman's terms, the SCP-1692-3 specimens come back wrong. And save for two notable exceptions, which we'll get to in just a moment, the severity of the alterations often cause these specimens to die shortly after they leave the St. Landry Parish anomalous zone. The Foundation's knowledge of SCP-1692 began all the way back in 1938, after they were alerted to a string of child disappearances in the St. Landry Parish area. Thankfully for the local parents, all of these children eventually returned home. However, they all came back different. Some were missing fingers, while one somehow had an extra finger. Others returned with different hair and eye colors. A number of local police officers were sent to search the local swampland in search of a perpetrator. 
And some of these officers also went missing and returned in a state of profound alteration. Foundation field agents soon arrived and took over the investigation, cordoning off the area around the swamp to hopefully prevent anything else entering or exiting the presumably anomalous area. They conducted their own independent search into the St. Landry Parish swamp, and it didn't take long for them to discover a mutilated corpse in an extremely unnerving condition. The body appeared to belong to a small child, but it was difficult to identify, since most of the head above the jaw was missing. Both legs were also gone, though strangely, it appeared as though skin had grown over the wounds, leaving no sign of a removal, either pre- or post-mortem. A search into the local police files revealed that both the body and clothes perfectly matched those described in a missing persons report for one Bobby Dunbar, a child who had gone missing 25 years prior. But there was something strange about this file. The case had been closed, since Bobby had actually returned to his parents shortly after he disappeared. This meant that, by all rights, this corpse had no reason to exist. How could Bobby Dunbar both be alive and a corpse in a swamp? The Foundation needed to find out, so they placed the body into cold storage and continued the investigation, seeking out the now-adult Bobby Dunbar for questioning. Naturally, this was a frightening ordeal for Mr. Dunbar. He had already lived through the traumatic experience of going missing as a child and then returning home with no memory of the event left to constantly wonder about just what had happened to him out in that swamp as he tried his best to move on with his life. But now, here he was, being approached by strange men in dark suits who were telling him that a corpse had been discovered in that same swamp where he had gone missing, and that it appeared to belong to him. Bobby Dunbar, of course, had very little to offer on the possible nature of the body, other than vaguely recalling, quote, the other boy on the wagon. Unfortunately, he was unable to provide any further details on the matter other than this cryptic phrase. The Foundation peered further into the rabbit hole of the Dunbar case and soon learned that after Bobby had returned home, there had been a rather strange custody battle. Investigations into the local court archive revealed that the case had been between the Dunbar family and another local man named William Cantwell Walters. Walters claimed that the boy believed to be Bobby Dunbar wasn't Bobby Dunbar at all but was in fact actually a different boy named Charles B. Anderson, the son of a woman who worked for Walters. Walters pursued every legal avenue available to him, but after the boy himself identified Mrs. Dunbar as his mother, the court ruled that he really was Bobby Dunbar and granted full custody to the Dunbar family. This put an end to the whole matter, at least in the legal sense, and the boy lived out the rest of life as Bobby Dunbar, eventually passing away in 1966. But that wasn't the end of Bobby's story. Decades later, in 2004, the SCP Foundation took another look at the strange case of Bobby Dunbar. Equipped now with the technology to perform accurate DNA tests, the Foundation discovered that the man who lived his life as Bobby Dunbar actually bore no relation to the Dunbar family at all. But if this wasn't Bobby Dunbar, then who was it? And was that his body that had been discovered in the swamp all the way back in 1938? Unfortunately, the DNA from the corpse in Foundation custody had been severely mutated by a process known as hydrolytic deanimation, and results were inconclusive. Which means that the actual fate of both the real Bobby and the child known as Charles B. Anderson remains unknown. By 1939, enough incidents like the Bobby Dunbar case had transpired that the Foundation saw fit to fully quarantine the area but they still continue to find new instances of SCP-1693-3 within the swamp. Among those collected by the Foundation was a woman missing her left eye and exhibiting extensive stitching across the left side of her jawline. She was able to provide the Foundation with reliable testimony that revealed the existence of both SCP-1692-1 and SCP-1692-2. And upon the Foundation locating the sinkhole, they discovered two more corpses, one of which bore a strong resemblance to the woman. Interestingly, it had several portions missing from its head, including its left eye socket. As could be expected, this distressed the woman considerably, and she vehemently denied any connection between herself and the corpse that was found within the sinkhole in the swamp. The woman was kept in Foundation custody in order to observe her until she inevitably expired, but unlike the other SCP-1692-3 instances, her health didn't appear to falter. When the Foundation was confident that they had gained all they could from studying her, they provided amnestics and released her into the world with an adequate cover story. Much like the man who called himself Bobby Dunbar, she too would go on to live a normal life without further incident. But in another turn that was eerily similar to the Bobby Dunbar story, posthumous DNA tests showed that she too did not genetically match any of her family, 
and tests on the corpse taken from the swamp which resembled her were also inconclusive. The Foundation has fully fenced off the 2.77 square kilometer area inhabited by SCP-1692 with chain link and barbed wire. Outposts observing the area are positioned at 500 meter intervals, with Foundation guards posing as park employees frequently patrolling the area in groups. If ever civilians infiltrate, the guards are instructed to prevent them from venturing in further through non-lethal means and turn them back around. Thankfully, containment of this particular anomaly has become more effective as technology has advanced. Reliable live video surveillance was established in the anomalous swampland of St. Landry Parish, and this has led to anomalous activity declining significantly, especially with regards to new human SCP-1692-3 specimens. The majority of SCP-1692-3 entities discovered as of late have instead been slightly mutated animals. Due to the strange and unpredictable nature of SCP-1692, its containment needs have been a consistent work in progress, earning it the Euclid Object Class. Any member of Foundation personnel at level 2 clearance or above is privy to knowledge about this anomaly, and that's excellent, because this is one that should stir up a few important questions in all of us. After all, life is a long and winding road. How well can you remember your childhood? And perhaps even more importantly, how can you be sure that those memories really belong to you. What is it that you want? Not just what you want in this moment. That's fleeting. You get it and move on. Or you don't and you forget. No. What do you want? What do you yearn for? That humming dissatisfaction that underscores every moment of your life. The constant rumbling always beneath the surface that you can never put your finger on. Behind your computer monitor, at the bottom of your $4 coffee, that quiet moment when you go to the toilet at a friend's wedding and look at yourself in the mirror, asking, why am I not happy yet? This moment, this object, this feeling that I was looking forward to, why does it feel empty? A night in with your best friends, a promotion at work, a new car, a new house, all empty. So when I ask you again, I want you to be serious. None of that fake surface level fleeting drivel. What is it that you want? What will genuinely make you happy? The words buzz around the student's head. He hasn't listened to a word of this lecture, not for a moment. Last night's therapy session had clearly struck a bit too close to home. He'd never expected this new therapist to be so… direct. What was it that he really wanted? The student looks down at his laptop. He'd really wanted that. He'd spent months researching it, holding off on buying other models, waiting and saving up for the perfect computer. And here it is, with the same old boring lecture notes on the screen as his old one. Within a week, he'd been back online looking up new phones. Here he is, 21 years old already, and studying for a degree he doesn't really care about. Surrounded by happy, smiling students who are all clearly going to be far more successful and happy than he'll ever be. Beautiful people everywhere he looks. People who know how to dress well, know how to have a conversation, how to smile and laugh with friends, how to have friends in the first place. His therapist is right. What's he got to be happy about? That dissatisfied humming running through his life is steadily turning into a roar. What would actually make him happy? The more he thinks about it, the more the sense of dread creeps in. What has he actually got to look forward to in life? What can fill that void? The lecture is over. He hadn't even realized. Everyone around him is already on their feet, putting notepads and laptops into bags, chatting away with their friends. The student doesn't have anyone else in his row. He's somehow picked the only row in the lecture hall with just one person in it. No, that's not the case. This is the only row in the lecture with just one person in it, because he picked it. His only company on this row? A fly. A fly that had been following him around all week. What's the point? He looks at his laptop screen. Empty. His phone buzzes. It's his mom. He declines the call. Swinging his bag onto his shoulder, the student makes his way to the door. A group of guys up ahead are chatting loudly as they open it. One of them half glances back over his shoulder. He stops in the doorway, holding the door open. The student looks around. No one else was with him. Who's this guy holding the door open for? You okay? 
the guy asks, looking straight at the student. His eyes are very blue. The student rushes through the doorway, muttering a thank you on his way through. His phone starts to ring again in his pocket. He sits up alone that night. He does the same most nights. Even if he wanted to, he wouldn't be able to fall asleep. Sharing a house with seven other people, there's a party happening in one part of the house pretty much every night. The thumping bass is the only sound to reach the student as he sits quietly at his window, looking out at the bags of trash lining the street and the couple across from him arguing on their porch. The little fly in his room is the only one keeping him company, not buzzing around or trying to escape through the glass, just sitting there next to him, watching the world go by. What is it that you really want? The words ring around in his head again. Tell me what will make you truly happy. What is it? I think… I think I just want someone to love me, the student says quietly. He sits quietly by the window for a few more minutes, not noticing as the little fly next to him catches fire and rolls onto its back, legs curled in the air. The student just goes to bed. Nothing's ever going to change, is it? A week later, the student is back in that same lecture again. He arrived early this week, sitting down and unpacking his stuff a good 15 minutes before they were due to start. Surreptitiously as he can, the student glances over at the door every time he hears it swing open. It's the usual procession of beautiful, happy people, each one dressed exactly how they want, personalities, goals, and aspirations filling each of them. He looks down at his outfit. Gray. The lecture starts, but the student still can't quite focus. He keeps his head half-turned towards the door the whole time, waiting. Ten minutes go by. Nothing. He slumps down in his chair and starts taking notes, just as the door softly creeps open behind him, making a gentle hushing noise on the carpet. The student turns. There he is, the guy from before with the blue eyes. The student tries his best to swallow his grin. He's the only one in his row. If he can just get the guy's attention, maybe he'll come and sit with him. But no, that's a stupid plan. Why would anyone want to come and… The bag lands in the seat next to him. The student turns to see those same piercing blue eyes. Anyone sitting here? The guy whispers. The student opens his mouth to reply, but the words get stuck. After a second, he manages to shake his head. The guy with the blue eyes grins and sinks into the seat. After a moment, he asks if he can borrow a pen. That's funny. The student can see a pen right there in the side pocket of the guy's bag. Why would this guy choose to sit with him? There are plenty of free seats in this lecture hall. They're everywhere. One thing's for sure. The student definitely can't talk to this guy afterwards. No way. He's too weird, it'll be obvious. No one ever wants to have a conversation with him. Everyone he talks to is always sidling their way out of the room after just a couple of minutes. Besides, what if this guy finds out what he's really like? That he's been seeing a therapist. Not just a therapist. That would be pretty normal. Normal people do that. No, what if this guy found out that his therapist was a fly? A fly that had been following him around, that he'd been talking to every night before bed. A fly that had been asking him what his deepest desires were. A fly that he'd woken up to find dead and burnt on his windowsill this morning. Nope, no way is he going to have a conversation with this guy. It would just be a disaster. There's no other option. He has to call his mom. As soon as the lecture is over, he'll call her and deal with whatever it is she has to say. He takes the phone out of his pocket and stealthily gets his mom's contact details up, ready to hit the call button as soon as the lecture finishes. There, the final slide. The student hits dial and immediately turns away from the blue-eyed guy next to him, getting up and putting it to his ear. He shoulders his bag and marches out of the lecture hall, not looking back until he reaches the little square of grass outside where he sits. His heart doesn't stop hammering until he's sitting there. His mom takes a long time to pick up. When she does, it's clear that she's been crying. Not this again. The student swallows and prepares for her to start ranting. Only she doesn't. Instead, she just asks where he is and if she can drive over and get a coffee with him. He says yes, hangs up, and looks down at the phone, brow furrowed. What she got to say to him this time? A shadow falls over him. Turning, the student just sees two blue eyes. The guy is holding out the borrowed pen, a gentle smile on his face. His mom doesn't come for coffee in the end. Instead, she invites herself over to his house. It's the first time she's visited. As they make their way up all the flights of stairs to his floor, the student holds his breath, waiting for her to start complaining about the cigarette butts, ashtrays, and pizza boxes lining the hallways. But she doesn't. She doesn't say a word. He closes the door to his room behind her, and she lets out a sympathetic little sigh looking around. He probably should have tidied first. Here it comes. He can feel it. She's about to start lecturing him on his dirty clothes, leftover dishes, his unmade bed. 
but no. She just quietly picks up a sweater and starts folding it, then another. As she tidies his room, she shoots him a sad little smile. This house really won't do. He explains to her that it's all he can afford at the moment. Well, then let me help you so you can find somewhere better. What's going on here? He doesn't know how to react. This is surely one of her games. Any second she's going to lash out at him. But no. She just gently brushes the dead fly off the windowsill into the trash and turns to him. They stand across the room from each other, the same way they always have. Eight feet between them. Plenty of space, not too close. She closes the distance and pulls him in for a tight hug. As his mom buries her head in his chest, he notices for the first time how short she really is. Has she always been that height? Didn't she used to tower over him? Her muffled voice speaks into his chest, right into where his heart is beating. I'm so sorry for how I responded before. I didn't know what to say. You're my son, and I'm proud of you. I always have been. You love who you love. Don't let anyone take that away from you. Even your silly old mother. For a long time, the two of them stand there, crying together. It is a busy week moving everything into his new apartment. It's still a pretty basic place, but at least it's his own. The neighbors are quiet, the street is clean, and there are no flies. By the time the student sits down for his lecture, he's completely exhausted. He barely registers the bag landing on the floor next to him and the guy sitting in the seat. He's so tired, in fact, that the conversation catches him off guard. He hadn't prepared anything to say. But suddenly, they're talking. About the weather at first. It's sunnier now. Then about the class. Then why they chose to study here. Then their teenage years. Then their homes and families. The lecture starts, but the two of them keep muttering away to each other in hushed tones. The student cracks a joke, and the guy with blue eyes laughs. Properly laughs. He isn't just being polite. He actually found it funny. So funny that the lecturer tells the pair of them off which just makes them laugh more. Is this what it's like? To be one of the beautiful, happy people? Days go by, and the student wakes up every morning expecting it to be over. He's going to wake up any minute now, and he'll be back in his old house with a talking fly waiting for him by the window. But he doesn't. It's sunny, day after day, week after week, no flies in sight. He calls his mom. He doesn't just pick up the phone to her. He actually starts to call her. He goes to parties, discovers he likes white wine, and finds out what it's like to have a bit too much of it. He has his first kiss and opens his eyes to see a pair of perfect blue ones staring back at him. He makes friends, more friends than he can count. Friends who text him asking to hang out, who help him move house, then move house again, and who fill up rows and rows of seats the day he gets married to the man he loves. The man who loves him back. Is this what it feels like? Is this happiness? Maybe, just maybe, this is it. Until one day, the man wakes up. Everything's perfect. The sun is still shining. He can hear his daughter's squeals from downstairs. His world is still happy. Except for one thing. His ear hurts. Not that much, but there's a little something. A kind of dull itch deep in his ear canal. The other ear starts to hurt as he makes his morning coffee. He should probably go to the doctor about it. He'll book that this week. But by that night, he knows he probably shouldn't wait any longer. He lies awake deep into the night feeling his lungs tightening. You're not supposed to feel your lungs, are you? But it's not just his lungs. It's his throat, too, and his bowels. All of a sudden, his stomach starts convulsing. He throws off the sheets and rushes into the bathroom, not quite making it to the toilet. His vomit splatters across the tiles. He must be getting delirious. That can't be right. It looks like his vomit is moving, wriggling, and crawling. His husband appears behind him, switching on the light. The two of them stare in horror at the writhing maggots covering the bathroom floor. The x-rays and MRIs paint a grueling picture. Each progressive scan over the next couple of days looks worse than the last. What had once been healthy flesh and organ tissue steadily has deeper rivets chaotically eaten into it. The maggots work their way through the man's throat, lungs, stomach, sinuses, ears, bowels, and urethra. In some places, they run out of flesh and end up burrowing their way out of the surface of his skin. By the time the maggots mature into flies, the man is on his deathbed. Excessive blood loss, organ failure, and multiple infections have worn his body down to a husk. There's nothing left to be done for him. All that the man's husband, children, mother, and countless friends can do is stand by and watch, as one by one, thousands of flies emerge from the body of the man they'd once loved so dearly. Heartbreaking as it may be, this is the sad reality of what you sign up for when you make a deal with SCP-3063, known informally as The Fly. 
This SCP on the surface seems like one of the most harmless that the Foundation has encountered, taking the appearance of a common housefly. It has no extraordinary physical properties, nothing apparent to distinguish it from any other fly, and yet, it is one of the most powerful entities with an apparent ability to somehow alter reality itself. It is believed that SCP-3063 only exists in one instance at a time, though this is very difficult to prove given the sheer number of flies that exist around the world. As soon as one instance of SCP-3063 dies, a new one seems to manifest in a random location. Naturally, this makes studying the fly very difficult indeed. As far as the Foundation is aware, the fly communicates with its human target telepathically. It interrogates them, trying to discover what they want most in the world. It will then offer the individual that exact thing. If they refuse, it will make increasingly grand offers, tempting them with greater and greater promises until they accept. When I said this was one of the most powerful known SCPs, I was not exaggerating, because this fly does not make empty promises. Do you want to become a millionaire? You might wake up tomorrow to a number of anonymous bank transfers or a handful of lottery tickets pushed through your letterbox. Do you want to become an opera singer? The next time you sing in the shower, you'll find a whole new voice coming from your chest. Who knows, you may have left the window open and a superstar agent could be strolling by your house at that exact moment. Whatever it is that you tell the fly that you want, it will be granted. The little insect will catch fire and die straight away, appearing somewhere else in the world, ready to start talking to someone else. Your answered wish may not always take the form you expect, but it will be given to you. Just like our student finding love everywhere he went for the next six years. Or, to be more precise, 2,376 days. You see, as soon as you make a deal with this fly, the clock is ticking. For 2,376 days, you will be free to enjoy your dream coming true, no strings attached. Until one day, you wake up with a little bit of discomfort, like something growing inside of you. Eggs, anything from 5,000 to 20,000 in number, will suddenly appear throughout your body. In your digestive system, respiratory system, and even your muscle fibers, small maggots will be born comprising all known diptera species. They will steadily eat away at your body, feeding their way out of you and growing into regular adult flies as they emerge. Most individuals die from multiple organ failures during this stage. It can often be difficult to identify the exact cause of death, as the attack on the body's central systems is so absolute, devastating, and swift. If the individual dies before the 2376th day, then the process is halted and the flies die along with them. Attempts to contain SCP-3063 have all proven unsuccessful. To date, six members of SCP Foundation personnel have been targeted by the fly. Each of them have tried to make a different wish to contain the fly, but each has had a loophole exposed. Senior researcher Elizabeth Gao requested the death of SCP-3063, which the fly interpreted as the death of that manifestation, combusted and returned in another instance. Senior researcher David Roberts asked for the permanent containment of SCP-3063. The fly then stood totally still, allowing itself to be taken into secure containment below Site-63. But sure enough, after 2,376 days, the researcher died and the fly was discovered to still be manifesting around the world. It again had interpreted its containment to refer to just that current instance of its body. A later researcher requests knowledge of how SCP-3063 functions, at which point the fly combusted and a document containing all known information about SCP-3063, everything I am telling you now, appeared before the researcher who later died. The penultimate test conducted by SCP personnel proved to be the most chilling. Dr. Patrick McGann asked the fly if it could provide clear, understandable knowledge of SCP-3063 other than knowledge currently possessed by the SCP Foundation. The results of that exact experiment and the next one were provided for him, including details of his own death, which he immediately fulfilled. Either the fly has some precognizant abilities or is able to directly control events in the world, or both. The final experiment was conducted even though the fly had already provided the results in detail ahead of time. Dr. Jonathan Mabry simply asked, is there even a choice, before suffering a severe pulmonary embolism and dying on the way to the hospital. Research indicates that SCP-3063 has been operating for over 4,000 years, with evidence of instances being discovered as far back as early Canaanite settlements. However, many theorize that the fly has been with us a lot longer than that. Unless future containment efforts are more successful, SCP-3063 will likely remain one of the most powerful and prolific entities outside of containment. So next time you see a fly buzzing around your room, it might be in your best interest 
to leave it alone. A man opens his mouth to bite a hot dog and suddenly freezes. His eyes widen and the hot dog drops from his hand, falling to the ground. Ahead, a stampede of people is running toward him, screaming, crying out for help. Behind them, a man walks at an ordinary, casual pace, but something is off. His eyes have a glazed, unfocused look to them, and he keeps shoveling random items into his open mouth, swallowing them down. He eats a clipboard and pen, a discarded shoe, and as the first man watches in horror, the very hungry man grabs the ankle of a fallen member of the crowd and pulls him into his mouth, devouring him. The first man turns to run for his life, only to be knocked to the ground by the rest of the crowd, trying to escape. He struggles to climb back to his feet, and a hand reaches out to take his. When he makes it to his feet, he looks up and sees the hungry man pulling him in, mouth stretching open wide. The sky is a perfect, cloudless blue. The air is warm from the unbroken sunlight, but cooled to the perfect temperature by a gentle breeze, and there is a sense of electricity, excitement, and competition in the air. Throngs of people have gathered together in a makeshift arena, piled into plastic chairs and swarming around concession stands, all training their eyes on the arena's center. What are they here for? Some sort of Olympic Games? A baseball tournament? A horse race? No, it's something greater, something meatier. It is the annual Midsummer Hot Dog Eating Contest, and locals and tourists alike are coming together to see just who can cram the most pork or beef hot dogs and buns down their gullets in front of a roaring crowd. The announcer makes his way to the front of the arena, standing with his arms wide in front of the long table behind him. As he calls out the names of this year's contestants, they file in, each taking his place behind the table. There is the previous year's champion, a burly man with a bushy beard and twinkling eyes, and there is this year's surprise competitor, a skinny 19-year-old college student with a hungry grin. Then there are the lesser-known contestants, a local father who signed up after making a joke with his daughter, an uncle who scrawled his name on the sign-up sheet after a few too many drinks, a recently retired man checking off another item on his golden year's bucket list. All have come to the event today with full hearts and empty stomachs, ready to see who the year's victor will be. The announcer riles up the crowd, encouraging them to cheer as loudly as possible to spur on their chosen competitor. All the while, staff are carrying out trays piled high with hot dogs, more hot dogs than most people see in a year, except for the people who just really, really love hot dogs. Each contestant receives a tray of hot dogs, a bucket of water, and an additional empty bucket, just in case, well, you get the idea. With the supplies and competitors all in place, it is time to begin the countdown. The announcer holds up his favorite air horn and calls out, Three, two, one, eat! At the sound of the air horn's blast, the men leap into action, seizing hot dogs from plates and each engaging in their unique competitive eating technique. The previous year's champion employs the method of famous hot dog eating champion Joey Chestnut, dunking his entire hot dog sloppily into his water, then swallowing it as quickly as possible. The new challenger, on the other hand, employs the Solomon method, named for King Solomon. Much like the fabled king suggested doing with a stolen infant, eaters using the Solomon method break the focus of their feasting in half before polishing it off. One of the more casual competitors attempts a divide-and-conquer technique, eating first the dog itself and then the bun. Others employ no specific technique at all, attempting to devour the stack of hot dogs before them, using the same classic eating style they might employ at a family barbecue. This is a grave mistake. One by one, the less prepared competitors drop out, spitting into their buckets, wiping meat sweats from their foreheads, waddling out of the arena while groaning and holding their aching stomachs. Soon, only the two front runners remain. But what's this? A challenger approaches. An unassuming black man, clad in a shirt and dress pants, rushes into the arena, his face a mask of single-minded determination, and begins seizing the discarded hot dogs off the table, gobbling them up as fast as he can. The announcer and the rest of the audience watch in stunned disbelief. This is unprecedented, and as exciting as it is, definitely against the rules. This man is not a registered competitor, and he certainly can't join the contest in the champion stretch. Unsure of what else to do, the announcer beckons to the staff on the sidelines, ushering them back toward the table to clear the food and escort this surprise drop-in out of the arena. The audience watches with rapt attention as the staff members attempt to remove the stranger from his place at the table. He shakes his head violently, refusing to go, and snatches the hot dogs away from them even as they try to clear the trays away. All the while, the remaining competitors standing are attempting to stay the course and finish strong in spite of the interruption. 
The new, younger man collapses, slumping down onto the table in a hot dog-induced stupor. He has tapped out. The victor is the previous year's champion, with a staggering ultimate tally of 38 hot dogs. As four staff members work together to wrestle the stranger out of the arena, the champion steps forward to receive his trophy. The crowd roars as he holds up his arms, grinning ear to ear and basking in yet another win. The announcer can still see the staff struggling with the stranger out of the corner of his eye, but this crowd wants to see their champion crown, and the show must go on. So he grabs the Hot Dog King sash, the crown made from gold, well, gold-plated, hot dogs, and even the massive gold trophy. He crowns the winner, placing the sash over his shoulders. Then, as the music swells triumphantly, courtesy of the local high school marching band, the announcer holds up the trophy, sunlight glinting off its shiny surface. It represents so many things, achievement, celebration, the ability to eat just so much meat and not get sick, and now it is time for it to be awarded to the man who earned it. The announcer stretches his arms, handing over the trophy to the contest winner, when all of a sudden, another hand grabs hold of its handle, ripping it from the announcer's grasp. The stranger has returned, somehow freeing himself from the multiple security guards who escorted him away, and he has taken the trophy for himself. But he isn't just attempting to crown himself the hot dog king. No, this is not a simple coup de hot dog. He lifts the trophy up over his head, opening his mouth as wide as it will go, and tears the metal in half with a horrible screeching sound, shoving the pieces into his mouth, chewing and swallowing. By the time the announcer and the champion recover from their shock enough to move again, the trophy is completely gone, vanished into the stranger's belly. After a day of seemingly impossible feats of feasting, the sight of this strange man consuming a truly impossible meal of metal is just too much for the already anxious crowd to take. The arena erupts into absolute chaos as people spill out of their seats en masse, fleeing the area. The champion, however, does not turn and run. He feels robbed of his victory. Though it may have occurred in an utterly bizarre fashion, he won't stand for this kind of disrespect. He has trained all year for this moment, only to watch his trophy be eaten right in front of him. He marches right up to the stranger and pokes him in the chest, demanding to know who he thinks he is, what gives him the right to crash the hot dog eating contest, interrupt the proceedings, and upstage his victory by chowing down on the trophy. The man doesn't answer him, so the champion continues to berate him, wagging his finger in his face. The stranger's eyes follow the finger, and slowly he opens his mouth. There is a sudden chop, and the champion screams, holding his hand to his chest, using his shirt to stem the bleeding. He turns to run with the rest of the crowd, but it's too late. The stranger's hand clamps down on his shoulder, holding him in place with a surprising strength. The only thing he sees before his life is snuffed out is the stranger's wide-open mouth, before everything goes dark with another sickening chomp. All the while, the crowd's terror rises to a fever pitch at the horrible sight. They trample each other as they scramble to vacate the area, shoving strangers and loved ones alike out of the way in a bid to escape this mysterious equal opportunity omnivore with an appetite for far more than just hot dogs. Some manage to escape, running far enough from the arena that they can stop to catch their breaths and glance back at the ones who were not so lucky. Those who tripped and fell in the madness, who had the wind knocked out of them by an elbow to the gut from one of their neighbors, those with weak ankles or who hadn't tied their shoes carefully enough. All of these poor, unfortunate souls are next on the menu for the stranger. He devours them one by one, rarely even stopping to chew. As one surviving woman watching from a distance pulls out her phone to call 911, she can't escape noticing the parallels to the contest itself, the way the stranger eats with a singular focus on consuming as much as possible. There's no pause to enjoy the meal, but there is no sadism or malice in the act either, just the sheer, undeniable drive to keep eating. The woman's call to the police is one of the strangest moments of her life and utterly baffles the local police department. Ma'am, please calm down, one officer repeats again and again. What do you mean there's a man eating people? I mean exactly what I said, she shouts. A man showed up at the hot dog contest and started eating people. Please, you have to do something. I think this is above our pay grade, miss, another officer chimes in. You think we should call, you know, the first officer trails off. Who? Who? the woman demands, but the line goes dead before she can ask another question. The police are clearly no help, and she isn't about to stick around and see just how big this stranger's appetite is. She tried to save the others, but now she needs to save herself. She runs all the way home without another glance back. Meanwhile, the local police did make that mysterious call, and an SCP Foundation mobile task force is currently en route to the scene. By the time they arrive, 
the park is a ghost town, with nothing but the blood-stained grass and abandoned arena to suggest that something horrible ever happened here at all. But these aren't some bumbling local police officers who have no idea what to do with a man-eating anomaly. This team has seen enough bizarre sights to fill a lifetime, and another lifetime after that. They spy a trail of sticky red footprints leading away from the arena. At first, they assume that the substance is blood, but a closer examination reveals that it is, in fact, ketchup. They track the savory footprints away from the scene of the day's unsavory events, following them to a nearby warehouse. Judging from the scattered wooden beams, rustling metal, and boarded-up windows, this place has been abandoned for some time. The perfect place for an anomaly to hide away. If they weren't certain, the sound of someone inside biting through sheets of metal is plenty of indication that this is the right place. With no time to waste, they break down the door of the warehouse, weapons drawn and ready. They follow the sound of the chewing, splitting up to apprehend the subject from all available directions. The shriek of tearing metal echoes through the building, bouncing off the walls and creating a cacophony that is difficult to track. They do their best to follow the sound, but quickly veer off in separate directions in an attempt to cover as much ground as possible. One operative confronts the stranger just as he is reaching for another piece of metal. He watches as the man takes a massive bite out of the steel, a bite that should have shattered his teeth and broken his jaw. Instead, a cartoonish bite mark is taken out of the metal. He approaches the stranger, who, upon locking eyes with him, begins to shake his head, still chewing. The MTF operative ignores this visual cue, approaching the man and attempting to physically restrain him. This, like the confrontation with the champion before, is cut off with a fateful chomp and the operative screams ringing out through the warehouse, alerting his teammates to his unfortunate fate. The screams suddenly go silent and another MTF operative stops cold, listening as the sound of chewing draws nearer and nearer. He spins around to face the presence behind him and spots the stranger standing there. The otherwise ordinary man is polishing off the tip of a steel beam, grimacing as he swallows it. The operative lifts his weapon, pointing it at the subject. The operative tells him to stand down and come quietly. The hungry man pleads wide-eyed for the operative to turn and run while he still can. He takes small, reluctant steps toward the operative, muttering that he can't stop. The operative brandishes his weapon again, barking another order for the man to stop. Before he can make another move, the stranger snatches the weapon out of his hand, opens his mouth, and swallows it. He winces as he does, but does not stop until the weapon is completely devoured. All at once, he lets out a loud belch, his knees buckle, and he slumps to the ground. He rubs his stomach, wipes his brow, and sighs heavily. I'm so sorry about that. I was just so hungry I couldn't help it. The man shakes his head sadly. I hope you can get a new weapon. And I'm sorry about your friend, too. You said you couldn't help it. Why'd you stop? The stranger shrugs, sighs again, and simply says, Well, because I was full. After a bit of convincing, and a test confirming that the subject's strength and bite force has returned to ordinary human levels, the remaining mobile task force agree to bring him into Foundation custody unharmed, though restrained. They pile into one of the SCP Foundation's trademark unmarked vans and set off toward the nearest Foundation site. About one hour into the trip, the subject begins to lament his growling stomach, asking if they could possibly stop somewhere for a bite to eat. Ordinarily, this is against protocol, but after what happened to their teammate, the task force members aren't taking any chances. They pull into a fast food drive through and permit the subject to order whatever he wants. They'll declare it as a business expense later. Five burgers, five fries, five tacos, five pies, five cokes, ten tater tots, ten tenders, five shakes, five pancakes, five jalapeno poppers, and five baked potatoes later, the task force successfully reached the Foundation site with their newest subject, SCP-913. SCP-913 appears to be an average African-American man around middle age. Though his appearance is completely ordinary, his metabolism is unnaturally fast. He requires the recommended daily caloric intake for an average human being every two hours and has an unusually high internal temperature, though the specific number has been redacted from his official file. If he does not meet his calorie requirement for a given two-hour period, he will enter a trance state in which he is unable to control himself. In this state, he will break down and ingest any solid matter in his line of sight. This includes matter that would ordinarily be indigestible, including wood, plastic, and metal. In this state, his appetite does not distinguish between living and non-living subjects. When he is in this hunger-driven state, he is aware of all his actions, but cannot stop himself, even when he eats dense materials that cause him extreme discomfort. 
If this state hits while the subject is sleeping, he will be forced awake. In addition to his anomalous appetite, SCP-913 can rend objects at an estimated force of 3,000 newtons and can bite objects with an estimated force of 5,000 newtons when eating them. Whenever he is not in his trance state, he cannot replicate this strength. An examination of SCP-913's liver tissue showed that it is capable of producing new enzymes in response to foreign material, allowing his body to digest matter that should be highly dangerous to consume. These enzymes metabolize the substrate at an efficiency of approximately 98%, detoxifying any drugs or toxins consumed by the subject during the hunger state or otherwise. This includes, but is not limited to, amnestics and anesthetics. When SCP-913 was first discovered, he was wearing a shirt and dress pants, both with the brand name Doctor's Orders sewn onto their tags. SCP-913 has no tattoos aside from one on his right calf, which reads, Mr. Hungry, from Little Misters by Dr. Wondertainment. Just in case you aren't aware, the Little Misters are a line of humanoid anomalies created by the mysterious Dr. Wondertainment Corporation, including the fish-headed Mr. Fish, the candy-coated Ms. Sweetie, and Mr. Life and Mr. Death, who is every bit as existentially upsetting as he sounds. The purpose of these creations is currently unknown, though, like many Dr. Wondertainment products, their existence invites endless speculation. SCP-913 must be contained in a customized humanoid containment cell lined with one meter thick carbon steel. 913 is to be provided standard furnishings for his containment cell, coinciding with the usual necessities for a comfortable humanoid dwelling. He may be given pre-recorded entertainment materials, such as concerts, films, and television shows upon request. The cell may be accessed via a reinforced carbon steel door. Once every two hours, SCP-913 is provided with one nutritional supplement as specified in Document 913-2. I attempted to locate a copy of 913-2 for further details on said nutritional supplement, but access to it appears to be limited to researchers assigned to SCP-913. While the subject is sleeping, nutrition is provided to SCP-913 via a central venous catheter that must be changed once every three months. These measures allow SCP-913 to receive the calories that he needs to avoid entering a hunger state, ensuring the safety of everyone on site as well as his own comfort. Like the rest of the Little Misters, SCP-913 presents a puzzle that may never be solved. I could spend my limited time on this earth wondering why Dr. Wondertainment would create a being that seems to serve no purpose other than eating as much as possible, lest he unwillingly destroy the environment around him. But I believe that would be a waste of time. Why does Dr. Wondertainment do anything that they do? Why create a woman who can turn men into candy soldiers? Why create an ordinary man with a fish head, a tiny top hat, and a Boston accent? The personal motivations of Dr. Wondertainment, whether they are an individual or a massive conglomerate, are as inscrutable to me as the meaning of life itself, or the reasons why a person would want to eat more than two hot dogs in one sitting. It is November of 1966 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It's a crisp, clear night the kind of natural beauty only autumn in Appalachia can bring. The lush green mountainsides have gone fiery as the season changed from summer to fall, vivid oranges, reds, and yellows flooding the landscape and turning the hills into a sunset. Now, in the dim light of the moon, the colors are muted but still glorious, dancing in a silvery blue glow. The spooky fun of Halloween has come and gone, leaving the warm, cozy feelings of the harvest, of fresh-pressed apple cider, corn mazes filled with happy families, cuddling up around a fire with a flannel blanket and a mug of something hot and sweet. Some people think Christmas is the most romantic time of the year, or Valentine's Day, or spring, when the wildflowers bloom and the breeze carries their perfume through the town. But to at least one happy couple, this is the most romantic thing they could possibly imagine. They're a young man and a young woman, driving down the winding country road. They're so in love, and they feel like the only two people in the entire world. At this moment, life is good. They're driving just to drive, to crank up the radio and enjoy being alone together. But after a long stretch of road with nothing much in sight, they decide to drive a little bit further away from town, over toward an area nicknamed the TNT area for its former life as a World War II munitions plant site. Now, of course, it's just mostly wildlife out there, but it'll look beautiful at night and it should be completely private. As the car winds around a curve in the road, the woman thinks she sees something out of the corner of her eye, and her heart skips a beat, taking her back to long-forgotten childhood fears. As a little kid, she always used to get nervous driving at night, 
imagining a monster running alongside the car as it went, trying to catch her. She used to picture long, pale limbs and big eyes, something loping along on all fours, dipping in and out of sight between the moonlight and the shadows. She would have nightmares about what the creature might do if it ever caught up to the car, if it ever reached through the window and pulled her out into the darkness. But of course, that was just a flight of fancy, the sort of thing a bored child's mind cooks up on a long drive. Imagining monsters where there are just dead tree branches or nocturnal animals. But now, seeing motion in the forest out the window, she feels that same breathless terror she felt as a little girl. She doesn't even realize she's squeezing her boyfriend's hand too tight until he pulls it away with a wince. Easy, before you crush me. He laughs, but there's worry in his eyes. You okay? She nods, shaking off the feeling. Sure, I'm fine. She privately chides herself for being so silly, for letting her own imagination get the better of her. She's lived in Point Pleasant all her life. She's no stranger to wildlife. Animals come out at night sometimes. It's just as much their world to live in as it is hers, she reminds herself. She's just starting to settle in, to let herself relax, when she sees it again. A fluttering motion, like great big dark wings, flapping at the edge of the area illuminated by the headlights. Something about it, the way it moves, the way it shimmers in the light that seems to shine right through it like black mist, it feels deeply wrong. Like the old stories her grandfather used to tell her about the things you see in the mountains late at night, things you never want to come close to. He'd once told her about a mountain lion with the face of a woman or a deer he watched stand up on its hind legs. She'd never seen anything quite like that, but the feeling he described, the deep sense of the unnatural, the way her mind and body recoil instinctively from this sight, feels the same. Did you see that? She asks, her throat so tight that her voice comes out in a whisper. Her boyfriend shakes his head. See what? There deer out there? You know, a deer completely wrecked my last car, ran right into me. He was fine, got up and walked off like nothing happened. Me, on the other hand. No, it wasn't a deer. She shakes her head. Never mind, it's silly. But the little break in her voice makes him pause. He turns the wheel, pulling the car over by the side of the road, and parks there. Hey, look at me. What's got you so shaken up? He puts a hand on her shoulder, giving it a comforting squeeze. I just, I thought I saw something. She sighs, feeling absurd as she says it out loud. Well, you probably did. All kinds of animals out here. But it's fine, they're more scared of us than we are of them, he reassures her. She shakes her head, frowning. No, I know that. It wasn't an animal, I think. I couldn't quite see it, but I got this awful feeling. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Whatever I got a glimpse of, I can't explain it. I just feel like there was something wrong, like it wasn't supposed to be here. She rests her face in her hands, struggling to find the words. He rubs her back, unsure what else to do, what else to say. They sit like that for a long while, before she finally sits back up. Want to go home? He asks. She nods weakly. I'm sorry. I know you wanted to go driving more. It's a new car. He cuts her off. I want to do what you want to do. Come on, let's go by the diner and get a couple burgers. See if they've got any cherry pie left. Sound good? She nods. Sounds great. The young man is just about to put the car back in drive when there is a sudden fluttering motion, something moving through the headlights beam. This time, they both see it and they can only watch wide-eyed as it settles to a stop directly in front of their car. There, the size of a grown man with a 10-foot wingspan is something unlike anything they have ever seen before. It's massive, dark gray, its face shielded from view by the limited light, with one notable exception. Boring into them are a pair of glowing red eyes, wide and piercing. Then, with a flap of its wings, as quickly as it appeared, the strange thing is gone again. The couple sit in complete silence for a long time, before they turn to look at each other. They don't speak, but their expressions both say the same thing. You saw that too, right? Still too shocked to speak, the young man cranks the engine with trembling hands, and the two speed off back down the deserted road toward town. They have to get back. They have to call the police and tell them… what? That they saw a monster? A flying man with glowing eyes? Will anyone even believe them? Suddenly, the young woman's voice breaks through the tense quiet in the car. Behind us! She cries out. The man glances in the rearview mirror and sees what he would assume were red headlights if he didn't already recognize them. Sure enough, the massive thing is flying behind their car, following them along the road. The car takes a turn, and so does the creature. The car speeds up, and it flaps its wings to catch up to them. It doesn't do anything else, doesn't try to grab them or break the back windshield, it just follows them, watching with an expression that he could almost call curiosity. Then, after five tense miles, it just disappears again, and they're alone. 
truly alone. That chill on the back of their necks is gone, and they know that wherever that creature came from, it's gone back there, at least for now. When they make it back to town, they pull into the police station and rush inside. They can hardly get their words out as they try to tell the officer on duty what exactly they saw. He's skeptical, of course. Two scared kids seeing things that aren't there, he assumes. But they insist again and again that they know what they saw. He humors them, listens to their story, and suggests that it was some sort of large wild bird. Animals' eyes reflect light, he reminds them. And everything looks worse at night, especially when someone is already all worked up. Realizing they won't be believed, the couple head home and get ready for bed. But they don't sleep. They can't. All they can think about is that massive figure landing right in front of their car and staring directly at them. Its unbelievable wingspan, its speed, the strange interest it had shown in following them home until it disappeared without a trace. What did it want? Will it ever come back? As they lie in bed, staring up at the ceiling and replaying the events of the night again and again in their minds, they wonder if they'll ever get the answers to those questions. One thing is for certain, though. They'll never forget those eyes as long as they live. Contrary to what the police officer thought about their story, this pair of young lovers were not the only ones to see the strange, winged creature around Point Pleasant. Over the next month, Others reported seeing similar things, and soon, eyewitness accounts were pouring in on a regular basis. A pair of volunteer firemen saw it while on duty, describing a massive bird with bright red eyes. A police officer reported seeing an unusually large bird-like animal with eyes that reflected the glow from his flashlight. A group of gravediggers doing their work looked up from their shovels to see something large, dark, and winged fly through the sky overhead, temporarily blotting out the moon. It soared overhead and landed in a far-off tree. All over town, people reported sightings of the creature, and the story grew and grew. The sheriff tried to calm the townspeople down, positing that it was just a sandhill crane, a large bird with a seven-foot wingspan and reddish coloring around its eyes. But the reports kept coming in, and they only got more bizarre. Some said it could fly over 100 miles per hour. Others said it could appear and disappear at will. A man in Salem, West Virginia blamed the creature for strange patterns appearing on the screen of his television set and for strange noises he heard outside of his home at night. Then came the strange being's most infamous appearance. Eyewitnesses saw it, a massive, shadowy winged figure, on the night of December 15th, flying over the Silver Bridge, a suspension bridge over the Ohio River. Soon after this sighting, the bridge collapsed and 46 people lost their lives. Though a fracture in the suspension chain was the culprit, people whispered around town that this mysterious creature was somehow responsible. If not responsible, then the monster was at least connected. It had to be. How could it be a coincidence? This mysterious apparition grew to be known as the Mothman, or simply Mothman. But to the SCP Foundation, it had a different name, SCP-2901. And according to their findings, there wasn't just one Mothman, but an entire species. SCP-2901 refers to a species of carnivorous scavenger creatures that, thus far, have demonstrated limited intelligence. They stand at an average height of 1.7 meters and generally appear to have an ellipsoidal shape with two large red eyes covered in photophoric tissue. Their bodies are covered in tiny iridescent scales, similar to those found in moths, butterflies, and other insects belonging to the Lepidoptera order. They are not bound by standard rules of space or time and are able to move through both at will. This gives them seemingly impossible abilities such as levitation, flight, teleportation, and the emission of an acoustic cancellation effect thought to help them avoid detection. In spite of these talents, they are still impervious to some ordinary forces, such as standard firearms. Due to their unique abilities making them especially elusive, these creatures have proven difficult to contain using conventional methods. Not only that, but it has become increasingly difficult over time to keep the general public from discussing the possibility of their existence. The first appearance of SCP-2901 on record occurred in West Virginia in 1967, shortly before the catastrophic collapse of the Silver Bridge. Since then, SCP-2901 instances have gone out of their way to avoid humans, keeping to themselves as much as possible and vanishing from sight when approached. However, they have continued to manifest near the sites of various disasters, appearing to a handful of eyewitnesses in the location approximately a week to a month before something terrible occurs there. Somehow, through a predictive ability compared by some researchers to a sense of smell, they are able to detect when an event resulting in multiple fatalities will occur. Once they have first appeared in an area, 
the creatures will remain there and guard it until the disaster comes to pass. They are extremely territorial, fighting with each other for dominance over the area, and even changing their shapes to frighten humans that wander into their territory. Once the disaster has occurred, the instances of SCP-2901 in the area will scavenge the dead until there is no more food left for them. Then, they will disappear once and for all, leaving no trace behind. Because SCP-2901 cannot be physically contained, the SCP Foundation has instead put guidelines in place for managing the creature's appearances, as well as what to do if an agent encounters one of these ethereal beings in the field. Cases involving SCP-2901 are assigned to Mobile Task Force 55, also known as the Twilighters. Not to be confused with fans of a certain young adult vampire romance series. Any civilian encounters with SCP-2901 should be addressed with standard amnestic procedures, and any media leaks regarding the creatures such as social media posts, YouTube videos, or local news reports will be deleted or otherwise countered by the Information Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division. Field agents have been instructed to avoid SCP-2901 if possible, and carry mobile devices capable of SMS messaging in the event of one of the creatures using acoustic cancellation. If an operative comes face-to-face -face with an instance of SCP-2901, and there is no way to avoid a direct confrontation, there are specific steps that they must follow in order to minimize casualties. First, do not attempt to run away from the creature, lest it be provoked to chase after you. Second, hold your ground and maintain eye contact. Do not show weakness. Third, make a threat display, similar to the display the creatures use to frighten civilians away. Use your clothing to make yourself look bigger, stand on your tiptoes, and spread your arms wide. Continue this step until SCP-2901 either loses interest or is intimidated into standing down. If the creature approaches, do whatever you can to keep from touching it. Throw objects or brandish a makeshift weapon if you must. Though they do not tend to deliberately harm living humans, the fluctuating nature of the creature's position in space and time causes direct physical contact between them and a human to result in a dermal fusion. Essentially, they become stuck together. But the creature does not realize this. When they then attempt to flee and leave the human behind, the results are… painful, to say the least. Imagine the feeling of ripping off a large band-aid. Now multiply that by a thousand, and multiply again. One more time? That's what it feels like. Though these guidelines were put together with Foundation field operatives in mind, they may come in handy for any civilian who accidentally crosses paths with SCP-2901. Should you find yourself in that unfortunate position, I hope that this information will help you avoid unnecessary trauma and pain. One more thing. I initially believed the preceding information to be all the available research into the nature of SCP-2901. However, after obtaining some additional security clearance through methods I won't detail here out of concern for the safety of all involved, I was able to locate this classified entry into its official file. It is a missive from the Information Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division, and details a practice of containment known as Operation Surgeon's Photograph, intended to act as a public disinformation campaign regarding the nature of SCP-2901. The purpose of this operation is not to conceal information about SCP-2901 from the public, but rather to control the information they have access to. A summary of the operation's methodology and ongoing success was included, and reads as follows. SCP-2901's current evolution is the sum of Foundation efforts in manipulating its existence through public perception. SCP-2901 are a group of extra-dimensional entities that lack a stable cohesive form and purpose that only coalesces through continued observational reconciliation. For SCP-2901 to maintain a stable physical mass, approximately 75% of the nearby human populace within 500 kilometers need to be congruent on a singular concept of what SCP-2901 is and what it does. SCP-2901 were first discovered and categorized as highly unstable Keter-class entities, capable of producing localized CK-class scenarios at random. Further research into SCP-2901's unstable manifestations proved to be futile, as, unbeknownst to Foundation scientists at the time, SCP-2901 would involuntarily change during each subsequent observation. During a containment breach into the civilian populated areas within the Appalachian region of the southern United States, SCP-2901 began gradually condensing into a singular manifestation the more it was exposed to humans. Civilians began conceding to the idea that SCP-2901 was a dark, winged-like humanoid with large red eyes, which corresponded to pre-existing local folklore. 
SCP-2901 also began to evolve predatory-like behaviors and anomalous acoustic effects that conceptualized due to the mass fear generated within the surrounding communities. Foundation researchers recognized the effects and began isolating SCP-2901 as much as possible. However, deprived of regular perceptual input, SCP-2901 began to devolve into its initial highly unstable manifestations once again. The decision was made to maintain SCP-2901 in a functioning, manageable state through continued exposure to human perceptual belief that SCP-2901 is a tangible creature of local folklore, another Bigfoot or Loch Ness Monster. The nearby Silver Bridge collapse of 1967 and the SCP-2901 Appalachian incursion, in reality, have no connection with one another. However, public opinion strongly disagreed, and henceforth, SCP-2901 began to appear at other future disaster events. This was the precursor of the precognitive scavenging animal-like behavior that is observed today. Efforts are to continue gradually introducing notions developed by the Foundation as to further SCP-2901's evolution into a more docile and manageable concept. I'm not sure I appreciate the implication that Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster don't exist. I, for one, am still holding out hope. But this finding still does compel me. Belief is a powerful thing. It can shape the world around us in unexpected ways, and apparently can even shift the nature of an entire race of creatures that otherwise refuse to abide by our rules and our understanding. Who knows what these beings will look like, how they will behave a few years down the line. For now, they are shadowy, precognitive scavengers, waiting in the wings for humanity to encounter disaster, then picking up the leftovers for themselves. They may not mean us any harm, but the sight of them can and should still strike terror into the heart. If you're ever out on your own and you spot a wide pair of glowing red eyes in the darkness, hear the rustle of leaves, of something floating through the trees like a cloud of black mist, you should probably leave that place immediately. You won't want to be there for what's coming next, because whether it takes a day or a month, SCP-2901 only goes where it knows it will be fed. For avant-garde film fans across the nation, it's the eve of one of the most exciting days of the year, the beginning of Oddfest, a prestigious film festival that features offerings from some of the strangest names in cinema. Now in its 40th year, the organization has featured films from the likes of legendary artists and filmmakers David Cronenberg, Frank Henenlotter, Gion Sono, Julia Ducourneau, David Lynch, Panos Cosmatos, the Soska Sisters, Flying Lotus, and Lars von Trier at their strangest, as well as a bevy of creators so bizarre and obscure the average person would never have heard of them. But for the attendance of Oddfest, they were gods made flesh. Of course, one person's exciting event is another person's stressful logistical nightmare, and in this case, the latter role falls at the feet of the programmer. The member of Oddfest's organizational board tasked with managing the festival's lineup and making sure they all release smoothly. He's passionate about getting these films out there to audiences that will truly appreciate them. But that doesn't make the process of getting it all to happen any easier. It's a relatively thankless job. But hey, somebody's gotta do it, right? The programmer is burning the midnight oil at the Carolina Theater, the historic movie theater in Durham, North Carolina, that's hosting Oddfest this year. He'd spent the better part of the evening discussing various contingencies with the theater's manager, then making the final checks on scheduling and licensing. All the invisible work that goes into making Oddfest safe, fun, and most importantly, legal. With how touchy movie studios often get about their intellectual property, screening the wrong thing without getting a bevy of proper clearances could spell disaster for all involved. Little does this unfortunate programmer know, another kind of disaster is rolling down the hill towards him a disaster that even someone with his experience could never anticipate. It's almost 2 a.m. when he receives a knock on the door of his temporary office. He jumps slightly. Wasn't he the only one still in the building? Maybe someone had come back. Either way, he pauses for a moment, oddly nervous, before calling out, Yes, come in. The door creaks slowly open, and a strange figure leans into the gap. It's a round, squat man wearing a suit, with his hair slicked back by liberal amounts of highly fragrant pomade. Behind this strange little man, who reminds the programmer a little of Danny DeVito's rendition of the Penguin from Batman Returns, is a pair of tall, gray-faced men who look oddly similar. Twins, perhaps? Either way, the programmer blinks hard just to make sure he's not dreaming, because things have gotten decidedly lynchy in here. The short man and the two tall men enter the room and casually take seats across from the programmer. It's only now that the programmer notices that the peculiar short man is carrying a black leather briefcase. 
He finally plucks up the courage to ask who exactly these people are and what they're doing here the night before Oddfest is scheduled to begin. The short man gives a wide, almost eerie grin that splits his pale face in two and says, with an oddly soft voice, We represent the fine people at AWCY. Suddenly, the programmer feels himself breaking into a cold sweat. Of course, the AWCY group is one of Oddfest's biggest benefactors. It's their funding that's allowed the festival to continue operating over the last 20 years since all the subsidies dried up. The programmer feels terrible for not realizing sooner. It must be his sleep-deprived mind. Immediately, he forces a smile, all genial and welcoming. He's in the presence of greatness. Oh, of course, the programmer says, trying to play it all off. Where are my manners? Is there anything I can do for you? Is the festival all going ahead to your liking? The short man places his briefcase on the table and unlocks it, before turning it to the programmer. On the inside, there are four blank DVD cases. The programmer suddenly feels as though he's been involved in some kind of shady, illicit deal. These four short films, the short man says. I'd like you to play each of these before four of your most popular movies tomorrow. Each one is a piece with considerable artistic merit. We can assure you that if these new conditions are met, Oddfest will receive notably higher funding in the years to come. Orders from the top. It's an offer that the programmer really can't refuse. The next day, the festival begins. Thousands of eager fans of weird cinema have poured in from across the country and beyond, all eager to take in and appreciate some truly mind-expanding movies. But nothing can prepare them for just how much their viewings today are going to change them. Audiences assemble for the four most popular films of the day and are given the preliminary announcement that they would be the first to experience some exclusive short films premiering here at Oddfest as a kind of appetizer for the longer films to come. It leaves them giddy with excitement, as in the theater's four different primary screens, the short films that the programmer had been given in the dead of night begin to play. As one can expect from such an event, these short films are strange, bizarre, and perhaps even to most, rather disturbing. But the most disturbing experiences would only truly unfold afterwards. Much to the horror of the programmer and his many co-workers, mass disaster breaks out at the Carolina Theater. Fighting erupts in the stands, violent brawls that leave many bloody and bashed. Some set fires around the theater, burning up reels of a number of valuable rare films. Others are simply watching and laughing uproariously, seemingly amused beyond belief at the carnage unfolding all around them. Others are almost catatonic, with some unexplained terror, rocking back and forth on the ground, seemingly suddenly so confused and distressed by the world around them. And perhaps most inexplicably of all, a large group of people from Screen 4 run frantically into the bathrooms, where they started drinking toilet water, faces contorted into rictus grins of enjoyment. It's a sight so horrifying that it seems almost like something out of one of the festival's seedier films. It takes the Durham PD considerable time, effort, and manpower to contain what is rapidly becoming known as the Oddfest Riot. But little did anyone involved know, the effects that had taken place today were only a taste of the horrors to come. Because everyone who saw the short films that day would never be the same again. This may seem like a film lover's worst nightmare, but sadly, it's a cold reality when you're dealing with SCP-1127, a series of anomalous short films ranging from 23 to 42 minutes in length, believed to have been created by members of an anomalous art collective known as Are We Cool Yet? Thus far, the SCP Foundation has been able to contain four different examples of these cursed short films, but researchers and field operatives are not ruling out the possibility that there are more in circulation, or that there are many other copies of the films we know about still readily available to the film viewing public. The reason these films have been given a collective designation in the Foundation archives rather than a series of individual designations is that those who have witnessed the films have reported considerable stylistic similarities between them, even though the content can differ wildly. For example, the majority of the footage in each film is taken from pre-existing sources, such as other movies, news feeds, documentaries, TV, and archival footage. Each of these movies also features a narrator character who gives the films a kind of thematic cohesion. These narrators will somehow interject into the recycled footage on occasion too. Watching these films will cause permanent changes in the personality and disposition of the viewer, which the Foundation has currently found no ways of successfully treating. Even applying amnestic treatment, which erases the memory of viewing the films, does nothing to alter their effects. Now, before we get into the disturbing specifics of each of these demented short films, I do have a slight piece of good news for any film fans out there. First, the anomalous effects are only activated if someone consumes a cumulative 20 minutes of one of the films, 
So if you're watching a movie and begin to recognize some of the features we're about to discuss, make sure you get yourself and anyone else out of there before the anomalous properties have a chance to take effect. There are also no anomalous effects when the audio and the visuals are consumed separately. The films must be taken holistically to affect you. This brings us to the films themselves, or at least the ones we're currently aware of, designated SCP-1127-1, SCP-1127-2, SCP-1127-3, and SCP-1127-4. Each of these films has its own unique anomalous effects, seemingly influenced by the content of each one. Let's start at the shallow end before we progressively get deeper into the more nightmarish examples, which is saying something. Given SCP-1127-1 is narrated by a Nazi clown. And no, I am not speaking in hyperbolic terms here. SCP-1127-1 is a 23-minute film entitled Were Clowns Always Yellow? and was first discovered illegally spliced into the film of a non-anomalous movie being shown at a New York City cineplex. As I alluded to not long ago, the narrator of this film is a man in a period-accurate World War II SS uniform, save for one detail. He has a clownish face painted on in grease paint. The recycled footage, in addition to archival footage of World War II, comes largely from movies that deal with the events and fallout of the tragic war and the many atrocities committed within, including The Night Porter, the unreleased Jerry Lewis movie The Day the Clown Cried, and even The Sound of Music. The Nazi clown goes on a rant about the nature of humor before pulling out his holstered Luger pistol and shooting Jerry Lewis in the head. You may think that audiences would find this material disturbing, but on the contrary, people who have watched this film frequently describe it as the funniest movie they've ever seen. And for those who experience the film's anomalous effects, the strangeness does not end there. SCP-1127-1 essentially reverses the polarity of the subject's humor and disgust. For the rest of their life, they will find things typically considered depressing, morbid, or disgusting to be hilarious. Whereas they will find things intended to be comedy, no matter how innocuous, to be disgusting and disturbing. Wars, tragedies, cruelty, and funerals suddenly become hilarious, but when Foundation researchers tested the film on a group of D-Class personnel, they started having extreme reactions of physical revulsion towards comedy. One member of D-Class personnel had to be physically restrained while being shown an episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus. However, other than some strange reactions in public and very peculiar media tastes, this film won't make you unable to enter society after some quick amnestic treatment from the Foundation. The same, sadly, cannot be said for the next one. SCP-1127-2 is a 37-minute long movie entitled Crazy Where You Are and was first discovered posted online, where it managed to get views in the quadruple digits before the Foundation was able to find it and shut it down. Nobody truly knows what kind of horrific damage it could have caused in that time, considering its extremely dangerous anomalous effects. The film featured a 12-year-old girl as its narrator, methodically performing surgery on her teddy bear while wearing a blue dress and a black domino mask, like the ones commonly worn by classic heroes like the masked swordsman Zorro and Batman's sidekick Robin. But the content and result of Crazy Where You Are are anything but heroic. The girl eerily whispers things like, What are you afraid of? Violence. Afraid that violence is the answer. Or is it the question? Ask the question you are afraid of. You already know the answer. Pain doesn't hurt. While a montage of children's media mixed with incredibly violent media plays below, including everything from the infamous shock film Faces of Death to old Bugs Bunny cartoons from the 1940s that really haven't aged well. You might think that experiencing this bizarre little film would greatly disturb its viewers, but those who watch long enough to experience its anomalous effects will report no strong reaction to the film at all. They will appear stony-faced and disconnected. They'll then carry this feeling of general apathy away from the film and back into their everyday life. These unfortunate moviegoers will slowly lose their sense of empathy and begin to experience a complete severing of their emotional investment in the world around them. Even hostile and dangerous situations will register with the same sense of disinterest that one might feel towards a slice of overcooked toast. This would undeniably mean that the victims might become indifferent to their own safety, but it doesn't stop there. Viewers of this film are likely to develop sociopathic tendencies, including the desire to hurt others out of a sense of detached intellectual curiosity. We have no way of knowing how many serial killers started their monstrous journey by viewing this nasty little short film and becoming inspired. Because of this volatile and dangerous change, the Foundation believes that those affected are unable to safely reintegrate into society and must remain in containment. Next comes a film that is less frightening and more deeply tragic. This is SCP-1127-3, 
a 30-minute short film entitled All Comes With Yesterday. This devious little piece of cinema found its way in front of unwitting eyes via a pirate UHF signal in a coastal Michigan town, which exposed innocent viewers of public television to 72 hours of the cursed film on loop. No physical copy of this film has ever been obtained by the SCP Foundation, and from the original recorded broadcast alone, the Foundation is aware that people in the double digits were affected by its dangerous, anomalous properties. The narrator of this film is a woman who appears to be in her mid-thirties, wearing an Elizabethan ball gown and a golden theatrical mask in the form of a rat's face, which appears to be permanently affixed to her own. Rather than speaking in complete sentences, this narrator's speech is eerily fragmented, with one recorded segment being her whispering, desire, aspire, require, conspire, acquire, retire, expire, choir, pyre, liar, liar, liar. Liar. After which, she continued to simply repeat the word liar over several minutes, while mashed up footage of several classic movies plays, including Robocop, the biblical epic The Ten Commandments, Francis Ford Coppola's Apocalypse Now, Natural Born Killers, Eraserhead, and George Romero's original Dawn of the Dead. With a setup that strange and eclectic, you're probably wondering what the end result of viewing this strange little offering is. To put it simply, it induces a state of debilitating technophobia. You become a perpetually anxious Luddite, terrified of anything considered even vaguely technological. And we mean this in the broadest sense of the word. Anything deemed to be manufactured by mechanical means, from furniture to clothes, becomes terrifying to the unfortunate viewers of All Comes With Yesterday. Because of the life-altering extent of the phobia induced, people affected by this film are unable to integrate back into normal society, and instead need to be given Class A amnestics before being permanently institutionalized. And finally, the film that, for your psychological health, will leave mostly to the imagination, SCP-1127-4. A 42-minute film with the ominous title, Why Are You Crying? Over 300 DVD copies of this film were slipped between the pages of body romance novels in a number of Canadian bookstores, claiming to be a special feature that comes with the book. And those who were morbidly curious enough to watch it had their lives forever changed for the worse. The narrator of this film is a man whose face is obscured by a menacing leather mask. He gives a free-form soliloquy about the nature of love and attraction over footage of various shocking or abstract underground films and cult classics, like Premaster 3, The Rocky Horror Picture Show, and the late Italian filmmaker Pier Pasolini's infamous final film before his sudden murder, 1975's Salo. Anyone who watches this film for long enough is likely to develop some very original ideas about the nature of attraction. Ideas that most of us might consider somewhat strange or disturbing. I think we'll leave it at that. But suffice to say, many of the people affected by Why Are You Crying? are unable to return to society after their viewing and need to remain in containment. Any instances of these cursed films found outside of containment are under the purview of Mobile Task Force Mu-53, also known as Ebert's Thumb, named after the iconic film critic Roger Ebert. Physical copies are to be seized and held in storage, and digital copies are to be contained and heavily encrypted before being neutralized for safety purposes. SCP-1127 instances are to be kept in the secure media vault of a classified site, and only brought out for testing when personally approved by the acting site director. Only D-Class personnel are permitted to view the films for their full duration. Foundation personnel who, during testing, are exposed to a cumulative 15 minutes of any of the films are to be reassigned to a different project for safety purposes. People who have viewed the films are to undergo a full psychological evaluation by Foundation psychologists and psychiatrists to determine the extent of the effects on them and decide what additional treatment, if any, they require. Thankfully, because of the inert nature of this anomaly, it is still classified as safe, but anyone lurking out there with copies of the films could cause horrific damage at any time by exposing unwitting people to the films. So if any shady individuals invite you to a private film festival in their basement, it's probably best to just decline. These films aren't going to be hitting the Criterion Collection anytime soon. Cinema can be a transformative experience. Everyone's seen that one movie that saves their life and changes everything. Just make sure, if you're planning on burning through a few short films this weekend, you know how exactly you want to be transformed. The woman in the bath is changing. Her skin turns green and slimy. Her arms begin to warm. A long green tentacle flops over the side of the bath, then another, then another until she has completely transformed into a giant green octopus. In these moments, 
her thoughts swim with panic, trying to remember what could have possibly caused this. She remembers sitting at her desk, scrolling idly through an article. In the middle of the page, flashing text catches her eye. It reads, She thought she was going for a normal swim, but what happened next terrified her. She clicks and opens a page to reveal a picture of a large tentacled arm stretching out of the water while a horrified woman looks on. She scrolls to the bottom of the page, then rolls her eyes and closes out of the window. How could so much horror come from simple text and a picture? When he applied to journalism school, the young man imagined himself breaking major stories, exposing corrupt politicians, and calling the results of elections, perhaps uncovering the hidden dark underbelly of a seemingly squeaky clean community. Instead, he's spending his days in an office that replaced all the chairs with exercise balls and put a ping pong table in the conference room. They don't traffic in real journalism. They just collect as many clicks as they possibly can in order to keep the advertisers happy. This isn't what he hoped he would be doing with his life, but a gig's a gig, so he comes into the office each day and does his best anyway. 15 foods that look like faces. What kind of sweater are you? The internet is going nuts for this hungry possum. It isn't changing the world, but he's pretty good at what he does. At least, he thinks so. His boss doesn't agree and calls him into his office for a meeting. The advertisers aren't pleased, his boss explains. Views are on the decline and only getting worse. In an increasingly competitive digital media landscape, they need to get as many eyes on their work as possible and at least twice as many clicks. He tries to defend himself to say that he's churning out content as fast as he can, but the boss won't hear it. He gives the young man a simple directive, spend the day browsing the internet and looking for the best clickbait out there. There's no use arguing with the boss when he gets in a mood, so the would-be reporter dutifully refills his coffee mug, takes a cursory glance at the motivational poster depicting a kitten hanging onto a branch with a look of determination in its eyes, and returns to his desk. Then he begins to scroll. He isn't sure how long he scrolls for. He scrolls until his coffee cup is empty, then full, then empty again. He scrolls until his eyes begin to burn and blur from the strain. He scrolls past recipe roundups and adorable, unlikely animal friendships, past celebrity gossip and incomprehensible cooking fails. None of it is even remotely helpful, and it barely makes a dent in his glassy-eyed autopilot state, until suddenly his scrolling comes to a halt. His cursor hovers over a headline so utterly bizarre that he can't be sure exactly whether he is really reading it or not. He rubs his eyes, blinking a few times to be sure. There, inviting, begging him to click, are the words, Grocery clerks live in abject terror of this man. His one strange trick will save you hundreds on groceries and make your enemies weep. Of course, when he does click on the link, it's just a simple article about which coupons to clip on one's weekly grocery trip in order to get the best deals. The image attached to the piece is a bit unsettling, featuring a smiling cashier staring directly into the camera with a wide, wide smile and tears streaming down his face. But other than that, it's nothing especially notable. By the time the writer is on his way home from work that evening and decides to swing by the grocery store to pick up a few things, he has completely forgotten about it. At least, until something very unusual reminds him. The writer is approaching the cash register with his small cart full of items when he suddenly feels a curious tingling feeling in his eyes, like static electricity in the back of his eye sockets. The woman at the cash register begins to greet him, but suddenly freezes, her eyes widening, her smile dropping. Whatever she can see on his face, she is terrified of it. He catches a glimpse at himself in the security monitor near the register and sees that his eyes have gone completely black. It is as inexplicable as it is eerie, and he is just about to decide if he should seek medical attention when the cash register suddenly begins to emit a high-pitched squealing sound. There is a smell of burning plastic, and smoke begins to rise from the cash register. The increasingly panicked cashier chokes out a plea for the man to simply take his things and leave the store immediately. The man is shocked and confused, but he's also not about to turn down the offer of free groceries on a writer's budget, so he scoops up his items and runs out of the store. By the time he reaches his car, his eyes have returned to normal. Wait a second. Free groceries? A terrified cashier? That off-putting headline from before seems to have somehow come true. He can't explain exactly how it happened, but he knows one thing for certain. He's got something exciting to report to his boss in the morning. 
the man practically leaps out of bed in excitement the next day, rushing into the office to tell his boss about the strange encounter and its potential connection to the clickbait research. However, his boss does not believe him, displaying a surprising amount of incredulity for someone who lines his pockets off the gullibility of online strangers. He laughs in the young writer's face, accusing him of trying to get out of work by lying. The boss sits down at his desk, returns his gaze to his computer, and tells the young writer to get out of his office and get back to work. He doesn't notice the young man's eyes suddenly going black, doesn't notice the strange burning smell in the air until his computer monitor suddenly explodes in a flash of light and a flurry of broken pieces, several of which fly directly into his eyes. The boss collapses out of his chair, lying on the ground with his hands covering his eyes, crying out in pain. The young writer is horrified at first, but then he remembers the second part of that strange headline, make your enemies weep. He hadn't previously considered his boss an enemy, but in this moment, he certainly seems to be weeping. The young writer calls out to his co-workers, telling them to call an ambulance for their injured boss. As one of the interns dials 911, the young writer informs his boss that he will be resigning from his position here, effective immediately. Through his tears, the boss demands to know why. The young writer shrugs and simply says, something I read changed my mind. The young writer packs up his desk and heads home for the day. He'll have to find a new writing job in a competitive climate, but he doesn't feel too concerned. He feels confident in himself, his ability to be heard, and his new weird trick for getting free groceries. Who knows what else the future holds, all because he took the bait and decided to click. The young writer is lucky. Not everyone who encounters a mysterious link and decides to follow it winds up with a beneficial new ability. For some, the consequences are far more disturbing, dangerous, and even deadly. He doesn't know it, but the young writer didn't just encounter an ordinary piece of clickbait journalism. He clicked on SCP-3299. SCP-3299 refers to a series of cognitohazardous internet advertisements in the style often referred to as clickbait. These sensationalized links and headlines entice the viewer to engage with them in order to learn more about their salacious claims. They bait the person to click. You get the idea. Ordinarily, the worst outcome of clicking on a clickbait ad is a bit of wasted time, some annoyance, or possibly a few unsavory pop-ups. However, if an individual follows one of the links classified as SCP-3299 and reads the headline and full body of its associated article, they will experience an anomalous effect. This effect consists of one or more mental or physical alterations to the subject coinciding with the headline and contents of the SCP-3299 article they read. These alterations are, as far as the SCP Foundation has been able to determine, irreversible. Amnestics are unable to remove the mental effects at any dose. It should be noted, however, that some of the more minor physical alterations can be repaired, or at least hidden with surgery. So far, there have been 247 recorded variations of SCP-3299. The content of these instances is significantly different from case to case, but does tend notably toward the absurd. I was unable to access all 247 instances on record, but I did find several relevant and deeply bizarre examples. One link, reading, This woman's one weird trick will make you younger. Doctors hate her linked to an article including details on a homemade facial ointment made up of household goods intended to make a person's skin look more youthful. Any subjects who read this article and were not educated to a PhD level immediately began to look noticeably younger. Their apparent age decreased by a rate between 20 and 30 percent. Several D-Class were instructed to read this instance, and all of them displayed a more youthful appearance immediately after. Gray hair returned to its original color, wrinkles disappeared, and in the case of one elderly D-Class, liver spots vanished from hands. Curious about the potential impact on any doctors that might be exposed to the article, researchers gathered a few volunteers from within the staff of the Foundation itself. These subjects, all of whom had at least one PhD, became consumed with irrational rage toward the woman in the article, their feelings growing so intense that they were unable to focus on anything else. Despite never meeting this woman and knowing very little about her, these doctors hated her. The administration of amnestics did nothing to quell the hatred the doctors felt toward this unknown woman, and they were eventually removed from their positions and placed under permanent medical and psychological care. All testing on non-D-Class personnel was officially suspended in order to avoid future complications of a similar nature. Another headline, reading, This intense footage will shake even the most skeptic non-believer. 
led anyone who clicked on it to a short video that featured maintenance lights flashing in an underground train line tunnel. As the video progressed, the lights formed the shape of a human face. Then, the video stopped. As soon as the video clip cut out, anyone who viewed it began to physically vibrate at a frequency between 0 Hz and 2.3 kHz, their bodies producing a noticeable unceasing sound. This effect was permanent, continuing even after a subject's death. However, aside from causing general annoyance to those around them, this change does not appear to have any long-term health impacts. One of the most unsettling instances of SCP-3299 catalog during its initial study consisted of a link reading, This uncomfortable video of a clam will irreversibly change you. When the unfortunate subject clicked the link, it led to an article featuring several photos of Mercenaria Mercenaria, hard clams, in various stages of their life cycle, with accompanying descriptive text. Notably, no video was present, in spite of the link's claims. In order to monitor the effects of this instance, a D-Class was forced to read the headline and article in its entirety. Approximately six hours after the man finished reading the instance, his body began to rapidly transform, taking on extreme morphological changes. His hands hardened and crusted over, forming into solid structures resembling the shells of bivalve clams. He tried to run from the room, but crashed to the floor as his legs fused together into one large, thick, single appendage that medical staff described as resembling the foot of a clam. The D-Class could not be returned to a humanoid state and is most likely still in his clam-like form to this day. That is, unless one of the attending researchers decided to try steaming him with a white wine garlic sauce and serving him over linguine. Which I do recommend, by the way. Uh, for real clams, not people. These are only a handful of examples from the initial discovery of SCP-3299, and I can only imagine what other horrors await in the classified archives. After first thinking about SCP-3299 in 2016, I often wished that I had more examples to sort through, and approximately one year later, the proverbial monkey's paw curled one finger inward, and my wish was granted. On November 3, 2017, a new strain of SCP-3299 was detected on websites frequently used by popular advertising services. These new, more efficient instances consist of only one headline and an image or video. It is no longer required for a subject to read the attached article in order to trigger the adverse effects, and simply reading the headline and viewing the image or video that accompanies it are enough. One of the first new instances of SCP-3299 detected was a headline reading, This is not a joke. You may laugh, but you shouldn't. It's quite horrifying. When a D-Class clicked this link, it led him to seven close-up photographs of the faces of seven individuals, each with an accompanying block of text. This text was incoherent consisting of random combinations of various letters. At first, it appeared that there were no lasting effects from the D-Class's exposure to this instance, but then, approximately 20 minutes later, after a supervising researcher shared a particularly amusing knock-knock joke, the D-Class burst out laughing. As soon as the first laugh escaped his lips, an incorporeal entity resembling Judith Scheindlin, more commonly known as Judge Judy, manifested near him. The entity stared sternly at the man, who claimed to hear her shouting at him to cut it out, though her expression remained still to all nearby observers. Five minutes after the test subject stopped laughing, the entity that resembled Judge Judy, but could not have possibly been Judge Judy, disappeared from view. Another anomalous link claimed, These confidence tips will help people see you differently. Number three changed my life. The link led to a 40-second video clip of an unidentified man making seemingly random sounds as unrelated words flashed up on the screen. The D-Class assigned to this particular instance immediately began complaining of extreme pain as soon as the researchers in the room looked at her. When I say complaining, I really mean screaming and clutching at her head in abject agony. Being a team composed of the extremely curious and not especially empathetic, the researchers continued to look at the D-Class in spite of her pleas for them to look away. After five hours of continuous pain, the D-Class's skin began to harden and stiffen, preventing her from moving. Twenty hours later, her skin had completely transformed. It was hard, cracked, gray in color, and resembled concrete. She was completely frozen in place, a living statue. However, as soon as the researchers averted their eyes, she transformed back into an ordinary, non-stone human being. She was placed in solitary confinement, where she presumably remains to this day whenever her anomalous state is not being tested. The link, if your body suddenly jerks while falling asleep, this is what it means, 
led to an image of an unidentified woman laying in bed, her eyes wide and mouth open in a shocked expression. First, a D-class was shown this instance, and then he was instructed to go to sleep. Just as he was falling asleep, the man experienced a hypnic jerk or a muscle spasm in the early stages of sleep. Suddenly, he vanished and could not be found until 9.14 a.m. the following morning, when he reappeared one meter off the ground in the middle of the site cafeteria before crashing to the ground. Over the next few days, this anomalous effect occurred again, each time coinciding with the onset of a hypnic jerk. The D-Class was not able to recall anything that happened during the missing time, and likened it into falling into a deep, dreamless sleep, only to suddenly wake up in mid-air somewhere he had been in the prior 48 hours, when a D-Class was instructed to click on, This local woman lost 20 kilos in a month. Click to find out what two ingredients she used. He was met with the image of a slender woman wearing a pair of denim jeans, several sizes too large for her, holding the waist away from her abdomen like a classic weight loss supplement ad. The text of the article was simply the word, feed, repeated 713 times. As soon as he finished reading the article, the test subject expressed an unusual craving for grass and kerosene. He was provided some of each, and much to the shock of the research team, he was willing and able to consume and metabolize both. He was given a simple peanut butter sandwich as well, but was unable to digest it. When he stopped eating grass and kerosene for longer than three hours, his body began to convert muscle and bone into fat cells. The process stopped as soon as he began to eat the requested materials. These changes to his digestive system were irreversible, but it did give the foundation a convenient disposal method for any excess grass clippings or kerosene. The ultimate recorded instance of SCP-3299 that I was able to access apparently reads, threateningly, She pulled it out thinking it was a blackhead, but it was something else. OMG. The D-Class chosen for testing with this particular instance followed the link to a 21-second clip from a nature documentary that featured bees smothering a hornet to death, slowed down until it was 10 hours long. This particular D-Class was selected due to the presence of a blackhead on his nose. Following his exposure to the SCP-3299 link, he was given a mirror and instructed to pop said blackhead. When he popped the blemish, a massive amount of arthropods began to pour out of the resulting wound. This continued for 32 seconds before mercifully stopping, and no additional damage remained after the arthropods stopped emerging. Since this initial test, over 5,000 different species of arthropod have been identified emerging from wounds on the test subject. The exact origin of SCP-3299 is unknown, but attempts to trace its source have turned up a pattern of inconclusive data matching that of SCP-2964, or the anomalous video streaming service Extreme Video Zzzz. All major internet advertising agencies' outputs will be monitored automatically by Foundation Design Software I.O. Beholder for any instances of SCP-3299. If any instances are detected, they must be deleted using previously installed Foundation Trojan software, and an attempt to track the source of the instance must be made. Individuals found to have been affected by SCP-3299 must be brought into custody and given treatment on a case-by-case -case basis. The ideal treatment is amnestics followed by release, but if necessary, treatments including corrective surgery and permanent containment in the anomalous humanoid wing of Site-17 may be employed. We used to believe that what happened on the internet couldn't really hurt you. Now we know better, but SCP-3299 proves that it can get so much weirder and more dangerous than viruses, identity theft, and angry pop music fans. So the next time you are casually browsing the internet and a strange headline grabs your attention, remember the 10 reasons you shouldn't click on it. Number 8 will surprise you. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1104, Nose Crab.